respond again. They hold this this sort of sword of Damocles over him. If you don't do what we like, then we can bring you down. They between them, Smotrich and Bengiver's parties hold uh, thirteen votes in a Knesset of 120, and that's enough to bring Netanyahu down. So he's always trying to balance these two um, forces, and he hadn't said anything until about 24 hours ago when he said, well, we've we've received lots of advice from our partners and we're grateful for their support, but we're going to do what we, we're going to do. And as always with Netanyahu, he, you know, he demands 100% cooperation from his allies and then decides that he's not going to take any notice of them when he doesn't like what they advise. So um, that's where we are with it. And interestingly, Nick, in the last uh, couple of hours, I've been, as I've been tracking this overnight, um, the Iranians, as, as Alistair was pointing to the fact, the Iranians are saying there's nothing to see here. They're saying, look, it's just a drone attack. A few drones were sent and the explosions you heard were our air defences bringing them down. Um, I think I can promise you this was not a drone attack because it's over a thousand miles from Israel to the site of Isfahan. And um, nobody would send drones that far. And drones only carry fairly small warheads. I mean, unless this was an aircraft-based attack, which seems very unlikely at the moment um, for all sorts of technical reasons, this almost certainly is a missile attack. And it would have been a Jericho missile, a Jericho 3, almost certainly. And the Jericho 3 has got lots of range. It'll do at least 3,000 miles, so it's easily got the range. It can carry basically a 1,000-kilogram warhead, which is a one-ton warhead. And if you're going to attack an air base, you need big warheads because air bases are big places, you know, lots of open ground. And to do any real damage to an air base, you need a big explosion. Sending in drones with small warheads will put a couple of little pop marks in a runway or in the ground. That's exactly what happened um, at uh, Navatim last weekend when the Iranians got seven missiles, seven ballistic missiles through to the Navatim air base, and they did a bit of minor damage. In this case, if it was a Jericho missile or more than one Jericho missile, and I suspect it would have been more than one, they normally send, most militaries send two missiles to every target to make sure that the, the, there will be a, a 98% uh, likelihood of a hit. Um, and these missiles would have been, had a big warhead in order to do some significant damage. Um, so I'm pretty sure that will, will turn out to be what it was. Whether this is the only base that's been hit, we don't know. And as people have been saying, I mean, Isfahan is an interesting target to choose. It's, it's part of an aerospace industry. It's where the Iranians manufacture some of their drones. Uh, the air base at Isfahan is important. It's a big city. It's an important city. And Isfahan itself is host to most of the research that goes on, not the manufacture, but the research of Iran's nuclear program. So about 3,000 scientists work in the various facilities there. And although there's no indication that those facilities were affected by this, as far as we know so far, the fact that this is a city that is one of the nuclear cities of Iran will not have escaped the attention of the uh, uh, government in Tehran itself. So, uh, you know, lots of elements to the fact that Isfahan has been targeted almost certainly by Jericho missiles in this particular way. Um, Michael, uh, we're just hearing the senior Iranian commander has said, according to state media, there was no damage caused. So uh, more evidence from the Iranians uh, that uh, this is very limited or, as you say, nothing to see here. Let me just uh, remind our viewers the pictures we're seeing here. This from the uh, Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, the IRGC, affiliated uh, telegram channel. It shows explosions in the sky uh, near Isfahan. Interesting, uh, some are saying that if there's nothing to see here, well, uh, let us see. Uh, Sky News can't uh, independently verify that video at the moment. The big question, Michael, will be, well, what happens now? Iran was saying, wasn't it, at the weekend, uh, that uh, their action, that this huge action involving ballistic missiles um, firing towards Israel was limited, but the moment that... Israel struck back, they could uh, expect a, a harsh response. Whether that actually plays out uh, is a different matter. Yeah, I mean, both sides are daring each other to see how far they will go. I mean, 330 missiles and drones last weekend, last Saturday, that the Iranians fired at Israel were clearly intended to do more damage than they did. And although the Iranians may have wanted... Um, to inform some of their allies beforehand. And it, it was, I could, again, it was not an attack designed to fail. It was an attack designed to do rather more than it managed to do. If they'd wanted a symbolic attack just to be 
um, to be completely de-escalatory, if that's possible, they would have sent 50 missiles or something like that. that like that. But 330 is clearly designed to penetrate defences and the way they structured it, the timing, drones, cruise missiles, ballistic missiles in various combinations from um, an arc of 180 degrees around Israel. They all, so they all came in different directions. Um, that was clearly designed to hit more than they managed to hit. And so there's a, a degree of humiliation to Iran in the result of that attack last weekend, even though they're making the most of it in propaganda terms. And now in this case, they're, 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 it, it, it suits them to say, well, the Israelis have responded, but the Israelis were ineffective. It doesn't really matter. And that, in a sense, I think, is a, is a, a way of them trying to put a lid on this whole thing. And Israel will be able to turn around to the world community and say, look, we haven't gone berserk. Because that was the that was what Ben Giver was saying, the right wing Zionist. He was saying we should go berserk. That was the word he used. We should go berserk in order to make them fear us again. Well, the Israelis will be able to say if this is all the attack has been, we have not gone berserk, but we have responded, and we're proving to the Iranians that when we attack, we get through. So they're showing that if we choose to do this again next weekend, it might be worse, and you really won't be able to defend yourself against it. So. As things stand, until we hear about any more things that may have, have happened overnight, this looks like a, a limited but relatively effective attack in terms of conveying the messages that the Israelis will want to convey, both to the Iranians and to the Allies, even though the Western Allies would be very annoyed with them for doing this, but perhaps a bit relieved that this has been all that they have done so far. OK, Michael, many thanks indeed uh, for now. We'll be uh, returning to you during the course of the morning, uh, no doubt. So uh, let's uh, remind you of this uh, breaking news. Well, it's uh, broke a couple of hours ago uh, now. Uh, two and a half hours ahead of us uh, is Iran. So about 20 past eight in the morning now. Daylight has uh, broken. This all started with Iran's Files News Agency saying an explosion or explosions were heard at an airport in the central city of uh, Isfahan. Uh, our affiliate NBC News reporting uh, Israel informed US officials that it would be carrying out an attack. Uh, so it certainly seems that has happened. Uh, the latest of the tit for tat exchanges between uh, these enemies. Um, the video you're seeing there is from the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps affiliated telegram channel shows explosions in the sky near. Uh, now, Sky News can't uh, independently verify this uh, video, but it has to be said that a commander, senior commander in Iran said there was no damage caused. Uh, let's talk to our US correspondent, uh, James Matthews. And uh, we've been told, of course, as well at Sky News, that uh, the US uh, was informed of a response, if you like, to... Uh, Iran's attack uh, Saturday night. And I suppose that will bring somewhat, James, comfort to the Americans, given that what happened in Damascus on April the 1st, they weren't informed about? Well, comfort would be one word, Nick. Uh, certainly they were shown due respect, a respect that was denied them when Israel attacked the Iranian consulate in Damascus. They were given just minutes warning, the Americans. They didn't like that because an ally was launching a strike in a part of the world where there are American assets and American personnel. They told the Israelis that they needed time to, to get their defences uh, in order and allow American forces on the ground to, to be in the appropriate posture for action happening in their vicinity. So the Americans weren't happy at that point. That will be why, largely, the Americans were informed this time round. The Americans have made it clear if you're going to do anything else, tell us. And indeed, the Americans were told, were informed earlier today. I think it's fair to assume the Americans will have been told detail about what the Israel Israelis planned and to a degree gave their blessing. There would have been an understanding by, from the Americans that Israel had to respond, an understanding that it was going to happen because the Israelis had said it would and the, with justification, as they would have seen it, because of the Iranian 300-plus projectiles. So the Americans would have seen that, understood it, and although Joe Biden had said to the Israelis, we will not support any retaliation strike, it's not as if the Israelis have defied him. 
uh, because there was no instruction not to launch one. As I say, Biden would have understood the need for the Israelis to make their mark, to respond to what the Iranians did in the past few days. Biden's wish uh, and his guidance to Netanyahu would have been, whatever you do, don't escalate this conflict because that is the way it has been heading with state on state uh, military action. These words coming out of Iran, which appear to indicate Iran is dismissing this as uh, nothing to see here, playing down the significance and the damage of this, this Israeli strike. That's what the Americans certainly will want to hear uh, because they are invested in keeping a lid on conflict. And I think the strength for Biden moving forward in terms of reining in the possibility of a widened theatre of war is that the, the key players, Iran, Israel, uh, certainly the Americans as they look on, none of them want escalation. The Iranians certainly have made that clear to the Americans and vice versa in private via back channels, but also uh, they've made that very public that neither has any interest in a conflagration of conflict that draws both into a direct confrontation, confrontation. So that's Biden's strength moving forward. He favours the diplomatic route, of course. It's only in the last 24 hours that the United States has announced sanctions, fresh sanctions on Iran, targeting drone manufacturers to disrupt and degrade its drone manufacturing capability, also uh, targeting its steel production. So that's the Biden route. He wants to stay on that road and he will hope that what we're hearing from Iran keeps him there. James, good to see you. Thank you very much indeed. We'll see you uh, in a few minutes. So more on our breaking news uh, then. Israel has seemingly launched a strike on Iranian soil uh, this morning. Uh, the latest of the tit for tat exchanges between these enemies. Uh, Benjamin Netanyahu had vowed he would respond after Iran fired more than 300 drones and missiles at Israel five days ago. More in a couple of minutes.
Good morning from Jerusalem, where people are waking up to the news that Israel has attacked Iran. Iran's state news agency reported that air defences had been fired and explosions were heard near Isfahan International Airport. Israel warned the United States that the strike was coming. The impact of the attack is not yet clear, but it does appear to have been limited, and Iranian media is reporting there, have been, there has been no damage to nuclear facilities. Good morning from Jerusalem. I'm Yalda Hakim, and we've woken up in the early hours of this morning to learn that uh, Israel has launched an attack on Iran. Now, we are being told that this attack is limited. There is still very little information coming out, uh, but we have learned uh, from various sources that this uh, strike was limited. But the fact remains that Israel has attacked Iran almost a week after Iran attacked uh, Israel. So the situation here is escalating and it is a very tense time. Let me bring in our Middle East correspondent, Alistair Bunkel, uh, who's here with me in Jerusalem. And Alistair, all week we heard uh, that there might be a potential strike back from Israel. And in the early hours of this morning, that's exactly what's happened. It is. The Israeli government had been taking a lot of advice from their allies, President Biden saying take the win, Lord Cameron and the German foreign minister both in Israel this week also trying to um, gently nudge Israel away from anything uh, that could lead us into the path of war. But ultimately, Netanyahu was clear. Israel would always do uh, what it felt was in its own best interests and in the interests of its future security. And so I don't think there was ever much doubt that Israel was going to carry out some sort of response after what Iran did here on Saturday night. And now we know, or we're starting to find out at least, what that response is. Indeed. And um, this is a, as you say, a, a tense moment. And now, uh, I mean, the ball is very much in Iran's court. Yeah, I think so. So, I th f again, you know, it is the early hours, so we must caveat all of this in that the news is unfolding and we are learning more about what has happened. But it looks as though there has been a strike on an air base in the Iranian city of Isfahan. Now, I think that is significant for two reasons. Firstly, it is quite close to an Iranian uh, nuclear facility, I think a research facility. Now, there's no suggestion that facility has been hit whatsoever, but it does send a message from Israel to Iran that, you know, we can go there if we want to, and we're not frightened to if we're pushed to do so in the future. But secondly, the base that's hit, I think, is connected to Iran's uh, military aviation industry. And so it wouldn't be a surprise to me if we learned that perhaps some of the drones that were flown here on Saturday night were manufactured or part of the drones were manufactured at that airbase. So that sort of draws a link. And so it suggests that Israel's response has been carefully calibrated and thought through. Netanyahu would have had an, a menu of options on the table provided to him by the Israeli Defense Forces. Probably at the top, would have been strikes on Iran's nuclear um, facilities and maybe assassination attempts on senior individuals. Um, and then it would have been down in a sort of a decreasing scale. I would put this lower down the scale. If this is it, and we don't know, but if this is it, I would put it lower down the scale. So the question is, what happens next? And that is down to Iran. Does Iran see this as an escalation it needs to respond to? Or does it somehow try to downplay it? Yeah, I mean, when we think about uh, the, the timeline of the past six months, I mean, we see October 7 take place and then Israel obviously uh, enters Gaza and launches their uh, operation. The war in Gaza begins just a few weeks after. And then significant things happen, like on uh, April the 1st, where we saw that diplomatic compound being, Iranian diplomatic compound being struck in Damascus, in Syria, where a senior Revolutionary Guard commander is killed. And then the attack of last weekend. And now, as part of that timeline, what we're seeing today. I mean, we are seeing these tensions between these two states really ratcheting up. And in the last few days, the war of words really ratcheted up as well. Yeah. I I, I would always be careful to separate the war of words from, from actual action. Uh, particularly the Iranians um, will often speak with a lot of emotion, um, but actually what they do in terms of their actions can be far more careful and far more considered. Um, 
the Israelis will deny until they're blue in the face that what they hit in Damascus was in any way part of the Iranian diplomatic compound. I've got to be honest, I think even amongst their allies, they don't really have much support in that argument. I think most people see it as, uh, saw that as, as, as quite a moment. And they took out um, this senior general, connected Iranian general who's connected to Hezbollah and six other Iranian officers. So, you know, we can argue and people will argue whether that was the start of it or not, but it was really the start of this current sort of round of crisis between Israel and Iran. Iran then takes its time to respond, and we saw that what it did on Saturday night. Now, I think a lot of people say what Iran did was an escalation. 300 plus drones, missiles, and ballistic missiles fired at Israel. And it was the ballistic missiles that for Israel were the red line. Now, what, four or five days later, we have Israel's response to that. And I would read this actually as lesser. I don't see them actually doing more, and you know, escalating, 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 but slightly less. And diplomats I've been speaking to this week, what they want to see is that this crisis would gradually, like a falling leaf, start to sort of drift and fizzle out with increasingly uh, lesser events going on. This could be that, it could be that depending on what the Iranians decide to do. Indeed. Um, thanks so much, Ali, uh, for all of that. And, of course, we will be going back to Ali in a moment for all of his assessment. But let's go live now to Alex Rossi, who joins us from northern Israel. And, um, Alex, we woke up uh, in the early hours of this morning and, and saw that strike, which the Americans are describing as limited. Uh, but what we did see was Israel has responded to Iran's attack last week. Yeah, that's right. I mean, certainly the indications from the Israelis were that they would hit back. It would be a military response. Bearing in mind it needs to be a military response to what happened on Saturday, there would have to be some kind of symmetry to it. Remember that what they are doing, it's not the blind use of force. It sends signals, it's messaging, it's strategic and it's tactical in nature. So it would make sense that they hit a base uh, in Iran where some of those drones were manufactured. That would have a logic to it. But the fact that it is most likely limited in nature also suggests that perhaps it's de-escalatory. There is a chance here for the Iranians uh, to deny it happened or deny that there was significant damage and they can now move past uh, this incident. Um, I think the other thing to bear in mind is whether or not this is the end of it. Remember, we'll wind back to April the 1st. That was uh, a covert strike attributed to the Israelis and denied by the Israelis, part of what is known here as the shadow war that's been fought by Iran and Israel for many years. Iran uses what's known as its axis of resistance, its proxies in the region, uh, to attack the Israelis. Now, the message that the Iranians sent was actually you can't carry on in the shadows anymore. You can't attack our nuclear scientists. You can't attack our... Iranian generals uh, without there being some kind of response. So do we see this, this over attack, which sends the signal uh, to the Iranians that they can't launch missiles? We aren't fearful, Israel says, and we will strike back and we will strike deep in Iranian territory. We will strike a city where drones were perhaps manufactured, where your nuclear program is. But also we are going to carry on with the shadow war. And we haven't seen that yet. Does Israel carry on? Will we see an attack which is denied by Israel but actually causes some serious destruction uh, to the Iranian regime. So we, we watch that. I think underlying all of this, of course, is that this remains an extraordinarily dangerous moment. Israel is facing crises on multiple fronts. The uh, war against Hamas is far from finished. Uh, on the northern border here in Israel, there are daily exchanges. There's a low-level war going on, Yalda, between Hezbollah and the Israeli military. That itself is enough of a flashpoint to cause a more significant war which could tumble, which would have its own deadly logic into a far greater regional conflict. So this is a, a really dangerous time, but we wait, of course, to see what the Iranian reaction is now to this Israeli attack. Uh, indeed. Um, Alex, thank you so much for all of your analysis there. Let's go live now to Alex Crawford, who joins us from Beirut. And um, Alex, uh, as Alex Rossi was saying there in northern uh, Israel, I mean, this really is a, a dangerous moment. Um, everyone is now watching very closely to how uh, the Iranians will respond, although uh, Iranian state media is now trying to, to play this down. And we've heard from the Americans that this was a, a limited strike. 
I think everyone behind the scenes will be doing just that, trying to play it down. Because certainly all the people that we've been speaking to over the past few days, those within Hezbollah, those very close to Hezbollah, the politicians here in Lebanon, some of those connected to Hezbollah, some of those just part of the Lebanese government, all stressing that uh, they don't want war. Uh, that also, very carefully underlined, they don't fear war and that it, the ball is very much in the Israeli court. Uh, we were surrounded by a number of uh, Hezbollah fighters yesterday, huge crowds of Hezbollah supporters and loyalists at a funeral. There are multiple funerals uh, every week from the cross-border exchanges with those uh, down south in, uh, w against the border with Israel. And all of them very determined to uh, hit back if they saw a significant attack by the Israelis. Obviously, there's a long history of distrust between Hezbollah and the Israelis, uh, very close links with Hezbollah and Iran because uh, they even had posters of Ayatollah Khomeini at the, at the funeral, a lot of people professing loyalty to Iran as well as Hezbollah. It was a, a time of, of grief to focus on those who'd been killed in the war because they feel there are very many, but also to show us and to show everyone else that they are strong. Very many of them saying that they are strong, they are powerful. Uh, Hezbollah itself has a military and political wing, and its military wing is said to be far more powerful than the Lebanese army. So uh, there was a big show uh, for the families, for those who belong to Hezbollah, but as foreigners and as a, a foreign media team there, they were determined to let us know that there was no fear if there was a retaliation, if there was a big... Uh, as in their view, provocative strike from Israel. But certainly behind the scenes, all the political maneuvers, all the diplomatic maneuvers, all the attempts are to try to play this down. You heard the Lebanese foreign minister earlier this week, Yalda, talking about how the ball was in Israel's court, that they had only a certain amount of influence over Hezbollah, that if there was a big provocative strike, it would spread out into a massive big regional war and maybe even further that it would draw in the Houthis in Yemen, the militia group in Syria, the Hezbollah linked groups in Syria as well as in Iraq and of course here in Lebanon, a country which has already suffered for many years from a massive economic downturn and years of, of war. Now, they believe here, in, in uh, the south of Lebanon particularly, that they are already engaged in a low-level third front. The Lebanese foreign minister, again, underlining that, that there is this almost forgotten third front in this, this whole Middle East war, and that is the Lebanese-Israeli border, where they are having multiple strikes. It's, there's seen a massive increase since the weekend in the number of of strikes on the border with uh, a number of, of funerals, if we gauge the casualties in that, a number of funerals uh, per day since, since we've just been here, and thousands and thousands of people displaced on both sides of the border. Nearly 80 villages and towns on this side of the border, in Lebanon, in the south of Lebanon, which have had to have been emptied, which are now ghost towns because of the regular firing between the two sides between Israel and Hezbollah. But again, Hezbollah telling us, at least over and over again, that of course Hezbollah is not the same as Hamas. They felt they were a target of the Israelis since October the 7th because they are seen to be so close to Iran, because they've had these very fundamental links with Iran, but they very much do not see themselves in quite the same vulnerable position as Hamas. They are a big, strong, army that once defeated uh, uh, and pushed out Israeli troops back in 2006. They feel now that they have grown, developed, and become much more powerful, built up their arsenal, um, built up their, their uh, fighting force. They're not the same as they were back in, in those days in 2006. They believe they're much stronger. So the whole time that we've been here, uh, since the Iranian drone and missile uh, attack over the weekend, there have been constant uh, t telling us, constant um, attempts to tell us about, you know, warnings almost through us to the rest of the world, do not try and attack, make a wide-scale, large-scale attack on Iran. And from, by all accounts, 
this could be seen to be very low scale. So I'm sure this, everyone will be working massively behind the scenes to try and persuade the Iranians and also Hezbollah that it is just that. It is too low scale. In fact, the first indication from the Hezbollah leadership is that that is how they're viewing it, that uh, they don't see, in their words, that the Israelis don't seem to have a plan, that it's clear they don't have the uh, the uh, wherewithal to, to make a big scale attack. So they are the, the first first uh, uh, statements from Hezbollah is that they they also are trying to pass it off as as nothing. Alex, uh, thank you uh, as always uh, for all of your reporting and bringing us up to date on on the views there from uh, Lebanon and the spillover that this could potentially have regionally. Well, let's just bring you up to date. Uh, we woke up in the early hours of the morning to learn that Israel had launched uh, an attack on uh, Iran. We understand and early indications suggest that it was a single strike on a carefully selected uh, target. Um, Iranian state media are reporting that Air defences were fired close to Isfahan International Airport at around 4 a.m. local time in Iran. They say that drones were intercepted and there were no explosions on the ground. Now, we haven't been able to verify those claims, but uh, that is what they tell us is that uh, Iran um, it, and, and the views that we're getting uh, from our correspondents and, and what we're hearing is that that is Iran downplaying uh, this situation. Now, that could be crucial to what happens next. But what we have learned in the early hours of this morning is that Israel did launch a strike, uh, from what we understand, on Iran. Let's bring in our U.S. correspondent, James Matthews, who joins us live from Washington. And, and James, we are hearing from uh, U.S. officials uh, that this strike was limited. Yeah, that's the, that's the word coming from U.S. officials who are not saying much, I might say, Yalda, I mean, it's the middle of the night here in the United States, but uh, they're being quiet. The Pentagon, State Department, the White House, uh, keeping, keeping their head down because whilst they had prior knowledge of this Israeli strike, they don't want to be seen to have been a participant. And that's the one thing that they are saying, that in this limited strike, the United States did not play uh, a part. They're making that very clear. Uh, clear as they are on the possibility that they might be uh, seen to have been involved and seen to be engaged in this military action. Uh, they see the danger of the, the consequences that may flow from that. Biden uh, clearly uh, was in touch with Netanyahu in the wake of Saturday's Iranian attack, Yalda. He said to him, take the win, you have the win. And he made it clear that the United States wouldn't support any retaliation strike by Israel. But what he did not do uh, was tell Netanyahu not to launch a strike. I think there is a US and American understanding that Israel felt it had to go ahead and launch some kind of action. Uh, it's interesting that as a couple of hours ago, almost as soon as this action had taken place, the Americans felt confident in calling it a limited strike. The Americans were notified uh, that it was going to happen. So it, it may be safe to assume that there were detailed conversations around the Israeli course of action, where they were going to hit, the damage it was likely to inflict, and that there was a blessing by US defence officials, a blessing and an understanding that it had to happen. And we will find out in due course, but an agreement that it was appropriate, calibrated, not to escalate in a way the Americans don't want. That is Biden's big fear, that this blows up out of all control. The strength Biden has is that none of the key players, Iran, Israel, the United States as it watches on, have any interest in escalated conflict. Israel has quite enough on its plate. It doesn't want increased trouble, as Alex was saying, from Hezbollah in the northern Border. Iran has made it clear to the United States in private and in public that it doesn't want direct conflict with the states. Uh, and clearly the United States doesn't want to be dragged in to uh, any wider theater of war or any kind of action militarily. That would happen if it saw Israel going under, if there was increased military pressure 
on Israel and it felt the need to step in to bail out uh, militarily an ally. But the question is, what does Iran do next? And my mind goes back to Sunday, Yalda. I was at the United Nations listening to the Security Council. You may remember that I caught up with Saeed Erevani, the UN ambassador for Iran. Polite, softly spoken. We had a, a chat on his way to his, uh, to his vehicle at the UN. And I asked him, if, a, if Israel strikes Iran, what does Iran do? And his response was that Iran's reaction would be decisive, he said, and resolute. I said, well, what does that mean? And he didn't say, I suppose in due course, we might well find out what decisive and resolute meant. Yeah, I mean, James, even yesterday, uh, Iran's president, uh, Ibrahim Raisi, said that even if the tiniest uh, attack is launched by Israel, uh, the response will be far greater than what we saw last Saturday, where we saw 300 missiles and, and drones launched uh, against uh, Israel. Um, since the very beginning of um, the last six months, really, uh, the Biden administration has really tried to ensure that this doesn't escalate, that this war between Hamas and Israel doesn't spill over to the rest of the region. They have had concerns about what's happening in the north of Israel with Hezbollah. They've had concerns about the actions of the Houthis, and they've been watching very closely uh, on what Iran has done. Even that April 1st attack that uh, Israel launched on the, uh, the Iranian uh, diplomatic compound, which ended up killing a, a Quds Force commander, the Iranians, we understand, uh, the Americans behind the scenes, we understand, uh, were telling the Iranians through intermediaries that, look, we weren't aware of this, we, you know, we, ha we didn't give this our blessing. And, and, you know, after Saturday, we heard Biden say to Netanyahu, as you say, take the win. This poses a, a bigger question around the relationship between Netanyahu and President Biden and whether Biden has been able at all to control him throughout the last six months. You're absolutely right, uh, Yelda. That is the key question at the heart of this. The key question for Biden moving forward, not just in terms of the international context, but also domestically, given, uh, given domestic reaction to what's happening uh, in the Middle East and criticism of him, that he doesn't have sufficient influence to, to rein in Netanyahu and to prevent growing tragedy in Gaza. And yes, it's the relationship, it's the access at the heart of what is happening, the American superpower and Netanyahu, the man on the ground. Israel, America's big ally, funded uh, by Israel, and, and it still enjoys uh, solid support from the Americans. The question is, how long can that last? What control does Biden exert, and to what extent does Biden ignore America? He has done that in the past, humiliated Biden repeatedly, that is a question going forward and it becomes ever more important. Yeah, very much so. And we heard uh, um, Prime Minister uh, Netanyahu say earlier in the week um, that, you know, thanks very much for your counsel and advice, uh, but we are going to do what we need to do. James, thank you very much uh, for bringing us up to date. Let's go to Defence Analyst Professor Michael Clark, who joins me now. And, um, and Michael, big questions being asked about what the strike was, how it was conducted. We're still getting that information coming through. Uh, there is still very little information about exactly what what we understand is it was uh, over uh, Isfahan, uh, the, the air over Isfahan is where we're told that this, this uh, strike was conducted. Yes, uh, we've got some confirmation of that, Yalda, that uh, there were some explosions in Isfahan around the air base there, and there is a big uh, air base at Isfahan. Isfahan's also pretty, a, a pretty big industrial centre, very important city. It's also one of the, you might call the nuclear cities. It's not uh, the home to a nuclear reactor or enrichment plants. They're mainly at Fordo and Natanz, a bit further south. But there's a big research centre. I mean, most of the nuclear research uh, that Iran conducts is carried out at Isfahan. About 3,000 scientists work there. Now, there's no evidence that these explosions were anywhere near the nuclear facilities. 
Um, but the fact that it's one of the nuclear cities is symbolically uh, not lost, I think, on uh, people assessing this and uh, attacking the air base at Isfahan. If that's what if that's where the explosions were, they seem to be uh, would make a certain amount of sense. Also, I mean, the uh, the Tasnim agency, the Tasnim news agency, which is very close to the IRGC, was also reporting explosions in um, Tabriz. Now, we haven't confirmed that. And Sky's been very cautious about that. But other agencies are talking about that. But the reason that, that Tabriz might be important, along with Isfahan, is that one of the things that Isfahan produces is drones that were used to attack Israel last weekend. And one of the things that exists at Tabriz, which is in the northwest, in the mountainous area, it's there are a lot of silos there for Shahab 2 and Shahab 3 ballistic missiles, which were also used to attack Israel last weekend. So if it is the case, if it is the case, that both Isfahan and Tabriz have been attacked, it would look like the Israelis are going after certain targets that were directly related to the attack last weekend where 330 drones and missiles were launched against Israel. Now, that's not confirmed yet, certainly in terms of Tabriz, but the Isfahan attack is confirmed, and almost certainly from a military analysis, it has to be almost certainly ballistic missiles um, the Iranians are saying drones, they, they've intercepted some drones and none of them uh, got through. That's very, very unlikely because Isfahan is a thousand miles away from, uh, uh, from Israel and nobody in their right mind will send drones a thousand miles to deliver very small payloads, uh, which they can only really carry. So for any sort of effective attack, a couple of missiles at least usually two missiles used on each target to make sure there's a 98% chance of, of a, a proper hit. And so two missiles at least, and probably more, were sent against uh, these targets in Isfahan. Almost certainly there would have been the Jericho 3 missile. That has a, a, a range of at least 3,000 miles, so it's easily capable of reaching the area. And it carries a 1,000 um, a, a, a uh, kiloton warhead, which is a ton. Uh, sorry, a 1,000 thousand kilo. Uh, yeah, thousand kilogram warhead uh, which is a ton uh, so uh, in that respect it would be a, a a big enough explosion to make a difference to something as big as an air base or a facility Michael, no surprises that uh, Iran would say uh, they were drones just to try and downplay uh, the the this attack and and the impact of it yeah I mean the, the, everything we've heard from the Iranians in the last two or three hours, is, uh, is indicates that they're saying, look, there's nothing here to see. Uh, it was an attack, it was trivial, it didn't matter. Um, and if more attacks do come to light, and I've seen some American reports which are reporting a lot more attacks, and I'm very sceptical about that, but we'll see in the coming hours. But the Iranians have an interest in saying this is a one-off attack, it was drones, it didn't matter, therefore it relieves them of the responsibility of being so outraged by it that they feel they have to do something else even more decisive. And so both sides here are trying to save face. You can see that the Israelis are trying to save face to do something, but not so much that it upsets the Allies too much, which is why, as, as James was saying, they, they've been very careful this time to uh, inform their American allies and almost not get their approval, because they won't get approval, but to get at least their acceptance of what they're doing. And the Iranians are being quite careful um, not to overplay this at the moment, to indicate that as they react, they may react in a way that doesn't now hit Israel directly, but maybe tries to indicate some other reaction on targets elsewhere in the region and possibly even on, on shipping in the Strait of Hormuz, as they did um, last week. Um, the, you know, the idea that the Iranians will be seen to react but not react in a way that is escalatory is, is growing in, in credibility as the hours go on. So things are looking a bit calmer at the moment than they did about three or four hours ago. It's still difficult to know how exactly the uh, Iranians will react, um, Michael. I've been speaking to uh, Israeli officials here who were quite surprised that following that uh, Iranian compound that was attacked by the Israelis on April the 1st, that the reaction and response would be a state-on-state -state attack, which they say crossed every red line and every understanding that they had of how uh, Iran would respond to something like that. Yeah, I mean, the assassination of Zahidi in Damascus 
did cross a lot of red lines, not just for the Iranians, but for other uh, countries as well, because this was a, uh, a consular building within the embassy compound. It was diplomatic premises. And whoever is in the diplomatic premises, th there is a general ac acceptance in diplomacy that you don't attack diplomatic premises, even if the Israelis claim that that made it a military target because there were military figures there. Nobody would accept that, I think, in the diplomatic world. So that attack on the 1st of April against Zahidi, which got him and 15 others, um, did cross a number of lines and surprised and, and um, disappointed, I think, quite a lot of Israel's allies. And the Iranians felt that that by attacking an embassy, they were effectively attacking Iranian territory and the Iranians then hit back. And the Iranian attack, 330 missiles and drones, was clearly intended to do a lot more damage than it did. Seven missiles, ballistic missiles, got through of those 330 to the Navatim Air Base in the south of Israel, quite near to Dimona, incidentally, which is the nuclear site of, in Israel, one of the important nuclear sites. Um, but only seven got through and, and created very minor damage. Undoubtedly, the Iranians were briefing out that really the attack was a, a symbol. It was intended to fail. They didn't want it to be too bad. We informed our allies before we did it. I don't, I don't believe that. I, I know they did inform their allies. But if they wanted a, an attack that was intended merely as a, as a symbol, then it would have been 50 or 60 drones and missiles. 330 was clearly intended to do a lot more damage than it actually did. So I think the Iranians did respond strongly they have been somewhat humiliated by the lack of success of that attack, although they're, they're still playing it up as a propaganda victory because they attacked Israeli territory. But here the Israelis are humiliating the Iranians in the eyes of the world. And they, what the Israelis are saying is, look, if we choose to drop two Jericho missiles on you, they will get through, and they will, because the Iranians don't really have an air defense system that can um, defend themselves effectively against a Jericho 3 missile. So the Israelis are making the point that, you know, we don't need to send 330 missiles and drones. We'll send two, we'll send six, we'll send 10, and they will hit you. They will get through, and they'll hit you at a place of our choosing. And that's the message, I think, which these limited attacks so far seem designed to send to Tehran. Michael, thank you so much uh, for all of your analysis there. That's Professor Michael Clark. Well, let's just bring you up to date. We woke up in the early hours of this morning to learn that uh, Israel had lo launched uh, a strike on Iran. It was about 4 a.m. local time, according to uh, Iranian state media. They're reporting that air defences were fired close to Isfahan International Airport uh, in central Iran. They say that drones were intercepted and there were no explosions uh, on the ground. Uh, now, we are waiting uh, to see whether there is any response from the Iranians, but the reports that we're getting at present, we can't verify any of these claims uh, that the Iranian state media is reporting, uh, but that is uh, how the Iranians are currently reporting it. Let's bring in Ali for more analysis. And Ali, all week we've been hearing from the, the war cabinet um, about the various options that they've been looking at. Where do you think this fits on the, on the scale of that, these strikes? Well, if, the, if, if this is it, and when I say if this is it, if there's nothing more to come, um, and if the reports of other strikes elsewhere in the region turn out not to be true, then I think it falls much lower down in that menu of options. Uh, I think Israel could have gone in far bigger if it had wanted to do so. And without doubt, there would have been people here in the Israeli administration, particularly I'm thinking of those on the right wing, the likes of Itamar Ben Gavir, Bezalel Smotrich, who would have wanted Israel to have done that. Uh, there would have been people in Netanyahu's ear saying, this is the moment. Come on, this is our chance to, to really hit them back, to really degrade their, their, their nuclear uh, program. Netanyahu doesn't look as though he's decided on that option. He looks as though he's decided on limited, targeted and calibrated strikes on Iran. And that might not provide a step for Iran to take, but I do think it is part of a, an off-ramp if that is where Iran wants to go. And I would fully expect that in the coming hours we will hear from Iranian leaders. Is their language the sort of you know, heavy emotional language we heard, particularly yesterday when they were saying, you know, even the tiniest strike and we will hit you back. Is it that kind of language or is it rather dismissive? Do they try and sort of downplay it? 
and I think that will tell us what Iran wants to do next. Well, certainly state media has been downplaying it, haven't they? They haven't quite got their messaging uh, coordinated. There's been some saying, eh, nothing to see here. There's others been saying, we shot down drones, look how successful our air defences are. And there's others been saying, actually, some explosions have happened. So I don't sense a coordination in the Iranian um, uh, uh, messaging as, as things stand at the moment. And ultimately, it will come from a, cu- a few key figures. Uh, the Ayatollah, Ayatollah Khamenei, um, I think if we hear from Raisi today as well, we heard from him earlier on in the week, uh, and possibly some of the senior IRGC generals, that will, that will tell us where we're heading on this. And if they start threatening uh, Israel and a response, as they did after April the 1st and the consulate attack in Damascus, then that's, I think, what we should be looking at. If, as I say, if they try and downplay it, then I think it's a signal that Iran is looking for an off-ramp. That doesn't mean to say they won't do anything, but it would suggest to me that they are looking to try and see a way out of this crisis. Ali, thank you, uh, as always. And, of course, we will come back to you uh, in a moment. But let's uh, bring in Nimrod Gorand, Senior Fellow for Israeli Affairs at the Middle East Institute. Uh, Nimrod, thanks so much uh, for joining us. All week since that uh, attack that Iran launched on Israel, we've been hearing uh, from global leaders, uh, President Biden, saying to the Israelis, see this as a win. This past weekend, the uh, fact that you were able to, uh, you know, really shoot down and and, uh, uh, prevent the attack from uh, Iran from being uh, anything, um, see it as a success. Israel said, we have to respond. How do you assess this current response? Thank you. We are uh, still in early hours, of course. So whatever we're discussing could unfold in a different direction, but I think Israel definitely saw it as a win, it's a success, but this didn't mean that Israel did not need to respond from its point of view. The message before the Iranian attack was very clear that if Iran attacks on Israel from its territory, Israel will retaliate in Iran. Now, the way to do that, I think, was in line uh, with the principle that Israel spelled out during that week, meaning, first and foremost, coordination with the U.S., we saw the significant role that the U.S. and other countries played in defending Israel last week. It was clear that Israel should be coordinated. It doesn't mean that there was an American green light, but it definitely was clear that the attack should be in line with what the American request considerations are. It seems like that has been the case. Plus, the Israeli reluctance from doing any attack that will lead to a wider escalation. There is no Israeli interest now with a, another full-fledged war fund. Uh, we had enough of that. So I think that's kind of the way Israel acted. And according to the initial responses from all the sides, it seemed like uh, sides are interested in de-escalating the situation. Of course, that could still change. Yeah, as you say, we'll have to wait and see. It's still the early hours. And, uh, you know, from American sources, they've described it as limited. Iranian state media has tried to downplay it. But it's still difficult to know how the Iranians exactly will respond and react to this. Exactly. We need to remember also that the covert war between Israel and Iran has been taking place for four years, basically, with uh, Israeli attacks already happening on Iranian soil without taking responsibility. So the model of Israel uh, seemingly acting, not officially taking responsibility, indicated through leaks to American sources, to the media, that it was behind that. Uh, Iranian response denies that an attack from outside the country took place and downplays the impact. All of that is a tit for tat in terms of the escalation language. Uh, so I think that's where the, the direction is heading. The choice of the target that Israel uh, picked uh, it was not a civilian, it was not a nuclear, it uh, reportedly was an Air Force a target, much like the Iranian attack was targeting an Air Force base in Israel. So it seems to be in a process of containment, or at least the, the goal uh, is to contain. I think international diplomacy should now pitch in and make sure that this containment will actually take place and that the language being used by both sides will not lead to the escalation or necessitate another phase of uh, mutual attacks. Goran, what sort of message do you think Israel was trying to send to Iran? I think the message is that Israel can first has the capacity to act. Okay, One of the things that was evident in the Iranian attack that it needed, didn't make the impact within Israel that Iran wanted to do. So Israel wanted to show the capacity, the capabilities. Israel wanted to show the principle, because we are basically in the first type of event between Israel and Iran, the first time there is public, direct confrontation, military confrontation. And the concern is whether we are trying to shape a new type of status quo 
that may not play into Israel's security and strategic interest. So whatever response Israel is doing, the, the basic principle of responding is intended to also get out of this phase of confrontation in a way that paves the way for the future rules of engagement and do not change them to the benefit of Iran against Israel. So I think those were the interests at play with the Israeli leadership, plus again, not to enter another military adventure with a power that has the capacity to really cause damage to Israel. And we saw how much just the waiting for the Iranian attack made an impact on Israeli society. I don't think that's what uh, Israelis need at the moment more. Uh, Goran, I, I, you know, as you say, for years there's been a, a, covert, a covert war, there's been a, a shadow war. But what makes this particular week different is that it has been overt, it's been state on state. That is where these red lines have now been crossed. Definitely. And what happened a week ago was something that Israel has never faced. You know, we had more than 300 missiles and drones targeting Israel coming from Iran. It was a totally new wartime experience for Israel. Israelis were not sure what the capacity of the state to defend itself against such an attack. So there was a lot of relief when that attack was blocked. There was a, a very positive surprise, perhaps, to see how the regional international actors joined in in basically defending Israel's territory. We saw a major role for Jordan. We saw the Saudis, we heard the Emiratis, the American leadership. So each one had their own motivations or the different framings of defending their airspace or other interests. But eventually, it was a coalition, an undeclared coalition, led by the Americans with Arab countries, defending Israel against an attack in Iran, showing just how deep the joint interests in the regions are how sustainable and resilient regional cooperation could be, even at a time of war in Gaza, when all the Arab world and the international community are criticizing Israel, that sends a very important message for Israel, not only in its ability to have the upper hand against Iran, but also the context of regional coordination within its operates, very different than the traditional Israel experience being isolated in the region. Nimrod Goren, Senior Fellow for Israeli Affairs at the Middle East Institute, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Let's go live now to our Alex Rossi, who joins me from northern Israel. And Alex, although we continue to hear that Iranian state media is trying to downplay uh, these strikes, that we're hearing from American sources that they're saying this was limited, no doubt the region is now, continues to be, as they have been for the last week, frankly, for the last six months, on edge. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this crisis, we do not know which way it's going. Is this the beginning of the end? Is this the beginning of the beginning? None of that at the moment is clear. Um, we're certainly now in a situation, of course, when we are waiting for uh, whether or not there will be an Iranian response to this Israeli attack. There's also questions, of course, Yalda, about whether or not this Israeli attack uh, is over. And then there is the situation of the Iranian proxies around Israel as well, where I am in the north of the country, there has been, a, you know, effectively a low-level war being fought between Hezbollah uh, militants in Lebanon. This is a paramilitary organization which is heavily sponsored by the Iranians and Israeli forces. That is going on every day, daily exchanges of rocket and missile fire. A couple of days ago, for instance, a Bedouin village up towards the coast on Israel, uh, a, new, um, a Hezbollah attack, 14 soldiers seriously injured, um, uh, sorry, 14 soldiers injured, seven of them uh, seriously injured. Now, that was in response to an Israeli strike, Hezbollah say, which uh, uh, killed a Hezbollah commander. So you can see that this really is a flashpoint. Um, we may see de-escalation now between Iran and Israel, but there's big questions here about whether or not this leads to a broader war. Alex, thank you uh, very much for that update. Let's go straight to the United States and speak with our James Matthews. And, and James, still early uh, in the morning in the United States, but uh, no doubt uh, once the officials have got their lines together, we'll be hearing more uh, about the American reaction to this. Uh, yes, I think so, uh, Yalda. Yeah, it's the middle of the night in the United States. The, the two lines coming out of here are that the attack was limited and that the United States didn't play any part in it. I think the fact that we haven't heard from uh, the Americans probably plays into the fact that they are playing it down. That's, that would be the wish or that would be the hope of President Biden that this does not amount to the escalation that he fears and that uh, the word coming out of Iran talking 
uh, you know, talking it down in terms of impact, damage and uh, implications of the strike. If that is the way the Iranians are framing this, then that will be what Biden wants to hear. He fears escalation. He fears the impact of an escalated war. And he, he will be conscious once more of Benjamin Netanyahu as an individual over whom he doesn't have the influence that he would like, doesn't have the control that he would like over Israel and what Israel does next. Biden said to Netanyahu just a few days ago, take the win after the Iranian strike, take the win, said the United States would not support Israel in a strike of retaliation. And yet here we are, we have this Israeli strike tonight. So great uncertainty that Joe Biden will feel acutely. Yeah, indeed, as you say, uh, great uncertainty uh, at present. James, thanks so much. Uh, let's get more now on that uh, Israeli attack on Iran uh, that happened in the early hours of the morning. Let's bring in Deborah Haynes, our security and defense uh, editor. And uh, Deborah, all week we were hearing from the Israelis that there would be some kind of response, some kind of uh, attack. And overnight we saw that this really is a, a very tense moment, although we are hearing from Iranian state media that this was uh, just some kind of uh, drone uh, drone strike that were, and, and it was shot down. Um, so we can't verify any of that, but that is what the Iranians are saying at present. Yes, and I also think that the, the scale of what exactly has happened overnight maybe isn't completely clear yet. And so we will, I assume, learn more about whatever the targets were that Israel was seeking to hit. It became very apparent, didn't it, after uh, last weekend's attack on Israel, that despite the best efforts by the UK, the US and others to urge restraint, to take the win, as they kept on saying, that Israel really was going to to fight back. And sources that I've been speaking to this week um, in you know, Western uh, sources have said to me that the, the hope has been um, that Israel strikes back, you know, not the hope that they would do, but the understanding that they would do in a, a, a targeted, as targeted and as limited a way as possible so that Iran could with, you know, maybe withstand that attack, Iran maybe needing to fight back itself. Um, but but that, that response by Iran being not as big as the one that happened at the weekend, but a reduced one. And so you have a gradual tit for, da, tit for tat, but in a reduction kind of way until it peters out. But as one source put it to me, it really is um, a high stakes poker, because obviously whenever there is military action, even if it's deliberate and targeted, there is always the chance of misunderstanding, miscalculation, mistake, and then escalation into uncontrolled conflict, which is clearly what everyone is incredibly concerned about. And now that this strike back has happened, uh, the big question will be how Iran and Iran's proxies in the region respond. And you can imagine that American, British and other allied forces in the region will be on high alert as this situation unfolds. Uh, indeed, uh, Deborah, thank you very much. And as uh, Deborah was saying, there are a lot of uncertainty. We're still learning uh, about uh, these uh, strikes that we're hearing about. Iran state media has reported that air defences had been fired and explosions had been heard uh, near Isfahan International uh, Airport. Uh, but we did wake up in the early hours of the morning to learn that Israel had launched uh, an attack on Iran in response to the attack that Iran had launched on Israel last weekend. This is a developing story. We are still waiting to get more information. We heard there from James Matthews who said uh, US sources are saying that this strike was limited, but it is unclear what will happen next and how the Iranians will respond and react. We are following all the developments here from Jerusalem, but for now, back to you, Gareth, in the studio. Yalda, for the moment, thank you so much. We'll cross live back to Yalda in due course throughout the course of the morning, reporting there from Jerusalem for us. Uh, you join us in London. We've got Deborah Haynes here, obviously. Jacob Jarvis, podcasting news reporter. Gerpreet too, as well. And Deborah, it feels as though this shadow war is now out in the open. Yeah, it's not very much a shadow war, no. is it? And it's, it, everyone is very, very aware that there's been this hybrid um, sort of sub-war war that's been going on between Israel and Iran for, for years with uh, deniable attacks 
on each other. Um, that changed, and not just with last weekend's attack, but when Israel chose to target the, uh, the Iranian consulate in Damascus, killing those senior generals. That really was seen on the Iranian side as a red line. And interestingly, you've had even um, the British Foreign Secretary uh, saying that that kind of attack on uh, diplomatic property would, uh, you know, would prompt a response from the UK, for example. But then the condemnation was the scale of the Iranian response with all those hundreds of missiles, um, including ballistic missiles and drones targeted at Israel. Uh, and that, that that, that too was a red line, that direct attack on Israel, a country that ha is surrounded by neighbours that want to uh, you know, extinguish its very existence. Mm -hmm. And so there's been this debate all week as to how they would respond. And now we're seeing the beginning of it. Um, I, mean, I don't think we fully know the full scale of what's happened overnight, but it does so far seem quite limited. And Gerpri mentioned there from Deborah with regards to the Foreign Secretary David mm. Cameron. He had travelled to Jerusalem yeah. and, the, and the feedback seemed to be from Benjamin Netanyahu, the Israeli Prime Minister, that Israel would make its own decisions regardless of what the UK or the US said to them. Yeah, David Cameron met uh, Netanyahu on Wednesday. They had a meeting. And after that meeting, as you pointed out, Netanyahu said, ultimately, we will make our decisions ourselves. I think kind of further um, point, making this point that um, although we kind of sit here and talk about... Um, whether, you know, how Britain is going to respond. We're still waiting for the line from the FCO, from the government, about what it makes of all of this. Ultimately, our uh, influence on what Israel is doing and on the decisions that Netanyahu will make mm. is very limited. Mm. And, Jacob, this all happens as G7 foreign ministers meeting in Capri. That was from the 16th to the 19th. We should surely expect more commentary. We're waiting kind of for official lines to the United States. But we saw people like the French, for example, as well, taking part in the defence and interception of those missiles. So G7 ministers will surely be calibrating how they respond to the situation here. Absolutely. It's, it's such a complex situation throughout the Middle East. And it will be interesting to see how the United States does react to this, which I'm sure will lead the rest of Western nations. But interestingly, how... In regards to support of Israel, there is obviously a situation with Gaza and I think the, the way the international community were feeling about how they were handling that situation had obviously turned and the US were pushing for a ceasefire there and wanting to question their support of Israel in certain ways. And then this has happened, which I'm sure you'll see, obviously America will be steadfastly supporting Israel, but how that changes the relationship between Biden and Netanyahu and shapes the, the negotiations all around and the way they discuss that, it's going to be very interesting to yeah. see. That narrative sharply changing, you know, following that, that, those killings of the World Central Kitchen workers, those seven people who were killed, there was an awful lot of kind of pressure being put on Israel now of sense that, that countries are coalescing back around it again, certainly for the short term. Yes, and that was, that, that's been really sort of playing into how Israel responds, because it wasn't just British, American and French support that rallied to Israel's defences uh, on Saturday night to fend Jordanians. off that attack. You had the Jordanians and you know, the Israelis are understandably tight-lipped about which countries in the region were helping. Um, but clearly there was a coalition that included Arab states too. And that is a, a sense of support that Israel will need as it confronts Iran in whatever way it's choosing to do. It's obviously those two are arch enemies and neither side so far have indicated they want to have a direct war, but clearly the fact that they are, we're now in a situation where you've got both sides firing directly at each other, then clearly the path to escalation is very um, acute and everyone right now will be working behind the scenes on both sides to try to, 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 to sort of damp things down. And it's interesting, the UK has got a different kind of relationship with Iran than countries like the United States uh, and also, of course, Israel. We still yeah, we have a functioning embassy there. We do have diplomatic relations. So potentially there must be, you imagine, um, some sort of conversation influence. You had the foreign secretary talking to his, his Iranian counterpart during this crisis too. So it's not just that we're talking to the Israelis on this. Mm. Um, the UK has a part to play on, on speaking to both sides. And there's been pressure, hasn't there, on the UK government to potentially designate the IGRC, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, as, as a terrorist entity or to, to some degree. But David Cameron's saying, no, that conversation is important to still be able to have that channel, like, like Deborah says. Yeah, I think it's really interesting what's going on um, in government because there's been some talk about, you know, how aligned David Cameron and Rishi Sunak are on this issue. Um, 
David Cameron has like largely been taking the lead on it. Um, but also there's, um, you know, a huge amount of constant shifting in the public's perception of what's going on with this conflict. And in the run-up to uh, the general election, we've also seen a lot of pressure on Labour as well to um, clarify their position and to shift their position. So I think one thing I'll be looking out for is to see how Labour have responded to what's been going on just now. You mentioned there UK politics. There is some breaking news with regards to politics here in, in Westminster at the moment. Yeah, so it's understood uh, that uh, Anne Lees Dodds of the Labour Party has uh, formally uh, requested, um, we haven't had this confirmed from Labour yet, but has formally requested that the police uh, investigate Mark Menzies, that's the Conservative MP, we had news about that yesterday, who it's understood may have misused campaign funds for personal reasons. We'll follow that mm. development closely. Obviously, lots of stories making the papers today. The events of this morning, not yet in the papers. That's happened after the publication of those. What should we expect to see in the coming hours? Well, I think, first of all, there'll be the, an, a full understanding of exactly what... Or as full as possible, an understanding of, of, of what has or hasn't been targeted. Uh, you'll obviously have the Iranian response. They're clearly wanting to make out as if it's business as usual. There, were, there was a lot of concern that Israel would seek to target Iran's nuclear facilities. Um, and that would have obviously been very escalatory ha had they or have they done that. Um, and then, obviously, the, the, the reactions from allies too. We'll follow all those developments closely. Do stay with us, Deborah, Jacob, Fairpreet, thank you so much. Stick with us on Sky News. We'll have the developments throughout the course of the morning and on the website too.
Good morning from Jerusalem, where people are waking up to the news that Israel has attacked Iran. Iran's state news agency reported that air defences had been fired and explosions were heard near Isfahan International Airport. Israel warned the United States that the strike was coming. The impact of the attack is not yet clear, but it does appear to have been limited and Iranian media is reporting there has been no damage to nuclear facilities. And we'll be getting reaction from the UK government here in our Westminster studio. Good morning, I'm Yalda Hakim, live from Jerusalem. We've, been, uh, we've woken up this morning to the news that Israel has attacked Iran. Early indications suggest a single strike on a carefully selected target. It's a significant moment. Alex Rossi is in northern Israel. Our special correspondent, Alex Crawford, is in Beirut. And our US correspondent, James Matthews, is in Washington for us. Iranian state media is reporting that air defences were fired close to Isfahan International Airport in central Iran at around 4 a.m. local time in Iran. They say that drones were intercepted and there were no explosions on the ground. We haven't been able to verify those claims, but what they suggest to us is that Iran is playing down the attack. That could be crucial for what happens next. This video is from the international, uh, Iranian Revolutionary Guard Telegram channel. It reportedly shows the explosions in the sky near uh, Isfahan. Just have a look. Now, Alistair Bunkel uh, is with me now. And uh, Ali, I mean, this is a developing story, but Israel said they were going to do it. They've now done it. It's a question of what Iran does next. Israel took their time. Netanyahu is not a leader who typically makes quick decisions. He will have had a lot of voices in his ear, the likes of Joe Biden saying, take the win, don't exacerbate the situation further. And then he'll have had other right-wingers in his coalition saying the opposite. Let's go hard at Iran. Let's attack their nuclear facilities. Let's teach them a lesson. In the end, five days after the airstrikes here on Israel, I think he's gone for a lesser option. He would have been provided with a menu of different responses that the Israeli military could have carried out, ranging from an attack on the Iranian nuclear facility at the top, perhaps an assassination of a senior figure, and in a decreasing scale. And I think he's gone down the lower end of things, hoping that it sends a clear message of deterrence, hoping that it proves to the Iranians that Israel can strike Iran when it wants, where it wants. Don't forget that Iran sent more than 300 drones and missiles here on Saturday night. Most of them didn't even make it into Israeli airspace. It looks like Israel has fired a small number of missiles at Iran and they've all got through. And that sends a pretty powerful message to the Iranians. Ali, in some ways, April 1, where Iran's diplomatic compound was hit and a senior Revolutionary Guard commander was killed, that in itself was an escalation. It was. The Israelis will tell you until they're blue in the face that it was not a consular um, building, it was not part of a diplomatic compound, and that the people inside were the enemies of Israel. I have to be honest, I, I don't think they have much support in their assessment of whether or not, or the sort of classification of that building. I, you know, privately, American and British diplomats I've spoken to do think that it was a consular building and therefore it did cross a red line, it did breach uh, the Vienna Convention. And so it was a major escalation and that set in motion uh, the train of events that we're seeing play out now. We then fast forward to what happened last Saturday night, and I think that was a further escalation from the Iranians. Not only did they come out of this shadow war and directly attack Israel for the first time ever, the fact that they sent so many drones and missiles, including ballistic missiles, took everyone by surprise, and it was the use of ballistic missiles that crossed the red line for Israel. And so we've then gone to the events of the last few hours, and I would see the, Iran, uh, the Israeli response and what Israel has done in the last few hours, assuming there's nothing more that we don't yet know about, and assuming that that's it, I would see that as steps towards de-escalation. Each side is going to want to have the final say, and it might be that Iran feels compelled to do something, but I think Israel is providing Iran with, with an off-ramp. 
Ali, uh, in the last uh, week when I've been speaking to Israeli officials, frankly, it appears that they've been quite shocked by Iran's response to that diplomatic compound being hit. They say that all sorts of red lines were crossed, that they didn't quite expect that 300 drones and missiles would, would end up coming their way as a result of, of that attack. No, I think, I, I think the Israelis have been pushing the envelope over the last six and a bit months. Whether or not that, whether that's um, against Hezbollah and striking increasingly deeper into into Lebanon and taking out more senior Hezbollah commanders, and the reason I reference Hezbollah is because they they are the Iranian proxy up on the northern border here, and I think they 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 were pushing it, and probably, if I'm guessing, the calculation in Israeli security circles was that they could carry out this strike on the on the concert building in Damascus and not risk a major fallout. And so I think they were very surprised by what happened on Saturday night. We all were. Uh, and that is why they were always going to respond. Israel was always going to respond in some form. This is their response. And so is this it? Is there any more to come or is this it? And now we need to look at Iran because it's in the Iranian hands what happens next. What is the language that the Iranian leaders are going to be using later today, will it be fiery rhetoric of revenge or will it try and downplay it? And Ali, so far, what has Iranian state media been saying? It does feel sort of different outlets are saying different things. Yeah, slightly confused. There's certainly a message floating around of, nope, not much happened, nothing to see here. Um, there are other uh, reports that uh, Iranian defences shot a few drones out of the sky. I think that's unlikely that drones were involved, to be honest. And there were some reports um, in Iranian state media of explosions around Isfahan. So not a coordinated message coming out of the Iranians at the moment. But just referring back to my previous answer, the one thing we haven't heard from the Iranians yet, and it's still early on, is this kind of um, the, the, this message that there will be revenge, they will carry out a, a revenge attack. That is the sort of language we heard following the April the 1st attacks in Damascus. We haven't yet heard that this time, but who knows? It, as I said, the day is young, we'll wait and see what the Iranians have to say, but I think their language will tell us everything that we need to know about where this is going to go next. Ali, uh, thank you so much uh, for now. Well, let's just remind you of how this attention began and unfolded and show you this timeline. Now, on April the 1st, Israel Israel struck the Iranian consulate in Syria. Seven of its military advisers, including three senior commanders, were killed. And then on Saturday, Iran fired 170 drones, over 30 cruise missiles and 120 ballistic missiles at Israel. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu had vowed to respond. Well, let's bring in our special correspondent, Alex Crawford. And Alex, as we've been saying, I mean, the region hasn't just been tense since Iran launched those attacks on Israel last weekend. This tension has been brewing uh, for the past six months. It's just been ratcheting up. Yeah, I've got to remember that in southern Lebanon, northern Israel, there's been a lot of activity almost every day since October the 7th. But that definitely accelerated, it definitely ratcheted up after the weekend's events with what seemed to be much more intense crossfire between the two sides. Um, there are already nearly 80 villages and towns in southern Lebanon which have had to be evacuated. Tens of thousands of people who've been displaced from that area and lost their homes with, in many cases, no homes to return to. Uh, a lot of fear, a lot of trepidation down that side amongst civilians. We saw, we've seen plenty of that over this week. And multiple funerals, sometimes two or three a day since the weekend, mainly of Hezbollah fighters. And certainly over the, the past week since we've been here, the rhetoric from Hezbollah up until now, up until the overnight events, has been very stoic, very determined. We went to one of the funerals of, of their fighters yesterday, it was surrounded by uh, Hezbollah fighters, Hezbollah loyalists, uh, supporters, uh, the whole town came out, thousands of people, not just many of whom did not know the fighter, but to demonstrate their loyalty and their support for whatever Hezbollah is doing. You've got to remember that 
in Lebanon, Hezbollah is extremely strong. It's embedded in the political, uh, economic and social um, society here in Lebanon. It's got a military wing which is said to be much stronger than the Lebanese army, but works in conjunction with the Lebanese army. And all this week, uh, and certainly this morning, this, they are still underlining that they are strong, they are powerful, and uh, Israel attacks them and Iran at, their, at great cost. But the initial indications, certainly from Hezbollah, with a, a statement from the Deputy Secretary General, Sheikh Naim Qassam, seems very much to be playing it down and un drawing a line under the whole event, saying uh, the Israelis were uh, afraid that they do not have a clear plan. But, and this is the key thing, if they make a mistake in their calculations, we must assume he's talking about future attacks even more, the price will be great. And that's certainly the message that we've been getting from all sections of, of Lebanon society, including the Lebanese authorities, the, the foreign minister telling us very clearly that uh, to escalate even more uh, on the Israeli side would be to drive into a, a, a regional, a big, far more devastating regional war, which would draw in the entire axis of resistance uh, which Iran controls. It has a network of of proxies, Hezbollah being by far the strongest, but also the Houthis in Yemen, militia in Syria, uh, and, and also Hezbollah-trained uh, and Iranian-funded groups in Iraq. And the, the uh, message was very much, you threaten all of those. We know, though, that there have been a lot of um, manipulations behind the scene, diplomatic talks, political talks military talks to try and calm things behind the scenes and those very those Hezbollah experts have been telling us this morning that it looks as though this very uh, precision strike what appears to be a targeted low level strike might be enough to draw a line under it that no red lines appear to have been crossed that this could be an acceptable level of response and if that's the case there'll be a huge sigh of relief not just in Lebanon but across the region. Now, will that stop the ongoing tensions? I still don't think so. Um, we may have just put it to one side for now, but underlying all of this is what's happening in Gaza. It's not going to suddenly lead to an end of the crossfire targeting on the border, for instance, down in, in southern Lebanon. It's not going to, it doesn't appear to be likely to stop the Houthis for continuing to attack international shipping in the Gulf of Aden and the Red Sea, because underlying all of this, they're all saying what, what is needs to be done to put an end to it all finally is a ceasefire in Gaza and some sort of recognition of a Palestinian state. Alex, uh, thank you uh, for all of that analysis and from bringing us up to date there from Lebanon. Let's go straight to the United States now and speak with our U.S. correspondent, James Matthews. And James, we're yet to hear uh, an official statement from the president. As you say, it's the, the middle of the night there. We haven't heard from the Israelis either. Certainly the Iranians are trying to downplay this and U.S. sources are, are saying this is a limited strike. Yeah, limited. That's the word we've had from U.S. officials who are saying very little tonight. And in terms of Biden reaction, Yalda, yes, it is the middle of the night. But uh, the Americans saying nothing would be entirely in keeping with uh, the business of playing it down, certainly in the business of putting a distance between the United States and the act itself. The U.S. officials that we're speaking to are saying, yes, it was limited. The one other thing they are saying is that the United States played no part in this Israeli strike. So uh, it's in the American interest to put distance between themselves and the action that has gone on for fear of dragging the United States into any uh, potential Iranian reaction. What did happen was that the Israelis informed America of the strike before it took place. And to that extent, um, I do wonder if there was uh, an acceptance, if not encouragement from the Americans, having been told the detail of what was going to happen, and I imagine they would have been, then there would have been a tacit 
acknowledgement that it was Israel's business, there was a necessity that Israel felt to launch this strike, and the Americans duly turned a blind eye at least. The Americans wanted to be told, they made that clear to Israel, because they were not uh, before the attack on the Iranian consulate in Damascus. That upset the Americans because they uh, didn't have time to put their defences in order around their personnel and assets in that particular region. So, uh, in terms of the housekeeping and the framework for this attack, uh, it was rather more tidy from an American point of view. The trouble from an American point of view is Israel, Netanyahu. What does he do next? Uh, because, once again, he has demonstrated that he will act with autonomy and in Israel's interests as he see it, as he sees it, not according to the wider interests of Joe Biden. That's one challenge for Joe Biden, but clearly the main challenge right now is Iran and what Iran does next. Biden doesn't want to see an escalation. The strength moving forward in that regard for him is that neither does Iran. It's made that clear. It doesn't want escalation or direct conflict, certainly with the United States. And neither does Israel. It can't afford escalation at a time when it has quite enough on its place uh, tackling Hamas. So many questions moving forward. But the, the key question at the heart of it, of course, is what was this strike? What damage did it inflict? Were there civilian casualties? Did it have the kind of impact that would make Iran feel it necessary to launch uh, a strike in return. Yeah, indeed. As you say, uh, James, the ball is now firmly in Iran's uh, court and we're still learning about exactly what happened. Uh, it was around 4 a.m. Uh, in Iran uh, when we heard that there had been some kind of strike that was launched. Iranian state media was very quick to try and downplay and dismiss this as, as nothing. Uh, but uh, as you say, we'll have to wait and see what the uh, Iranians do and say next. Um, you pointed out there that the uh, Americans from the outset have tried to distance themselves uh, from this situation, although they uh, did uh, impose sanctions on Iran yesterday. But even after that April 1 attack on that diplomatic compound, the Iranians made clear through back channels, didn't they, to the Iranians that, look, we didn't have anything to do with the strike that uh, Israel has, has launched. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, indeed. Um, and that, uh, moving forward for the Americans, um, I, I suppose, needs to be reinforced. The Americans will want to reinforce the message, both to Israel and to Iran, that the situation as it stands doesn't merit uh, retaliation. That was a message that Biden made clear to Netanyahu. He said after the Ar Iranian attack, take the win. Uh, and he said, you know, this demonstrates the power of Israel to defend itself against adversaries. That was a message to Israel itself, but also to Israel's adversaries in the region. And uh, yes, there have been sanctions in the past 24 hours. Uh, we've seen that, uh, um, economic sanctions implemented by the United States against Iran, uh, targeting steel production in Iran and also drone production, the plan according to US officials being to disrupt and to degrade Iranian uh, drone production. That is the sphere into which Joe Biden wants to take this. Economic sanctions, diplomacy. There was a meeting of the G7 uh, after the Iranian strike at the weekend. There was a meeting of the Security Council. Joe Biden wants to steer this away from military conflict. His difficulty is that other actors, central to the Middle East and central to conflict in the Middle East, keep dragging the United States back towards conflict. James, uh, thank you so much uh, for all of that uh, from the United States. Now let's go straight to Alex Rossi, Sky's international correspondent who has more. And um, Alex, uh, as we wait and watch to see what Iran does next, that low-level war between Hezbollah and Israel continues. And no doubt this rivalry between Iran and Israel will continue to be fought in the shadows as it has been for, for, for many, many years. 
Yeah, I mean, this is a, a war, a conflict which has been going on for many, many years, decades between the Iranians and the Israeli, uh, Israelis. As you say, it's been fought in the, the shadows. Uh, Israel, of course, has carried out airstrikes. The most audacious one that we saw was on the consulate on the 1st of April, killing uh, top uh, Iranian generals. But they've also been hitting weapons, transiting through the Shia Crescent from Tehran to paramilitary groups in uh, proxies, it, like Hezbollah, for instance, uh, in Lebanon. They've also been uh, killing scientists as well, nuclear scientists trying to arrest uh, the Iranian nuclear program. But then, of course, it burst uh, into the open and we saw direct confrontation between the two. Now, the language that the Iranians are using is that the consulate was a red line in which the Israelis had overstepped and that had gone too far and you saw a direct attack, attack from Iranian soil onto the Israelis. And now, of course, we have the response from the Israelis. Now, if it is what we think it is, a, a limited strike, I think it's mainly not about uh, causing destruction and damage. It's an expression of force. That's the language that is being used. The Israelis are saying to the Iranians, and this location is central Iran, thousand miles uh, from uh, Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. They are saying, we can penetrate your air defences and we can hit anywhere in your country. It's a shot across the bows in that respect. The question, of course, is will the Iranians uh, retaliate directly? It may very well be that we see, as you, as, you, as you noted, that this goes back to this shadow war. Iran will use what it calls the axis of resistance. These are the proxies that it has around the region. The, the biggest, the largest, the most powerful is on the northern border up here, Hezbollah. But there's also the Houthis in Yemen. There are Hezbollah trained groups in Iraq. There are groups in Syria as well. And it carries on uh, like that. The problem, of course, is that the tensions here remain extraordinarily high. The war against Hamas is continuing. That's a flashpoint. That itself could continue a broader conflict. But what's happening here now on a daily basis is effectively a limited low-level war. Again, this could be the flashpoint leading to a much broader war, even a regional war. Alex, thank you so much uh, for all of that analysis there from northern Israel. Well, as we've been reporting, this is a developing story. We woke up in the early hours of the morning to learn that Israel had launched an attack on Iran. Israel said from the very beginning of this week that it would be responding to Iran's attack on Israel at the weekend. The war cabinet has been meeting virtually every single day and we've been hearing from them very strong language that they had no choice but to respond. So in many ways, the United States, Britain, Western allies knew on some levels that this uh, was coming. We've been hearing uh, also from uh, American officials and sources saying that they had been informed, they weren't surprised by this attack, something that they would uh, feel comfortable with, the fact that they had knowledge that this was uh, coming from our understanding and from what uh, American officials have continued to say for the last few hours, that this strike was limited. But the information is still coming out and we're still waiting to hear how Iranian officials will respond. We haven't heard anything uh, from the Israeli side as yet. We've just heard from uh, American officials, as you heard there from James Matthews, that this is limited and perhaps uh, Americans will try and distance themselves from this and not give an actual official uh, response. Uh, so we'll have to wait and see how this story develops. We are watching all the developments. We'll have all of our correspondents here in Israel and across the region watching. Uh, but uh, Anna, back to you for now in London. Yalda, thanks very much indeed. Uh, well, let's get some reaction from here in the UK. I'm joined now by the Work and Pension Secretary, Mel Stride. A very good morning to good you. Good morning, Anna. Uh, we will talk about some domestic issues in just a moment, but mm. first, of course, I want your reaction to the news of this suspected Israeli mm. strike in Iran overnight. What do you make of it? Well, these are unconfirmed reports. It's an emerging story, and I think that's an important point to make. But, look, the government's position is very clear, and that is that we uh, accept that Israel has an absolute right to defend uh, itself, and, indeed, we were uh, working with Israel and other allies to uh, head off that attack last weekend that uh, Iran made uh, upon uh, Israel. At the same time, though, we do think that de-escalation is absolutely key now. And uh, our message to all in the region, including Israel, is that de-escalation is really important. The Foreign Secretary currently is in Italy, uh, speaking with his G7 counterparts, and they will be very much focused on exactly that. 
Uh, I take it then the UK government was not given any prior warning by Israel of an attack, given what you said? So I, I wouldn't be privy to that one way or the other. So the answer is, uh, I don't know. But uh, I think it's important just to recognise that this is an emerging story and that these are unconfirmed reports as we're uh, speaking at the moment. OK, and, and you talk about the need for de-escalation. Mm. Uh, President Biden, we understand, told Benjamin Netanyahu to take the win yeah. after Israel succeeded in shooting down the vast majority of the projectiles yeah. that were yeah. aimed at its territory by Iran. Uh, the UK, as you've referenced, has also urged restraint. So would you support Israel if it were to be confirmed by Israel in the action that it's chosen to take? So, I, I don't want to get into hypotheticals because, of course, the question you've asked begs many other questions as to what form exactly that uh, um, retaliation may or may indeed may not uh, have taken. But the overarching message is very clear and uh, President Biden's remarks are very much in that vein. We're all very much uh, in the same place on this and that is that de-escalation now is absolutely key and that's why the Foreign Secretary is meeting with other G7 counterparts at the moment uh, to focus on exactly that. Do you expect further action by Israel and would you support further action by Israel or is there a line that you draw for I, your support? I, I, I'm not going to speculate on specific actions that Israel may or may not take. But is there a take. line that you would but, draw? Well, I, the, the, what, what the message is, uh, Anna, is very clear and that is that de-escalation is really important. Well, what we need to focus on now, as indeed we are, uh, is getting humanitarian aid into Gaza. Now, we've made uh, some progress there in getting the areas... Uh, 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 border crossing opened, getting Ashdod as a port open to uh, receiving aid, getting the Israelis to uh, agree to that. But we've got to do that. We've got to focus on uh, ceasefires around getting hostages uh, released. So there's a lot of work to do. But the overarching message on the military front is that de-escalation now is really important. Well, yes, and how concerned are you that Iran will now retaliate? How concerned are you about escalation? Well, we, we, we don't want to see escalation. This is a, a, a very... Um, difficult part of the world in that sense with a lot of tensions, a lot of possible scenarios which, uh, which are not good going forward. Key to avoiding those kind of scenarios, as I say, is across the piece now, de-escalating. It's a message for uh, Iran, it's a message uh, for Israel. De-escalation is really what matters. You talk about a lot of tensions. Just mm. how dangerous a moment do you think this is? Well, th th there is no doubt that since the, the, the Cold War, we live in a more dangerous world. We've got the Ukrainian war, we've got uh, issues around uh, North Korea, we've got the issues in the uh, Middle East. Uh, what our country, with our soft power and our presence in the world, with our allies, I think is very good at, is to doing what we can to diffuse tensions where they are occurring. And so, as I say, in the case of the Middle East and Iran and Israel, uh, we are very firmly engaged in uh, counselling de-escalation and moderation at this particular moment. Well, clearly that is our main story of the day, but yeah. while we've got you here, let's just yeah. turn to domestic matters for a moment because yeah. I know that you want to talk today about what the Prime Minister is announcing, and this is him promising to end our sick-note culture. Yeah. What does that mean and what's yeah. the government going to do about it? So what, what we know, Anna, is that we have a rising instance of mental health-related long-term sickness and people going on to those long-term benefits. We have 2.8 million people on those benefits. In many cases, there is a better outcome than that, and that is that th those people are given treatment, but equally uh, they're held within uh, the workforce or they're introduced to jobs that get work, because we know that people that are in work have better particularly mental health outcomes than, the, the, than those that are out of work. So where the fit note reform comes in is at the moment, if you go to the GP and you say you're feeling a little bit depressed uh, and you are signed off, in 94% of occasions, a box is ticked that says you're not capable of any work whatsoever. What we want to do is change the system so that that individual will be referred to, currently we're setting up something called WorkWell, where they'll get both the healthcare support that they need, but also a work coach will be involved to either help them stay in work if they're in employment or to help get them into work if they're not. Because we think that work matters, and it's a personal mission that I have, is to drive up the levels of employment, particularly amongst those who have those kind of conditions, so that they can benefit 
uh, the communities they live in can benefit, the economy can benefit as well. OK, I'm sure this will prompt a lot of, of discussion through mm. the day. We yeah. are very limited on time, however. I can ask you one more question, and I want to raise the issue of Mark Menzies, mm. uh, the Tory MP who has been uh, suspended from the party after claims that he misused party funds. The Labour Party has now written to Lancashire Police asking them to investigate. They say there's a p clear public interest in this matter being thoroughly investigated. Uh, do they not have a point? Are you referring well, the matter to the police? Well, well this matter is being thoroughly uh, investigated. Not by the police, and, though, is it? Or well, that, 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 that remains to be seen. I mean, the fact that the Labour Party have written to the police is maybe a fact, but that doesn't mean the police are investigating. But let, let's see where that goes. But the important point that I'm making is that we are investigating that. So Conservative uh, HQ is looking now very closely into the circumstances around the various reports that have been made, uh, and uh, the whip has been removed from Mark Menzies in the meantime. OK, well, um, yeah. Mel Stride, we appreciate your time this morning. Thank Thanks you. very much indeed for coming in. Thank, Thank you, you very much. And let's now rejoin Yalda, who's in Jerusalem for us this morning. Yalda. Anna, thank you so much. And you just heard there from uh, the minister, the key there is uh, de-escalation. That's something we've been hearing all week from the US President Joe Biden, uh, from uh, Rishi Sunak and from Lord Cameron. Everybody urging de-escalation. You heard there again uh, this uh, attempt to try and just bring the tempo down, de-escalate the situation. We saw last weekend uh, Iran attack Israel. Israel said all week that it would retaliate, it would respond, and now we've seen that response. Let's just remind you of what's happened this morning. Israel, as we've been reporting, has attacked Iran. Iran State News Agency reported that air defences had been fired and explosions were heard near Isfahan International Airport in central Iran. Early indications suggest a single strike on a carefully selected target. Now, this video is from the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Telegram channel. It reportedly shows the explosions in the sky near Isfahan. Well, the impact of the attack is not yet clear, but it does appear to have been limited, and Iranian media is reporting there has been no damage to nuclear facilities. Israel warned the United States that the strike was coming. More on uh, that breaking news story that Israel has attacked Iran. Let's speak now to Deborah Haynes, our security and defence editor. And Deborah, as I've been reporting, uh, we've heard all week uh, from the various leaders that the situation needs to de-escalate. We just heard there from the minister reiterating that despite Israel now launching that attack on Iran. Yes, and you can imagine here in the UK and the capitals across the world will be holding their breath to see what happens next. The, clearly, the, 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 the hope has been that any response by Israel to what happened over the weekend from Iran would be limited and targeted to an extent that Iran, if it chooses to respond, does so in less uh, a significant way as it did at the weekend. And then both sides could perhaps see some kind of ladder that they could climb down to de-escalate the tensions, but obviously as one source put it to me, it's, it's high-stakes poker, um, this kind of situation, and it could clearly go wrong if either side either reads the sig misreads the signals that they are being sent, feels that the attack that they have just uh, incurred is escalatory and feels that they need to escalate in response, or if there is some kind of mistake when this military action is taking place. Because clearly, whenever a side launches some kind of military uh, attack, then there is the, 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 the chance of things going wrong. And as well, you have obviously allied forces in the region, American, British, other nations, militaries, who I imagine would be on a heightened, well, will have been on a heightened state of alert ever since the weekend. Because of course, it might not be just Iran that decides to strike back, but also its proxies in the region too. So there really is a, a sense of, of, of wait and see. And everyone knew that this would be coming, this moment from Israel in terms of its response. And so um, how Iran retaliates, clearly it's trying to make it seem as if everything's normal and it ha didn't have much of an impact, which hopefully is a sign that maybe they won't feel the need for any es escalatory response. But it really is early days at the moment. 
Uh, and Deborah, we've just uh, had some uh, development uh, that's come through. We're hearing that uh, senior Iranian officials have said that they have no plans for an immediate uh, response. All morning we've heard uh, from Iranian state media downplaying this. Uh, we've heard reports that they have said, and we haven't been able to verify that these were drones, uh, that their air defences struck down. And now we're hearing from uh, Iranian uh, officials saying they have no plans for an immediate response. So as you've been saying and as we've been reporting all morning, despite the, the nature of this and, and as you say, it feels like high stakes poker, there is an attempt now uh, to, to almost uh, settle the bill, settle the score. Iran uh, attacked Israel at the weekend. Um, Israel has now responded and it's a question of just drawing a line now on this. Yeah, that's very significant because that is that an indication that maybe this um, there's obviously been a huge amount of diplomacy going on behind the scenes as well as what's been said publicly about how Israel should be restrained in its response and clearly working on the Iranian side to ensure that any, any fight back is limited. And you'll remember at the beginning, Israel, Iran said that should Israel hit Iran, it would respond in an even greater what degree than what happened over the weekend. So it's very significant that Iran perhaps is signalling that it's withstood this limited strike by Israel and is um, not seeking an immediate retaliation. But we are in a new era now because these key red lines have been crossed. Israel did choose to target an Iranian consulate, uh, the one in Damascus, uh, a, a consular building which is um, a protected uh, building, which really was a, a new red line in terms of the actions that Israel is willing to take against Iran, which clearly poses a, a huge threat to Israel. And then Iran has crossed that red line too by striking directly at Israel. And Israel has in turn crossed another red line by striking back at, um, at Iran. And so with those kind of lines crossed, it does mean that should tensions flare again, it could very quickly escalate into direct confrontation in a, to a much greater degree than perhaps it had been in the past. And, um, Deborah, we're uh, hearing reports as well that uh, Antony Blinken, the US Secretary of State, uh, is going to hold a briefing at the G7 uh, Foreign Ministers Summit. So we will have a US uh, response as well. As we've been reporting, senior Iranian officials have told uh, Reuters uh, that uh, after the reported strike by Israel that there is no plan for immediate retaliation, uh, no clarification as well on who is behind the incident. That's what the Iranian official has said. They've said that there's no clarification on who is behind this incident, but they say there is no plan for immediate retaliation. Um, so as you say, a significant development there. And uh, we are also uh, being told that the US Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, is holding a briefing at the G7 uh, Foreign Ministers Summit. So the United States is going to be responding shortly, I believe, in about uh, uh, a few hours time uh, from now. So as soon as that happens, we will be bringing that to you live. Deborah, for now, thanks so much uh, for all of that analysis. Let me bring in uh, Ali Bunkle now. And Ali, a few things have developed uh, while we've been on, on, on air. Significant. The Iranians are, are, are saying, look, we're not going to respond and, and we don't actually know who it is at this stage. As we've been reporting um, from uh, everything that we've said, uh, Israel, it appears, has launched these, uh, attack, this attack on, on Iran in response to what happened at the weekend. But this is a significant development. Yeah, unless it's a Iranian sleight of hand, uh, a double bluff, it does look as though they're not compelled to uh, react immediately as they had threatened uh, yesterday, that, yesterday that they would do. Um, I was saying earlier on, watch for what Iran's going to say. Uh, the Iranian language will be key to what happens next. I still think we are yet to hear from the, the, the key figures, uh, particularly the supreme leader, who incidentally is 85 today. It is his birthday. Whether or not that had anything to do with uh, Israel's timing, I don't know. But it is the Ayatollah's birthday today. Let's see what we hear later on, if anything, from um, senior Iranian figures. But my sense is, is that if they try and downplay it uh, and cool the situation, uh, then that is pretty indicative of where we're going to go next. Anthony Blinken, I think, will deliver three key lines when he speaks uh, in Italy uh, in a couple of hours' time. Firstly, he'll probably defend Israel's right uh, to protect itself. Secondly, I think he will 
distance America from any of the attacks because if the Iranians wanted to, they could try and implicate America in these attacks and therefore open up justification to attack American military bases in the region. So I think Blinken will try and say, look, we had nothing to do with this. And thirdly, he will call on all sides to chill. Indeed, uh, because as we've been reporting, I mean, while a number of red lines have been crossed, the feeling will be Israel struck that mil uh, embassy compound uh, on April the 1st. Iran responded last weekend. Israel has now responded. Iran has said, we're not quite sure who it is. We're not going to respond immediately. So there is no doubt behind the scenes diplomats frantically working to really just de-escalate this entire situation. Yeah, and I think Iran has, uh, again, three options. Um, one is to go big and to sort of hit back in a similar manner that they did on, on Saturday night. Uh, I think it, uh, that would not be, um, even in Iran's position, that would just not be the right response to what Israel's just carried out. So I don't think they're going to go down that route. The second is some sort of more limited retaliation, perhaps not even on Israeli territory at all. Um, I still think that is very much a possibility, um, if not immediately, but at some point, and that's, that, that would, that's why I sort of brought the Americans potentially into play, because that's the sort of things the Iranians can do. And then thirdly is the sort of do nothing downplay it to your domestic audience, perhaps try and claim credit for shooting down some drones, phantom drones probably, but try and sort of say, look, you know, we, we kept our skies um, uh, clear of any enemy threat, uh, try and downplay it and everybody moves on. And that could be the territory we're in. Yeah, indeed. Ali, thank you so much. And as we've been saying, uh, senior Iranian officials have told Reuters uh, that after those uh, strikes in the last few hours, uh, which are being reported um, and that we've said uh, Israel has launched, um, Iranian officials have said they have no plans uh, for an immediate retaliation. We're also expecting in the next few hours to hear from the US Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, who'll be uh, holding a briefing at the G7 Foreign Minister's uh, Summit, uh, that's in about three hours' time. So we will have uh, a reaction and response from the uh, United States to the developments of the last few hours. Let's bring in uh, Melanie Garson now, Associate Professor of International Security and Conflict Resolution from the University College London. Thank you very much, uh, Melanie, for joining us here uh, on the programme. It's been a tense morning. Uh, we've heard now from Iranian officials and they say they have no plans for immediate retaliation. Uh, state media in Iran has also tried to downplay this entire thing, saying they're just some drones that their air defences kicked in and, and struck those down. Um, so there really is an attempt now uh, to downplay this entire thing. US officials have also described these strikes as limited. Um, absolutely. Um, I think um, it is indeed it's unfolding, but as you say, uh, there is um, this de-escalatory uh, talk coming from Iran. Um, it's not clear with rumors coming out of where this attack was actually launched from. There's a discussion, there's rumor that this was actually launched from actually inside Iran, whether these were some sort of um, glide bombs or drones that actually coming from inside Iran, which makes it slightly more difficult, but they're not, which is why we're hearing this determination that it might not, you know, that they're not reacting, they don't know who it is, so to speak. So it looks like for the moment that it has that the intention to show deterrent force hitting a military installation, no uh, sort of action that could be escalatory, such as loss of life on uh, a large scale. It was discriminate and proportionate, and it would likely not lead to anything immediate from the Iranian side. Yeah, and Melanie, while there is a, a real attempt to de-escalate this situation, I mean, a number of red lines have been crossed in the last few weeks. This really is a, a sort of new phase in this uh, rivalry and, and conflict between Iran and, and Israel. It is a new phase, but it's certainly reflective of the wider hand that Iran is operating across the Middle East as a whole and had to be acted upon. There is no 
country on earth that would support having 300 missiles being launched at its country in an indiscriminate and disproportionate manner. Um, a response of some sort uh, would have to be required, particularly because of regional dynamics. It's um, the nature of the response having done that in discussion this week. We've seen there's been widespread discussions with both the US, with the UK, with the EU. That's the difference between working with allies and operating as proxy, Israel had reserved its right to act and did so likely further to those discussions in a proportionate and limited way that could demonstrate their operational capability to try and restore some deterrent effects, certainly to the skies from that distance. Yeah, and Melanie, while, um, you know, the Israeli officials I've been speaking to here say they're still trying to wrap their head around what happened last weekend, that it was a significant shift and milestone, the fact that 300 missiles and drones were launched on, on Israel, um, and the fact that the Allies had to come together to, to deal with it and, and assist Israel. For the Iranians, a line was crossed on April the 1st when that compound, that diplomatic compound, was targeted and a senior commander was killed. Um, well, the discussion on the nature of that compound is still, you know, it's still a subject of dispute. That It's still argued that actually that part of the compound was actually a military installation. There were military conversations going on between the IRGC leadership, between the military wing, between leaders of Hezbollah and other factions that it was actually a military installation that was attacked. It was military figures that were attacked and it was not the nature of, it wasn't consular officials and it wasn't the actual uh, consulate itself. So, um, and this was, you know, a meeting of, you know, IRGC military inside Syria as a whole in a different country where these activities on military installations are still taking place. So uh, whilst it's being interpreted as a line cross, it would still be subjective of whether this was a military or civilian target under that kind of protection that consular protections would usually afford. Dr. Melanie Garson, thank you very much uh, for joining us. Thank you. Let's uh, bring in our special correspondent, Alex Crawford. And Alex, uh, just in the last few minutes, we've uh, been reporting that a senior Iranian uh, official has told the Reuters news agency um, that there is no plan for immediate retaliation. You and I have been speaking in the last couple of hours. And uh, really, as you say, there is a desperate attempt behind the scenes to really try and de-escalate this situation uh, as much as possible because there is jeopardy here. There's a huge amount of jeopardy because it not only involves Iran, but certainly all its, its uh, axis of resistance, of which it is the pivotal one, the, the, the maestro behind the scenes and, and in front, the front face of it. And that axis of resistance, the strongest of Iran's proxies is here in Lebanon as Hezbollah, a, a very potent, powerful, immensely strong uh, military group, uh, militia, which has a, a military wing said to be more powerful than the Lebanese army, as well as uh, being embedded in the politics in Lebanon. It is part of the government. Uh, so to take on uh, Iran would mean bringing in all of these, not just Hezbollah, but the Houthis in Yemen, the militia group in Syria, the Hezbollah-linked and Iranian-linked groups in Iran, the whole of the region, according to anyone who knows anything about this region, would be set on fire if there was a, a large-scale attack from Israel. This, from all accounts, does not appear to be that. And it may just be enough to avert an immediate all-out war. Has it gone away, though? I think not. Uh, the, the ingredients are still all there for a flare-up almost at any time. And in southern Lebanon right now, Many parts of, of Lebanon feel very much that they are already engaged in, in war with regular daily attacks uh, crisscrossing across the border with Israel. They've come under uh, a, a huge amount of, of attacks from Israeli drones, Israeli jets, uh, bombs, artillery uh, along that border with nearly 80 towns and villages having to be evacuated and tens of thousands of people displaced and who've lost their homes who have moved up to other parts of 
the country in Lebanon. So the ingredients still exist. Uh, they feel that uh, Hezbollah also feels that they are in a position to strike back and will always strike alongside Iran. And the, the basic ground of this, the foundation of all of this discontent and this violence is what's happening in Gaza. And their demands for a ceasefire are not likely to stop. In fact, they're likely to increase from now on. Alex, uh, thank you so much uh, for all that, of that update there from Beirut. Well, joining me now is Nigar uh, Murtavi, uh, editor and host of the Iran podcast and senior fellow at the Center for International Policy. Thank you uh, so much uh, for joining us here on the program. As we've been uh, reporting, senior Iranian officials have said that they have no plans uh, for an immediate retaliation. There is an attempt to downplay this, but as our special correspondent Alex Crawford was just saying there, that doesn't take away uh, the, the issues, the underlying issues and concerns that remain that could cause uh, this to, to flare up at any other point. That's correct. I agree with your correspondent. First of all, I think it's important to note that Iran and Israel have been engaged in a so-called shadow war for years. This is way before October 7th. But the attack on the Iranian consulate in Syria a few weeks ago by Israel was seen as Iran by crossing a red line in the parameters of that shadow war. And so the Iranian retaliation came from the Iranian side thinking they're going to establish deterrence and reestablish sort of the red lines in this shadow war. In the past few months, what we've seen is the moving of the red lines for both sides. And this is yet again another episode with Israel retaliating, trying to establish the terrorists, trying to reestablish its red lines, but at the same time gambling or sort of risking, again, retaliation or more escalation from the other side. So again, now the ball is in Iran's court. We have to wait and see how the Iranians will actually respond. Uh, but I, I still do see this as an escalation and a dangerous situation for this war to expand even further than it has. Yeah, I mean, Nagar, uh, all morning, Iranian state media has been uh, downplaying this. As I said, we've just heard from an uh, Iranian uh, official who's told Reuters uh, that we have no plans to immediately uh, respond, and they say they have no confirmation exactly where this came from and, and who did it. But the fact remains that I've been speaking to Israeli officials here who say that actually there was a strategic blunder. First, the security failings of October the 7th on Israel's part. And then on April the 1st, perhaps they misjudged or misunderstood um, Iran that Iran would escalate the situation further after that diplomatic compound in Damascus was, was struck. Exactly, Yada. I agree. Again, going back to my point, the red lines have been blurred, have been moving in the past few months. And I think what each side is doing is sort of testing the waters, testing the other side in, in a calculated way, but escalating in a way to see how far they can go, both the Iranian side, their allies and the so-called axis of resistance, and also on the other side, the Israeli side. I think the U.S. has been a little more careful in telling Israel they will not participate in retaliation, in trying to do back-channel talks between Iran, between Israel, getting warnings from the Iranian side when they attack, giving warnings to Iran when the Israelis were trying to attack. So there's a lot of uh, back channel uh, diplomacy and also back and forth happening to try to minimize the damage of these retaliatory attacks. But at the same time, both sides, Iranians and Israelis, are also doing this to save face for a more radical or more hardline constituency in each of their own countries. Yeah, and, and certainly um, the Americans and the Iranians through back channels have made it clear to each other that they are not interested in any kind of confrontation between the United States and Iran over this. So there's been all sorts of, um, uh, you know, diplomatic back channel activity there as well. Certainly. I, I believe the U.S., especially the Biden administration, has no interest in an open war and an all war with Iran. They've indi indicated that publicly. They've indicated it privately to the Iranians. Iran also is not interested in an open war with the U.S. for obvious reasons, because there's no way they can win such a war. But any escalation, even limited by both sides, this is now the Israelis and the Iranians, 
can get out of hand. It's a volatile region. It's a volatile situation. And what we've seen since October 7th has only been escalations, in my view. This war has only expanded, as your correspondent was also saying, now in multiple fronts and multiple theaters in various countries with different actors. And it's just pulling more and more in and with, with more destruction and casualty on the civilians across the region. Okay, Nagar Murtazavi, thank you so much for joining us here on the programme. Thanks for having You're me. looking at uh, live pictures of uh, Lord David Cameron, uh, who is at the G7 Foreign Ministers Summit. In about three hours' time, we're also expecting the US Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, to hold a briefing. Lord Cameron was in Israel uh, earlier this week, really uh, calling on Israel to de-escalate the situation. At one point, he said, it looks like Israel will respond, uh, but if you do do it, use your head and heart when you do it and ensure that this doesn't become a regional crisis and conflict. Let's bring in uh, Ali Bunkel. And Ali, we're looking at those images of Lord Cameron, and, and you were there at that press briefing when Lord Cameron was here early in the week. You spoke to him. He urged uh, de-escalation. De he spoke to uh, the Israelis about ensuring that this doesn't become a, a regional crisis and war. Yeah, and he wasn't the only one. The German foreign minister was here on the same day, and we know very well what President Biden, uh, Secretary of State Blinken, were saying to the Israeli government as well. The same message. It was a coordinated message from all the allies. Their language did shift over the last couple of days from don't do it to a OK, we accept you're going to do something, just let's make sure that that something isn't too big. And it would look, at this stage, as though that message has been received and acted upon. Now, we might never know uh, why Benjamin Netanyahu decided on this course of action rather than anything more severe, or not doing anything at all for that matter. It could be that he did decide to listen to the US president and others, or it could be that he's decided that Israel has got more than enough on its plate in Gaza, on the northern border with Hezbollah, and they want to send a message to Iran and leave it there. Yeah, exactly that, uh, Ali. Well, we are, of course, watching all of the developments, and you're looking at live pictures of David Cameron in Capri. He's at the G7 Foreign Ministers Summit, and in about um, just under three hours' time, we're expecting to hear from the US Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, who says he'll be holding a briefing at that G7 Foreign Ministers Summit to respond, uh, we believe, to the developments of the last few hours. We've also heard from senior Iranian officials who have told Reuters that there is no plan for immediate retaliation. We are following all the developments here from Israel, so do stay with us on Sky News. Formula One has 500 million fans, and Salesforce helps them turn all that data into a single view of each one, like Grace. Grace is a super fan with a lot of favorites. Formula One can track all that data in real time to give her the perfect fan moment at the perfect time. There you go. Which makes Grace feel... Wow.
Good morning from Jerusalem, where people are waking up to the news that Israel has attacked Iran. Iran state news agency reports that air defenses had been fired and explosions were heard near Isfahan International Airport. The impact of the attack is not yet clear, but it does appear to have been limited and Iran says they have no plans for immediate retaliation. The Foreign Secretary David Cameron is at the G7 summit in Italy where we expect to hear more from the US later this morning. And here in the UK, the government is calling for de-escalation. We do think that de-escalation is absolutely key now. And our message to all in the region, including Israel, is that de-escalation is really important. We'll have more reaction from Labour in the next few minutes. Good morning from Jerusalem. We are waking up to the news that Israel has attacked Iran. Early indications suggest a single strike on a carefully selected target. It's a significant moment. Alex Rossi is in northern Israel. Our special correspondent, Alex Crawford, is in Beirut for us. Iranian state media is reporting that air defences were fired close to Isfahan International Airport in central Iran at around 4 a.m. local time in Iran. They say the drones were intercepted and there were no explosions on the ground. We haven't been able to verify those claims, but Iran says they have no plans for immediate retaliation. Well, this video is from the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Telegram channel. It reportedly shows the explosions in the sky the Isfahan. The UN's nuclear watchdog have confirmed that there is no damage to Iran's nuclear sites. Iran has several nuclear facilities spread across the country. The main ones are the Bonab Atomic Research Center in the north, the Boucher nuclear reactor, the Natanz nuclear enrichment plant, and the Isfahan nuclear fuel. Uh, research and uh, production center. This is Iran's largest nuclear research uh, center. Now, let's uh, bring in our Ali Bankul, who's been watching developments all morning. Significant that uh, Isfahan was hit. However, um, state media is downplaying the whole thing. Iranian officials in the last hour or so have said we have no plans to do anything about this. And we've been hearing some um, officials saying, look, it's time to now de-escalate this, which is the messaging we've heard all week. Yeah, so what do we know about the attack? The, in the hours afterwards, there was lots of reports of explosions in Syria and Iraq and elsewhere in Iran. As things stand at the moment, none of that has been substantiated and we've not seen any evidence of further attacks elsewhere. So we'll see whether anything comes out of the coming hours um, to, to explain that. So at the moment, it looks like this sort of single attack on this one location in Isfahan, which is an air base that has connections to Iran's aviation production industry. And I would expect that there is a link between that and perhaps the drones that were flown towards Israel on Saturday night. So Israel is saying, we know where some of these drones were manufactured and we're hitting that. Uh, that base. I think the proximity of one of the nuclear facilities in Isfahan is also significant in that it's Iran, uh, sorry, Israel saying you know, we can reach it if we want to reach it. We could go there in the future if we were pushed to go there. And the fact that Israel has managed to successfully get these missiles into its Iranian airspace and hit the target again is Israel taking one up and chip against Iran because Iran pretty much failed to do that on Saturday night when it fired 300 projectiles at Israel. Yeah, indeed, exactly. I mean, I, I'm going to just read you uh, Israeli hard right minister Ben Gavir's um, tweet. In one word, he wrote feeble. Now, uh, the reason, we, you know, we should put this into context is the kind of pressure from uh, within that, that um, Benjamin Netanyahu has been feeling. The Netanyahu have been receiving all sorts of advice, some of it I'm sure helpful, others not. Ben Gavir and his uh, tweet there I think speaks to the more extreme end of things. 
Yeah, um, Ali, we're just looking at live pictures there of the G7 foreign ministers meeting. We saw Lord Cameron there. We saw US Secretary of State Antony Blinken. Uh, we understand in the next um, couple of hours, Antony Blinken, the US Secretary of State, is going to be holding a briefing. Uh, we understand uh, to respond to the events of the last um, couple of hours and uh, Israel launching that attack <laughs> on Iran in response to what happened here at the weekend. Let's just have a little listen in to see if uh, we can hear anything. Good morning, everybody. I think we need to change our agenda this morning. First of all, it's important to talk the situation in the Middle East at the time after this debate. The idea is to get only one point in the Pacific and the connection of the one debate after the debate on the situation in Iran as well as the news coming from Italy. Okay, we're just uh, hearing there the Italian Foreign Minister speaking and we will be uh, hearing from the US Secretary of State Antony Blinken uh, who is at that G7 Foreign Minister's meeting. We saw there Lord Cameron as well. Ali, Lord Cameron was here early in the, in the week, um, really advising, counselling Israel, calling for restraint, saying see what happened at the weekend as a success. Rishi Sunak was also on, on message with that, as was um, Joe Biden, who said take this as a win, see it as a success. The allies came together. I mean, we've both of us have been speaking to Israelis who have said this was the first time that the Americans, the Brits, the, the French fought alongside the Israelis to, to protect Israel as well as some Arab states. Yeah, yeah, it, it was extraordinary. And, and, it, and I think that's what was trying to be impressed upon Israel is um, don't take any of this support for granted. It happened in a, it happened in a rather informal and, to be honest, quite organic way. That on now, Israel had planned with um, the UK, the US, and France how it would respond to an Iranian attack. That is why the British forward positioned more fighter jets in Cyprus. The head of the US CENTCOM was here, for example. But the fact that then, almost sort of spontaneously, there was this support from some of the Arab countries, like Jordan across the border, uh, there was support from the uh, Gulf states, Saudi Arabia too. The message from Israel's Western allies is, you know, there is something here that you can build upon, that don't take any action against Iran that is going to jeopardise, you know, this, this, this new fledgling relationship, this, this military relationship that you might be able to have. We're not talking about something being a sort of a Middle Eastern version of NATO, but you know, Israel does want to try and create a sort of a missile defense system, which would be a sea cooperation between them, Gulf allies against Iran. And we saw that play out. And so I think that again would have fed into Benjamin Netanyahu's thinking. I was saying that, you know, Ben Gavir's tweet, feeble. Ben Gavir would have been on the extreme end of of it, saying, hit Iran hard. We've then had Biden, Cameron, Sunak, etc., on the other end saying, you know, chill. And I think Netanyahu sort of found some middle ground that I suspect the Americans and the Brits will be satisfied with as long as it doesn't go any further. I think most of the Middle East will frankly live with it. Uh, and if, if the prospect of war goes away, they'll be happy. And you know what? But um, Netanyahu will be thinking, Ben Gavir can lump it. Well, Ali, uh, we will, of course, be watching all of the developments. And if there is some kind of official response uh, from the Israelis, thank you for now. Now, as we've been reporting, what happened overnight is really framed by two recent events. Let's just talk those through with you. On April the 1st, Israel struck the Iranian consulate in Syria. Seven of its military advisers, including three senior commanders, were killed. And then, of course, what we saw last Saturday night. Iran fired 170 drones, over 30 cruise missiles and 120 ballistic missiles at Israel. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu had vowed to respond. Let's bring in our special correspondent, Alex Crawford. And Alex, I know that I've said that what's happened in the last few hours, what happened last weekend, was really framed by what happened on April the 1st. But, but frankly, you could take this all the way back 
six months to October the 7th, and then, of course, the war in Gaza, and, and uh, you know, Iran's proxies operating in the region, and that low-level war we've also seen uh, between Hezbollah and, and Israel. And, of course, uh, Yalda, the, the strongest of Iran's proxies by far is Hezbollah. It is extremely potent military force. It's got uh, around about, they say, 100 to 150,000 fighters, maybe more. It's spent uh, nearly a decade building up its weaponry, uh, and it certainly feels extremely confident that it could take on or deflect any large-scale uh, attempt to attack them. But there have been daily skirmishes, daily cross-firing between Israel and uh, Lebanon on that southern border of Lebanon. And that has increased. It's increased in intensity. It's increased in depth into the, into the, the region, into Lebanon. It's also, as we saw just a few days ago when I was talking to you from the same spot, that four Israeli soldiers actually made their way into uh, Lebanon and were blown up by an Hezbollah-planted exploded device with, with a number of them injured. That was the first admission by both sides that the IDF, the Israeli military, were inside Lebanon and apparently on military maneuvers. So there has been a gradual escalation. And since Saturday, since the Iranian drone and missile attack, the uh, activity on the southern border of Lebanon has increased uh, to quite an extent with uh, almost uh, twice daily funerals indicating the number of casualties amongst the Hezbollah fighters uh, and the, the cross-firing has just increased and increased. Now, the indications tonight, overnight, are that Hezbollah appears to be, if they're a reflection of what the Iranian administration uh, approaches, they appear to be drawing a line under this, with the first statement from Hezbollah this morning saying, denouncing it and dismissing it almost, use, using it as almost a, dis, with disdain. The Israelis, they say, are afraid. They do not have a clear plan, but they go on to warn if they make a mistake in their calculations, if they go further, if they hit harder, the price will be great. That's from the Deputy Secretary General of Hezbollah here in Lebanon. So if we take that as an indication and talking to a number of Hezbollah analysts, uh, Hezbollah politicians, uh, all the uh, replies, all the messages from them seem to be that maybe just this time the red line has not been crossed. Will that be over? I think it's really unlikely it will be over. And to underestimate the potential for another massive flare out and the spread throughout the region. We were in Yemen just a couple of weeks ago with the Houthis absolutely denouncing what was going on and saying they were going to hit harder and faster and they wanted to see not just a ceasefire but a, a, a Palestinian state. That's again been re-echoed here in uh, Lebanon, in Iraq uh, a few weeks ago earlier on. We had the Iraqi president saying there needed to be a ceasefire, there needs to be some sort of solution to all of this to stop the ongoing escalation. So even if there is an avoidance of a massive flare-out and all-out war right now, the ingredients and the foundations for that sparking up, again, very quickly, still exist, with Hezbollah presenting one of the strongest <laughs> advocates of Iran and the most potent military force. Who, they, they believe that they are the third, at the moment, slightly forgotten front uh, and underlying all of this as a determination to defend not just Palestine, but also inextricably always aligned and loyalty first to Iran. OK, Alex, uh, thank you, as always, for all of your analysis there. Let's bring in my colleague Alex Rossi, Sky's international correspondent, who joins us uh, live from northern Israel. And, Alex, in the last few hours, um, Iranian uh, officials have told the Reuters news agency that they have no plans to immediately respond uh, to this attack. But as Alex Crawford was saying there in Beirut, that doesn't change the dynamics, the tensions that already exist, the low-level war uh, with Hezbollah. I mean, Israel is dealing with a number of fronts here. Yeah, that's right. There are crises on multiple fronts. The fact that the Iranians are saying that they won't uh, retaliate to this does suggest that in terms of the direct con confrontation 
uh, between Israel and Iran. There may be a chance to de-escalate. Remember, the attack on Saturday by the Iranians was the first time that Iran has fired directly at Israel. But all of the other pieces around the region uh, remain, and that means that things remain extraordinarily tense. I was speaking to um, uh, a former IDF commander yesterday who was saying that you know, he, he, he could not remember a situation in the Middle East like this for decades. In fact, you have to go back four decades, probably to the Yom Kippur War of 1973, to find a similarly uh, dangerous position. Now, what the Israelis have done with this strike, and remember, it's not, it's not just brute military force. Military power has its own language. And in this, uh, on this point, the strike in central Iran is basically symbolic. It's sending a message that the Israelis can penetrate Iranian air defences. They can get through. They can do so at their choosing. They chose, it seems, if this is a limited strike, not to go out for all-out destruction. But it sends a very, very clear signal. In the same way that the Iranians sent a very clear signal on Saturday, the war that had been fought between Israel and Iran previously is referred here as a shadow war. It's hidden. It's um, fought through proxies. It's fought without um, admitting that you were behind it, whether it's an Israeli uh, assassination of a nuclear scientist or whether it was the attack on the consulate. The Israelis haven't admitted that they were behind that. It happened on April the 1st. But what the Iranians were doing with the counter-attack on Saturday is sending a message that you can't do this anymore. We're with, we are redrawing the red lines. And the problem is, is that those red lines aren't really set out at the moment. October the 7th changed the dynamic of many of the red lines, whether it's proxies, whether it's the direct confrontation between Iran and Israel. And as they are being redrawn, the possibility of miscalculation or accident becomes that much bigger. And the problem is that that could lead to a broader regional war. That is why the, 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 the time that we are in at the moment is so very dangerous. Alex, thank you, uh, as always, and uh, for now we will be going back to you a little later in the program. And as we've been saying, we're expecting the U.S. Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, to hold a briefing at the G7 foreign ministers' meeting, so we will be following that closely as well. For now, back to you in London, Anna. Yalda, thanks very much indeed. Well, uh, staying with Israel's attack on Iran, the Work and Pension Secretary Mel Stride told this programme this morning that both sides need to step away from any further attacks. We do think that de-escalation is absolutely key now. And our message to all in the region, including Israel, is that de-escalation is really important. The Foreign Secretary currently is in Italy uh, speaking with his G7 counterparts. And they will be very much focused on exactly that. Well, we're going to get reaction from Labour in just a moment. But first, uh, Gurpreet is here uh, with me. And Gurpreet, the government there, very keen to push for de-escalation this morning. Yeah, de-escalation is the word that you're going to hear repeatedly. Mel Stride saying just there that de-escalation is really important, but also trying to kind of toe this line um, by kind of still showing broad support for Israel, not um, urging them one way or another too stridently. Um, David Cameron, Foreign Secretary, he's at the G7. Uh, also, Anthony Blinken, as you heard just there, who we're expecting to hear from shortly. The Prime Minister, uh, he's giving a speech at 9.30 in the morning. That's going to be on welfare. We've had an announcement um, from the government about a set of welfare reforms that they're planning. But he may be asked on this issue uh, of what's going on in uh, Iran and Israel. So we can expect to hear more from him. But very much, as I said, from the government, the language is all about de-escalation. It's something that we've heard kind of in recent days, um, starting at the weekend. Uh, Israel has come under pressure from, from the UK, but also the US and other European countries uh, to kind of show restraint. We heard the Americans saying that they should take the win. But David Cameron, he was in Israel uh, speaking to Netanyahu on Wednesday. After that meeting, Netanyahu said uh, that Israel will take its own uh, decisions by itself. So questions about kind of how much influence Britain really has uh, when it comes to putting any pressure on Israel whatsoever. OK, Gurpreet Nawan, our political correspondent, thanks very much indeed for that analysis. So, let's uh, get Labour's view then on this morning's developments. As you can see, I'm now joined by the Shadow Housing Minister, Matthew Pennycook. Uh, good to see you. Thanks Morning. very much indeed for coming in. Uh, what is your reaction to the news of this apparent Israeli strike on Iran overnight? 
I think it's a really concerning moment for peace and security in the Middle East. This is obviously a breaking story. My understanding is the precise details of the strike that's taken place haven't been confirmed by the US, Iran or Israel, but Labour would urge all sides to show restraint and to de-escalate the situation because the real risk of a full-scale war in the region is there and all sides need to step back. Following on from Iran's attack on Israel last week, though, does Labour support Israel's right to take retaliatory action in Iran? Well, we're asking Israel to show restraint in doing so. Um, the repelling of the very significant drone and missile strike was successful. We want them to show restraint to de-escalate the situation because, as I said, the risk of a full-scale conflagration in the region is very real and the consequences will be dire. So is there a limit to Labour's support for Israel? I don't think there's a limit to its, our support in terms of their right to respond, but what we are urging, along with all of our international partners, is restraint on Israel's part because we don't want to see further escalation and the risk of a full-scale regional war, which the consequences of which would be absolutely devastating uh, to the region. So we're asking, as I said, all sides to pull back. How concerned are you about escalation? Do you expect Iran to retaliate? I think that we can't speculate on how Iran might retaliate. What the precise nature of these strikes is, as I said, uh, on the basis of my understanding, is unconfirmed. But I think it is a very worrying moment for the Middle East and the risk of escalation into a wider regional war is very real. That is why it is so important, I say, that both Israel and Iran pull back and de-escalate and show restraint. OK, uh, this is a story that obviously we'll be covering um, all morning here on Sky News. But while I've got you here, I do want to talk about a couple of domestic issues as well, because uh, the Prime Minister is going to make a big speech later on today. He's vowing to clamp down on what he calls uh, Britain's sick note culture. Uh, he's warning against over medicalising the everyday challenges and worries of life. Uh, does he have a point? Do, do you support an end to sick note culture in this country? Well, I think this announcement screams to me a government that, after 14 years, are out of ideas and out of time. This proposal, as I understand it, is a consultation on tweaks to the Fitnote system. It's actually a proposal that was first mooted by the Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, back when he was Health Secretary in 2017. And in the years since, we have seen the number of people uh, transition onto long-term sick at great cost to themselves, to businesses, to the economy and to the taxpayer in terms of the spiralling benefit bill skyrocket. So economic activity is at its highest rate for decades. We're still the only G7 country that hasn't returned to economic activity rates pre-pandemic. This is costing the country. Something's got to be done. I don't think tinkering with a call for evidence on the fitnote system is anywhere near the scale of the challenge. So Labour have a solution to tackle the fundamental causes of this crisis, which are staggeringly long NHS waiting lists, a social security system that needs reform, making work pay, supporting people into good long-term jobs. Well, yes, and, and you have vowed to uh, bring the sickness benefits bill down yourself, haven't you? You've said there'd be no option of a life on benefits under Labour, but just saying you're going to get waiting lists down sounds pretty vague. Some would say you need a more targeted approach. Well, I think waiting lists, as I've just said, is only one part of our plan to tackle economic activity. We've got to bring those waiting lists down. We've got to do more on mental health support. We've also got to reform social security. We've got to make job centres work, provide people with real support, make work pay. This is a long-term problem. This is entirely of the Tories' making. It's a crisis that has developed over many years and it needs a plan, as we have, that tackles the fundamental causes, that doesn't just tweak uh, with elements of the system, like the Fitnote system, which can provide uh, people with more support. And if I was the government, I'd be saying, how can the Fitnote system fully support people back into work? Where is the investment in the health Okay. Uh, and work professionals that need to provide but people what, with that support. what's the fundamental problem that's going on here? Because the number of fit notes has doubled in less than a decade to 11 million a year. It's a huge rise. Why is that happening? Because there has been a long-term rise for many, many years under this government in people who are on long-term sick, either because they can't get the treatment they need through the NHS, which is on its knees after 14 years of Conservative government, or they're not getting the proper support to get back into did, work. Did so, GPs sign people off too easily, do you think? No, I think, I think that the sort of these simplistic sweeping statements aren't just, are just not helpful. We need to look at the root causes of the problem, why we have such staggeringly high economic activity rates under this Conservative government, and look to tackle the fundamentals. This, to me, as I said, is 
a policy paper that's dusted off from 2017 to get a cheap headline, it won't tackle the fundamental causes of the problem as it's developed. OK, I also want to ask you about one other issue, which is um, Mark Menzies, the Tory MP, who's now been suspended from the party after claims which he denies uh, that he misused party funds. Um, I understand that Labour has now written to Lancashire Police. Can you tell us uh, what you've uh, asked them to do? We've asked them to investigate these allegations, and I think it's entirely right that we've done so. Um, the reports that came out about this case are incredibly disturbing, and there are a series of questions about whether an offence has been committed in relation to fraud by false representation or misconduct in public office. They're quite serious allegations. It's right that the police investigate. I think there are also questions about what the Conservative Party knew and when, why they've sat on this information for months. Do they have any information that the police could benefit from? If they do, they obviously need to hand it over. It's in the public interest that we get to the bottom of these allegations and the police investigate. OK, well, as we say, um, Mark Menzies denies uh, all the claims against him. Matthew Pennicott, we appreciate your time this morning. Thanks very much Thank indeed. You. And uh, let's take you back now to Jerusalem and Yalda. Anna... Thank you so much and welcome back to Jerusalem where we're covering that developing story. We woke up in the early hours of the morning uh, to learn that uh, Israel had attacked Iran. Now all week Israeli officials have been saying that they would have to respond to Iran's attack on Israel last weekend, that they had no choice but to launch some kind of attack and retaliate in some way. We saw uh, international leaders, the US president, Rishi Sunak, David Cameron, all urge restraint. And uh, they spoke to uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Uh, they told him to de-escalate the situation, to see last weekend uh, as a win for uh, Israel. But nonetheless, we've seen Israel uh, respond. In the last hour or so, we heard from Iranian officials who have told Reuters news agency that they have no plans to respond. Let's bring in Deborah Haynes now, our security and defence editor. And Deborah, a lot of developments in the last a few hours. We're also earlier looking at live pictures of Lord Cameron and the US Secretary of State Antony Blinken at that G7 foreign ministers meeting. There really now is an attempt to de-escalate the situation. Uh, the international leaders are saying Iran attacked Israel last weekend. Israel has now responded that some kind of line now needs to be drawn to bring an end to this. Not sure if that will happen, but for now, there is an attempt to, to bring down the tempo. Yes, and you, you really got that sense speaking to officials uh, behind the scenes over the last week, as I'm sure you've been doing and I've been doing. Um, and obviously the public comments that people like David Cameron uh, have been saying about the need for, um, for, for being strong and tough, but also smart uh, with Israel's response. Everybody really appreciated that Israel wouldn't be able to do nothing in response to Iran's unprecedented attack on Israel over the weekend, especially the use of ballistic missiles um, in that direct strike against Israel. Uh, and even though most of those munitions were shot out the sky by a coalition of not just the usual allies like um, the US the UK and France helping Israel's military, but also Arab nations as well in this coalition that Israel will be wanting to keep together as it tackles the increasing threat from Iran. It's been a, a, a war that's been taking place in the shadows for so many years with Iran's proxies, uh, with deniable attacks, Israel as well launching deniable attacks on Iran, but those red lines have really been crossed in the last week with Iran choosing to directly attack Israel openly, overtly, admitting that that's what it's done. And now uh, Israel doing the same back, though, like you're saying, clearly the focus is on containment, on trying to take the heat out of this and the hope that the scale, the limited scale as it seems, and, you know, we still are waiting for full details of exactly what has taken place in the last few hours. But if it, if it is as limited as it seems, then the hope will be that Iran won't feel the need, as it said through that Reuters report, to retaliate. It said retaliate immediately, but maybe even um, it could be something that could be slowed down completely. But in this region, as you well know, uh, nothing can be taken for granted and it's still a very high stakes situation. Yeah, I think you described it earlier as high-stakes uh, poker. And, and no doubt, Deborah, um, that 
even though this uh, particular situation, there's an attempt to de-escalate, this rivalry between Iran and, and Israel will go back to the shadows. It will inevitably go back to exactly where it was uh, before the events of last weekend. Absolutely, that's correct. But I do think as well that now you've had this new precedent that's been set. Uh, Israel started it really with that attack that it carried out. It's, it's not admitted it publicly against the, uh, the Iranian consulate in Damascus uh, at the beginning of the month, which killed that, those senior um, IRGC generals and other Iranian officials. And that was something that Iran uh, vowed to retaliate uh, for. And so the region was put on notice at that point when that red line of, of, of targeting a consular building was crossed. And then you had Iran crossing that red line too of directly and overtly attacking Israel. And now it seems Israel has chosen to overtly, although we're yet to hear the details, strike back. So the fact that you've had those lines crossed, you can't rewind the clock now. So yes, while uh, of course the shadow war will continue, the potential for escalation into direct confrontation is much, much greater following the events of the last few weeks. Yeah, as you say, Deborah, it's a significant and still a, a, a dangerous moment. Thanks so much. Now let's just remind you of what's happened this morning. Israel has attacked Iran. Iran State News Agency reported that air defences had been fired around 4 a.m. local time and explosions were heard near Isfahan International Airport in central Iran. Early indications suggest that a single strike on a carefully selected target. The impact of the attack is not yet clear. Iranian media is reporting they intercepted three drones and they have no plans for immediate retaliation. Well, foreign ministers, including the UK's David Cameron, are meeting at the G7 summit in Capri. The UK is urging both Iran and Israel to de-escalate. And uh, you're looking at images that came in earlier uh, where Lord Cameron is at that G7 summit. And we are expecting um, the US Secretary of State, uh, uh, Antony Blinken, to also give a briefing uh, in a couple of hours time now uh, i'm going to bring in uh, ali bunkle and ali a lot of developments uh, we woke up to this news um, there was concern about how much this was going to escalate iranian state media started to play it down iranian officials have said they're not going to do anything about it we haven't yet heard from the israeli side unlikely that we will no, we haven't heard from the Israeli side, you're right, apart from Itamar ben Gavir describing Israel's attack as feeble. Um, Itamar ben Gavir is the national security minister, so in any other um, government structure, the, the person who's effectively the interior minister um, would be listened to. And so I, I think we can pretty much, you know, take that as confirmation from at least one member of the Israeli government that it was Israel behind these strikes, something that the Americans have backed up. But yes, the Israelis tend to have a policy of no comment when it comes to speaking about any strikes they've carried out or um, any action they've carried out inside Iran or in Syria. And it might be that they keep up that, that denial or that no comment. The messaging coming out from Iran at the moment, and what we were moving towards mid-morning, um, the messaging coming out so far is to be rather dismissive of this attack, to suggest that it did no real damage, that it posed no real threat to Iran. And I think what that's all leading to at the moment is an indication that Iran is not inclined to respond. You have to remember that a, a lot, or most of the media inside Iran, uh, is state controlled uh, and so these messages don't get sort of delivered willy-nilly um, they do tend to conform to a line and whilst we haven't heard from Ibrahim Raisi for example the Iranian president we haven't heard from the supreme leader yet uh, or even the Iranian foreign minister who I think is probably still in New York um, let's see what they say if they say anything at all but as I say the, the language so far has, has, has led us to sort of think that this is probably not going to escalate and that is a message that I guess Israel, through this strike, wanted to make. Um, we can do it if we want. Uh, we can do damage if we want. They sent a very clear message and perhaps also saying, we're not going to escalate this, but we can do damage if we want to. 
Iran fired 300 plus drones and missiles at Israel on Saturday night. I mean, that's, that's a barrage, right? And, and most of them got intercepted before they even hit Israeli airspace. Uh, the Israelis estimate that 99% of them were shot down. Um, the ones that did get through caused pretty minimal damage, in fairness, to, to an Israeli airbase. And now Israel has fired back, and all indications are that what they did fire hit its targets, and we don't yet know the extent of the damage. So that is very much one-upmanship for the Israelis. You tried to hit us, and it was pretty much a failure. We tried to hit you, and it was an unqualified success. So, yeah, that is a message. Where they hit is a message. Deep inside Iran, close to a nuclear facility, and it is an we can do this. If we need to do this at any point, if we need to attack your nuclear facilities, if we need to attack central Iran, uh, Tehran, we have the capabilities of doing it, and not just we have the capabilities, you don't seem to have the capability of stopping it. Indeed. Ali, thank you as always. Uh, well, let's bring in our next guest uh, from the Centre for Security Policies, a senior editor for Middle Eastern Affairs, Caroline Glick, who joins me now. Uh, Caroline, thank you very much uh, for joining us on the programme. We were discussing there the messaging that has been sent from both sides. Frankly, we've been hearing that red lines have been crossed, but Israel sent a significant message uh, to Iran. And in many ways, Iran has now tried to de-escalate the situation. I think that what you're seeing with the very conflicting statements that are coming out of Iran is that the Iranians are very scared. And I think that that uh, is, a, is a good thing. Um, I think that uh, on the one hand, they say nothing. On the other hand, they say it was the Mossad. And then on the third hand, they say that they don't know who did it. Um, no damage was caused. Um, we'll just have to wait and see for the after action reports to understand precisely what the targets were and, uh, and how badly they were damaged. But uh, Israel sent a number of messages to a number of different uh, addresses uh, last night or, or in the early morning hours uh, by uh, conducting this operation in Iran. Um, it uh, sent a message to the Israeli people that are jittery because we're facing a major battle uh, both in Lebanon and in Gaza in the uh, days and weeks and months ahead. Uh, we're, in a, we're in the largest war <clears throat> since our War of Independence in 1948-49 right now, and uh, the longest war Israel has fought, uh, and uh, we don't know when it's going to be over. So in terms of stealing the people, it's very um, important for both our Air Force and for our ground forces and for the population here to understand that we are capable of operating in Iran um, and Iraq and Syria, apparently, where our targets were also hit. Uh, at the same time. So that was important. It was important to show the United States that we're capable of uh, carrying out operations uh, in Iran without uh, without causing a, a massive conflagration that uh, can suck in other other powers into the uh, into the war. That was very Caroline, important. Uh, it was important to show the Iranian people that uh, that the regime that they hate so much isn't immune uh, from attack from outside forces. I mean, the point is, though, as well, Caroline, that the Iranians are pragmatists. They aren't suicidal. They know and understand that if they go into a war with Israel, it will drag in potentially Western powers, namely the United States, which is the U.S. is trying to avoid here as well. And they don't have the capacity to, to take that on. Well, you know, they always say that the Iranians will fight to the last Palestinian, to the last Lebanese, to the last Syrian, that they, uh, what what is most important to them is to make other people fight their wars for them. And um, so the Iranian people, meanwhile, back home in Iran are suffering. You have 90% of them who want to oust the regime from power that's been torturing them for the past 45 years. So I think, you know, all of these things are destabilizing for this hated uh, chaos-initiating uh, chaos, uh, regime that's behind uh, just about all of the wars that we've seen in the Middle East uh, over the past 45 years. So I think that that was a very important thing that happened last night, regardless of what was attacked. Even, and we don't really know exactly yeah, what was attacked. Even though things... Yeah, we don't know. We're still waiting to get that information. And we've talked about the kind of message that Israel is trying to send uh, to Iran. And there is now an attempt to de-escalate, but it will go back to, even though this has now entered a different sort of phase, red lines have crossed, the shadow wars will also continue between the two. 
Um, I, look, yes, this is a multidimensional war. And the change that we saw last Saturday night was that the puppet master came for the first time out from behind the curtain and attacked Israel directly with a massive barrage of uh, missiles and drones, as your last guest said. Uh, that was unsuccessful. But on the other hand, uh, it was carried out. And that's a very new thing. And Iran is now uh, operating openly with Hamas, with Hezbollah, with the Houthis in this war that it initiated against Israel on October 7th. Um, Caroline, the Iranians are indicating that this is in response to what happened on April the 1st, uh, where they say a diplomatic compound was hit and that um, one of their senior military commanders was killed as a result. And therefore, we saw that reaction uh, at the weekend. Do you think the Israelis anticipated that kind of reaction where we saw 300 drones and missiles, um, you know, coming uh, in Israel's direction? I think the scale of the Iranian response indicates that it wasn't a reaction to anything, that this was something that was long planned because it wasn't a tit for tat. Israel's engaged in a war against Iran. Iran has been directing everything. And Mohammad Reza Zahedi, the Iranian uh, terror chief who was killed in Damascus and not in a diplomatic allegation, but rather in a building that was a military target connected to the Revolutionary Guard Corps. Um, he was, uh, not only is he... Uh, 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 seen as the architect of the October 7th invasion of Israel and the atrocities that Hamas carried out that day. Uh, he's also in charge of Iran's terror operations in Syria and Lebanon. So he was a military target, not only uh, substantively because of his, his uh, role in October 7th, but also because he was actively engaging in war with Israel. So I think that the idea that this was a tit for tat ignores the fact that we're in a major war already. You don't have a tit for tat uh, in a major war. I mean, this is just you're constantly being attacked and you're constantly attacking across a number of battlefields that are all controlled by Iran through its proxies and now also directly. So so what we're looking at, it was, you know, to say it was a tit for tat ignores the fact that we're already in a war. Caroline Glick um, from the Center for Security Policies and a senior editor for Middle Eastern Affairs, thank you very much for joining us. Let's uh, speak now to my colleague, uh, Trevor Phillips. And, and Trevor, you know, we can see the kind of diplomacy taking place behind the scenes. Uh, we know that Lord Cameron is at the G7 foreign ministers uh, meeting. We know that um, uh, Rishi Sunak has a scheduled uh, speech, so he will um, no doubt uh, address what's happened uh, in the early hours as well. But there is a real attempt now, isn't there, Trevor, to, to de-escalate this situation, to ensure that it doesn't um, spill over and, and turn out, uh, turn into all-out confrontation and a war. Good morning, Yalda. Yeah, you're standing right in the middle of possibly the biggest and the most dangerous chess game in the world right now. We are going to hear from Cameron and also from Rishi Sunak uh, this morning, and I think also from the uh, American Secretary of State, Antony Blinken. And I guess what they're all trying to do is to create uh, an environment in which it is possible for everybody to save face, but to turn down the temperature. The word, uh, as, you, as you've been saying, is uh, de-escalation. Um, but we know that there is a conversation going on here. Um, the Iranians this morning are downplaying the impact of the Israeli strike. They're basically saying, yeah, right, didn't really uh, hit us at all. Uh, and that's presumably the uh, sound of a country trying desperately not to have to retaliate. Um, we know uh, uh, that the uh, Americans knew uh, that there was going to be uh, a strike. We also know that they knew about the Iranian retaliation. So actually what is going on here is a lot of, a lot of noise publicly, but there are clearly a lot of back channels being used here to try to make sure that nobody uh, overreacts. And we can now look back, I guess, on the Israeli action last weekend uh, and see that it was very carefully calibrated to try to make sure that the Iranians didn't have uh, an, a reason to, uh, as it were, I, I won't say go ballistic because that's, you know, that would be tasteless, but to overreact. Um, and I think what, what we're seeing here is obviously geopolitics. But I think interestingly, uh, Yalda, something 
very significant uh, that we sometimes forget is that there's domestic politics involved here. In Israel, of course, it has been talked about uh, Mr Netanyahu as doing what he's doing partly because of the weakness of his... Uh, because of his political uh, uh, weakness. Um, it is also worth saying that Iran, it is an authoritarian regime, but it is an authoritarian regime with a very young population which increasingly is restless. Uh, restless about the, uh, the uh, overwhelming significance of uh, the Ayatollahs uh, and their rule. Uh, restless about its isolation from the world. Restless about the constant danger of conscription if you're a young Iranian man. So the Iranian regime has to deal not just with you know, the, its, its strategy of keep creating chaos in the region, but keeping its own people on side. And of course, for us, uh, we have Ukraine already, we have our own domestic problems, as do the Americans, and everybody wants this to wind down. Uh, indeed. Oh, Trevor, uh, the Israeli hard right minister, Ben Gavir, um, said in a tweet uh, this morning that what we're seeing in the last few hours was feeble. So it just gives you a sense of how um, split and divided um, Israel is on, on the reaction and, and what to do. But in the last few, uh, in the last few minutes, in fact, we've heard from uh, the European, uh, uh, the president of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, uh, who's very much reiterating what we've heard from uh, global leaders. She says it is absolutely, it's an absolute necessity that the region stays stable and all sides refrain from further action. So there is so much diplomacy, as you say, behind the scenes, trying to bring down the tempo, trying to de-escalate this situation. We're also expecting uh, to hear from the US Secretary of State, uh, who's at that G7 foreign ministers uh, summit in Italy, uh, where we uh, are expecting a briefing. And as you say, Lord Cameron, Rishi Sunak, uh, we'll probably hear from them uh, as well. Um, France has responded and also said uh, that there, needs, there is a need uh, to de-escalate. So we are watching all of these developments as the global community tries to uh, really uh, urge both sides to refrain from any further action. And as we've been reporting, uh, Iranian officials have said uh, to the Reuters news agency that they have no plans to respond at this point. And they say they don't have confirmation of exactly who this is. The Israelis, um, up until now, uh, have uh, not commented and are probably unlikely uh, to comment. But they did say throughout the week, their war cabinet, that we will uh, respond in some way. We have no choice but to respond. And they have done that at about 4 a.m. Iran time. Let's bring in our business presenter, Ian King, um, who can give us a sense of how the markets are reacting to what's happened this morning. Ian. Good morning, Aldi. Yes, uh, most of the action, as you'd expect to see, has been in uh, Brent crude. Now, bear in mind, Brent crude has been drifting lower for most of this week because we got some blowout US retail sales figures earlier in the week, and that has really uh, put the mockers on the notion that the Federal Reserve will be cutting interest rates in the US anytime soon. And wide, more widespread concerns about inflation have really been bearing on the Brent uh, price. So Brent crude, just right now, it's trading at just about $88 a barrel. It's up 1% or so. It did pop above $90.75 a barrel. Well, to put that in context, as I say, the crude price has been drifting lower this week. That really takes you back to where it was on uh, Tuesday of this week. Uh, natural gas uh, currently up around half of 1% just now. The equity markets have uh, not reacted too well to this. Uh, when uh, news of, uh, of what happened uh, uh, broke, uh, the Asia-Pacific markets uh, was, were still open. Equities uh, traded to the downside there. Uh, the main market in Sydney fell by 1%. Uh, Shanghai I was off by a third of 1%, Hong Kong by nearly 1%, and the big faller was actually the Nikkei in Tokyo, which came off by 2.5%. Uh, and, and that was partly because you got an uptick in the Japanese yen, which uh, makes uh, the uh, Nikkei slightly less attractive to overseas investors on such occasions. Uh, those are the uh, pictures uh, on the, uh, you can see on the screen right now, those are the uh, uh, Asia Pacific markets uh, uh, moving, uh, as I've just been describing. Here in Europe, well, again, markets have traded to the downside. The uh, CAC Caron 
Bond in France is off uh, two thirds of one percent. The DAX in Germany off by one percent. The MIB in Milan by one point one percent, and uh, the FTSE 100 just now is off by around two thirds of one percent. You've seen a bit of movement into gold. You always get a bit of safe haven buying on such occasions. And the other uh, safe haven that's attracted a bit of money this morning is the Swiss franc. That's uh, currently trading higher on the foreign exchange markets as well. Ian, uh, thank you so much uh, for giving us a sense of how the markets are reacting this morning. Well, uh, let's bring in my next guest, Dr. Mir Javandafar, who's an Iranian-Israeli lecturer at Reichman University in Tel Aviv. Thank you, sir, for joining us here on the program. I just want to get your reaction to the events of the last few hours. We understand that Israel um, has attacked Iran at 4 a.m. Iran time. Uh, State media in Iran has downplayed it, and uh, we are, the Americans say it was limited. But just your reaction to it? Well, this is a culmination of, uh, of a recent uh, reactions by both Iran and Israel to the difficulties that they are facing and the challenges. On the one hand, the Islamic Republic of Iran over the last, since 1991, has been investing billions of dollars in proxies across the region in groups such as Jihad Islami, Hezbollah, and Hamas, for various reasons. One of the major goals was to use these groups as proxies to attack Israel, so that Israel attacks them, not Iran, so that these groups uh, absorb Israeli reaction and are subject to Israeli reaction, military reaction, not Iran. However, over the last number of years, we've seen that according to foreign press reports, Israel has been attacking Iranian officials both inside and outside of Iran. So somehow the Islamic Republic of Iran felt that its proxy model was no longer serving one of its main goals, that despite uh, investing in these groups, the actual war against Israel was reaching Iranian territory, which is why the Islamic Republic, one of the reasons it attacked Israel with 330 missiles and drones on the on the morning of the 14th of April. It was to draw, the, draw a line, draw a big red line uh, around its uh, military officials and military bases. And it said if Israel were to attack against any of these, Iran would respond directly. From no longer, the, the proxy model is no longer valid. We are also going to get involved directly. That in itself put Israel in a bind because the state of Israel has been confronting the Iranian regime. The Iranian regime, uh, unfortunately, does not is not against Israeli policies. It's against Israel's existence. It's the only regime that denies the Holocaust that has been uh, paying various groups to kill Israelis. And no Israeli government, be it Mr. Netanyahu or any other, would allow such a red line. So if the reports today are true, Israel, after five days, crossed Iran's red line. Yeah, um, Dr. Javan Dafer, do you think, though, that even though you're saying this is a culmination and, uh, you know, uh, that Iran could no longer rely just on its proxies, that it felt like uh, the attacks were coming too close to Iranian soil, do you think, though, that Israel miscalculated or it was a strategic blunder when they attacked and targeted that, um, that diplomatic compound on April the 1st, which, which killed a commander of the Quds Force? Uh, I think there were, according to Iranian figures, since October 7th uh, Hamas attack, 17 IRGC officials have been killed in Syria. Uh, and this was the culmination, the attack that we saw on the diplomatic, on the, on the building which was in the diplomatic compound was a, was a, was a culmination. And this was the, the one, uh, if you excuse the expression, the straw that broke the camel's back. Um, there are two schools of thought in Israel. One of them is that Israel should not have attacked um, because this would have been the uh, the uh, reaction. Another school of thought in Israel says that Israel should have attacked despite this reaction, be, despite a possible reaction, because Israel cannot allow these IRGC officials to meet in a secure building in Damascus and to and to plan and carry out operations that help Israel's enemies. Uh, Yalda, I'd like to remind you that October 7th has been a, it's been a hammer blow to, to, to Israel's uh, sense of security, uh, and it, it has been extremely traumatic for Israelis. What I would have said is that if we would have known that this was the Iranian reaction, then perhaps we, uh, we should have um, 
been more careful, but certainly not to stop uh, attacks against Iranian regime officials. Yalda, I'm, I'm from Iran. I was born in Bar Mitzvah think... in Tehran. And, and I have to tell you that this, this war that the Iranian regime is waging against Israel is against the interest of Iranians. But more importantly, Yalda, more importantly, it's based on ideology and emotions more than it is based on logic. And this is what makes this confrontation dangerous. And this is why we could have this. This is why it could have unintended consequences, especially for Iran. Do you think? Do you think, though, something has has shifted within the regime in in Iran? You say it's not based on on logic; it's based on ideology. Do you think something has fundamentally shifted there when it comes to their decision making? Um, I think Ayatollah Khamenei. Um, is uh, suffering from uh, simultaneously from an inferiority and a superiority complex. He's feeling he's he has a superiority complex because for the first time in the post-revolution history of the Islamic Republic of Iran, his country and his regime finds itself in an alliance with superpowers, and those superpowers are China and Russia. This has had a major major boost. On, on, the, on, on his self, uh, and his uh, sense of self-confidence. At the same time, and simultaneously, the Islamic Republic is feeling an inferiority complex because the October 7th attack by Hamas was supposed to be a blow against the state of Israel, was supposed to undermine Israel uh, in an unprecedented manner. But somehow it has turned into a saga that has ended up hurting and killing Iranian regime officials in Syria and elsewhere. And he is feeling that the deterrence of his regime is being undermined in an unprecedented manner abroad and at home. I'd like to remind you, Yalda, that the Iranian, re the Iranian regime is so worried about public reaction to its attack against Israel Absolutely, Dr. Mir uh, Javandar, for, uh, we've actually uh, run out of time, uh, but we're grateful for all of your analysis there. That was an Iranian-Israeli lecturer at Reichman University in Tel Aviv. Well, as we've been reporting in the early hours of this morning, uh, Israel attacked Iran. Um, since then, Iranian officials have said they have no plans uh, to respond in any way. They say they're not sure exactly who it was. So we are seeing a situation where there is de escalation. We are following all the developments here from Jerusalem. Formula One has 500 million fans and Salesforce helps them turn all that data into a single view of each one. Like Grace. Grace is a super fan with a lot of favorites. Formula One can track all that data in real time to give her the perfect fan moment at the perfect time. There you go. Which makes Grace feel Wow.
Good morning, I'm Yalda Hakim, live from Jerusalem, where people are waking up to the news that Israel has attacked Iran. Iran State News Agency reports that air defences were fired and explosions were heard near Isfahan International Airport. The impact of the attack is not yet clear, but it does appear to have been limited, and Iran says they have no plans for immediate retaliation. The Foreign Secretary David Cameron is at the G7 summit in Italy, where we expect to hear more from the US later this morning. And the Prime Minister is due to speak at 9.30 a.m. We'll bring you that live. Good morning and welcome back to Jerusalem. We're waking up to the news that Israel has attacked Iran. Early indications suggest a single strike on a carefully selected target. Iranian state media is reporting that air defences were fired close to Isfahan International Airport in central Iran at around 4 a.m. local time in Iran. They say that drones were intercepted and there were no explosions on the ground. We haven't been able to verify those claims, but Iran is downplaying the attack and say they have no plans for immediate retaliation. Well, this video is from the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps a Telegram channel. It reportedly shows the explosions in the sky near Isfahan. The UN's nuclear watchdog have confirmed that there is no damage to Iran's nuclear sites. Well, let's bring in our Ali Bunkel, who's with me live. And Ali, we've been following all of these developments all week. The War Cabinet has said they have to respond. They had no choice but to respond. We saw that response um, in the early hours of uh, the morning. It seems now everyone's trying to de-escalate. Yeah, it seems that way. Um, the, the, the reaction to it is almost entirely coming out of Iran. And as you say, it's a, a mix between downplaying what happened on one hand to mocking it on the other hand. There's a lot of social media posts in Iran. There's one of a girl with a paper plane sort of throwing it feebly into a wall, which is sort of mocking uh, Israel's attempts to attack Iran. I think what all that points to and suggests is that Iran is not um, on the brink of retaliation. Um, and perhaps is looking at this as, a, a, as an off-ramp. The other area of reaction is from here in Israel. And with the exception of the right-wing National Security Minister, Itamar ben Gavir, uh, who would have wanted something far bigger, he's described it as being feeble. But we've heard nothing from the War Cabinet. Maybe we will. But maybe actually they will also choose not to we've crow and We've actually heard from Netanyahu since, well, not even about last weekend. There was a very, very brief tweet in the early hours of Sunday morning, but beyond that, and sort of, um, you know, a few words on TV as he was sort of starting a cabinet meeting. But you would expect, after the attack on Saturday night, I think, for your leader to address the nation and say, don't worry, you know, you're safe, stay calm, you know, this is what we're going to do. That, but nothing. I mean, Netanyahu has not appeared on national TV in any meaningful way. Um, to reassure his nation. But just following this attack, I wouldn't be surprised if the Israelis choose not to make a big deal out of it and maybe not rub it in Iran's faces. They, 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 they've sent their message, and their message is been sent via a few missiles. Yeah, and, and a very clear message. Although there was a lot of speculation throughout the week, there was concern that the nuclear facilities was on the table. I spoke to a Mos, ex-Mossad um, intelligence director who said everything is on the table. Um, and then we had the UN watchdog come out and say, we haven't sent our inspectors to work. And then Rafael Grossi came and spoke to us and said, we've sent them back to work, but we're monitoring the situation. Let's just... Um, talk our audiences through uh, Iran's several nuclear facilities spread across the country. Let's just show them the main ones. Now, the Bonab Atomic Research Centre in the north, which conducts research on irrigation and agriculture. There's also the Boucher nuclear reactor, which is Iran's oldest nuclear reactor. And then there's the Natanz nuclear enrichment plant. And then, of course, the Isfahan nuclear fuel research and production center. This is Iran's largest nuclear research center. And from what we understand, from what we know, it was close to and over the airspace of uh, Isfahan International Airport, where we understand these missiles or the Iranians say it was drones that they struck, their air defenses kicked in. That's where we understand the strike was. And Israel's message is, if we can land a couple of missiles in the middle of a 
military base in Isfahan. We can also land a couple of missiles in the middle of a nuclear research facility on the edge of the city as well, if we're pushed to do so. So, yeah, clearly there's a message there. There's always messaging uh, in these things, and it's a warning. I'm sure that over the last five days, there would have been a lot of debate about whether Israel should go further, whether they should attack the nuclear facilities. I thought it was quite interesting yesterday. Iran has always said that they want nuclear capability for civilian energy purposes. That's it. They've always denied wanting a nuclear weapon. Frankly, very few people believe them. But yesterday, a senior general did come out and say, you know, if Israel attacks us, we might be forced to change our doctrine, i.e., actually, we might be forced to get a nuclear weapon after all and, uh, and, and accelerate the enrichment process. And that was a clear threat to Israel. I don't think what's happened overnight will, will change that. Um, but the, the, the use of nuclear language has been threatened by both sides. Yeah, indeed. And Ali, we will, of course, keep talking to you throughout the programme. But just to help our audiences uh, understand um, where all this has come from, where the events of, of um, what we saw overnight has uh, come from, it's been framed based on two events. One, which was on April the 1st, Israel struck the Iranian consulate in Syria. Seven of its military advisers, including three senior commanders, uh, were killed. Now, Israel has has said it was a military compound, it wasn't a diplomatic compound. Um, the Iranians have said it was a diplomatic compound. And then last weekend on Saturday, we saw Iran fired 170 drones, over 30 cruise missiles and 130 ballistic missiles at Israel. Uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu had vowed to respond. And it seems we've seen that response overnight here in the early hours of the morning. Let's bring in our special correspondent, Alex Crawford, who joins us live uh, from Beirut. And Alex, I mean, for years, you've, you've covered the, the proxies, Iran's proxies in this region. But for the last six months, really, you've, you've been in Yemen, you've been talking to the Iraqis, you're currently in Lebanon. There was this feeling that no one wanted, the leadership certainly in all of these countries, didn't want the situation to escalate. When you've spoken to Hezbollah, they've made it clear they're, they're ready if this needs escalation. That war of words has continued, but not just war of words. There has been low-scale war between Hezbollah and Israel for at least the last six months. Yeah, I think the message that they've been giving out ever since uh, the weekend drone and missile attacks by Iran is twofold. One, they do not want war. That was very clearly uh, replicated over and over again from a number of different um, avenues and sources, not just the Lebanese government, not just the Lebanese Hezbollah, not just the Lebanese fighters on the ground and the Lebanese politicians and those who watch it, but also across the region. You know, that no one wants war. And Hezbollah being the strongest Iranian proxy, for them to say that is a very good indication and a reflection, perhaps, of not just how they feel, but perhaps the Iranian authorities and the, the Iranian uh, militants over there, uh, military over there. But also, the second one is, if there is a retaliation, and really what they would consider a wide-scale, deep, powerful, strong retaliation from Israel, then they were ready, and they would respond in kind. We've heard very chilling, uh, powerful messages from the Iranian leadership over the last few days, if that were to happen, that their fingers were on the trigger, that they would respond and it would hurt, and they have the capability to do that. And that, again, has been replicated by Hezbollah here in Lebanon, and they believe they are very much on the front line. There are, as you point out, daily multiple crossfire exchanges between the Lebanese Hezbollah on the south of the Lebanese border with the Israeli Defense Force on the north uh, of, of their border. And it's not just uh, multiple exchanges, multiple explosions, multiple bombing, drone attacks. They have increased over the last six months in intensity and in depth, that how far they go in into Lebanon. So we are in an escalatory pattern, there is no doubt. And the weekend drone and missile attacks just ratcheted it up even more with much more intense crossfire exchanges on that border. So the potential of it to tip into a regional war, drawing in the Yemeni Houthis, drawing in the Iraqi Qatab Hezbollah and other uh, militias in, in Iraq, as well as those uh, stationed in Syria, is immense. 
and they are all as one. They all belong under this umbrella group, which they call the axis of resistance. And that we've seen all this um, activity, not just from the Houthis in Yemen, for instance, interrupting international global trade through the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden, but also attacking American bases uh, not so long ago uh, from Iraq and Syria uh, and killing American soldiers based in Jordan. So this, this really does have the potential to escalate, and we're in a very dangerous situation and position right now. But Hezbollah, the indications this morning Overnight, uh, having seen what's happened overnight, there's a lot of downplaying, not just from Tehran and from those in, in Iran, but also here in Lebanon with the Hezbollah leadership making its initial statement pretty much disdainful of the, the size and the extent of whatever attack has happened inside Iran. And we've, we've yet to hear definitively exactly what that is. But certainly the Hezbollah leadership here pouring a lot of cold water on it, pretty much dismissing it as inconsequential, saying the, uh, in their initial statement that this clearly shows, according to them, that Israel is afraid that they don't really have any clear plan that they're being dictated to by America, but underlying, if they go further, if they hit harder, if they cross this invisible red line, which clearly the Iranians and Hezbollah and all their proxies ha ha are aware of, then they, they will suffer the consequences. And let's remember just how strong Hezbollah has become over the past few years, since 2006, when they managed to push the Israeli army out of large parts of, of a seized area in Lebanon. They have grown. They've grown in size. They've grown in power. They've accumulated... Uh, an unknown, but we understand a larger arsenal of weaponry. And right now they are definitely banging the drum saying that they're prepared to use it to not only defend Lebanese borders, but also to defend an, in alignment and with loyalty to whatever happens to Iran. So I think the message that we've been very clearly getting and a number of um, the foreign ministers have, have been out across all the different countries been also getting that same message is that you hit one, you hit us all. And that is a very uh, worrying prospect for the international community, particularly Israel and America and those who are seen very much in this part of the world to be aligned with Israel. That includes Britain and France and the countries who took part in the defense of that drone and cruise missile attack. Remember here, the view here very much is that Israel started it, that they crossed this red line by attacking the consulate in Damascus. They feel that that was pretty much similar and tantamount to attacking Iran on diplomatic Iranian soil, albeit in another sovereign country. So the message from the Lebanese foreign minister just a few days ago to Sky News was, you know, we believe Israel started it and we've got only so much influence over Hezbollah. We have got some influence, he was saying, but only so much. And as far as Israel's concerned, we will stand and by shoulder to shoulder with Hezbollah. So at the moment, it feels like uh, the, perhaps a line has been drawn under these overnight um, events. You know, we'll get more detail, we hope, throughout the day and over the next few days. Obviously, everyone's waiting to see if that continues, but the suggestion seems to be that this is probably an acceptable response as far as Hezbollah and perhaps the Iranians are concerned. But the potential for it still escalating obviously, obviously still exists because the, whole, the reason why this has all flared up most recently again is because of what's happening in Gaza and because Lebanon and all these countries are fighting on behalf of the Palestinians and believe that the only solution is uh, an, an official Palestinian state. Alex, uh, thank you, uh, as always, for all of your reporting there. That's our Alex Crawford uh, reporting um, and uh, offering her analysis from 
Beirut. Well, as we've been saying, we're expecting uh, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken to speak at, from the G7 foreign ministers meeting. All week we've heard from global leaders, ministers, uh, foreign ministers urging for restraint. The UK government uh, this morning uh, urging both Israel and Iran to de-escalate the situation. Let's just have a little listen into Mel Stride. We do think that de-escalation is absolutely key now. And our message to all in the region, including Israel, is that de-escalation is really important. The Foreign Secretary currently is in Italy, uh, speaking with his G7 counterparts, and they will be very much focused on exactly that. Well, that was Mel Stride. Let's uh, get more now from our Deborah Haynes. And Deborah, we just heard there uh, Mel Stride, but frankly, we've been hearing all week whether it's been uh, Joe Biden saying to Israel, take the win. But then we also saw uh, Lord Cameron here uh, as well midweek, and he said, look, it seems that Israel's going to uh, respond, just ensure that this thing doesn't uh, escalate. And now we've seen that response overnight. Yes, but it's interesting, isn't it? We don't really have... We have well, there is no official confirmation, is there, from Israel in terms of exactly what has happened, what the, what the scale of the attack was on Iran. It's obviously... We know that this is, it has happened in, on, with Iranian media reporting three drones being struck down. Um, it would be really interesting and important, I think, to hear exactly what has happened in terms of this retaliatory strike and whether, as it seems, that this is a limited course of action by Israel. Israel had a whole range of options um, that it could have taken in response to Iran's unprecedented military um, missile and drone strike at the weekend. And, and that ranged from you know, launching F-35 jets to target nuclear sites inside Iran. Um, down to um, less uh, well, more limited action, maybe using drones. Um, so it'd be really, I think it's going to be very interesting to see exactly what um, was, what the target was and exactly what the, um, the munitions were that were used. Um, and then from that, it will be much, it would, it would be a bit more effective to be able to draw a conclusion as, how, as to how Iran might view the attack and view the response. And at the same time, Israel needs to show to its own people that it is restoring deterrence. That red line has now been crossed by Iran of a direct attack against Israel. And so Israel will really be wanting to show all of its enemies in the region that it is not a soft target and anyone who attacks Israel can expect a powerful response. Yeah, I mean, Deborah, when you speak to Israeli officials, they say that you can't show weakness uh, in this region. So they wanted to send a very clear message. But also, uh, I, this is a new sort of phase and a new precedence that has been set. Yes, and that makes it so much more unpredictable. And, and as well, the fact that this is happening at a time when Israel is already engaged in a, 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 a significant war in Gaza. It's also having escalatory tensions and increasing contact with Hezbollah uh, across its northern border in Lebanon. So dealing with two fronts already and then suddenly this third front of this direct confrontation, let's just say it as it is, from Iran to Israel, Israel now having to respond back. So that surely will be playing into calculations too. Um, Israel has finite resources and clearly both sides have previously said, haven't they, that they don't, they aren't seeking direct confrontation, a confrontation that would not just involve Iran and Israel, but of course, allies in the region too. You've got British forces in Cyprus that were involved in that um, effort to successfully defend Israel's territory from the attacks over the weekend, they would then potentially be sucked into any wider confrontation. So it really has been a balancing act of responding, but responding in a way, hopefully, that de-escalates rather than triggers another round, another significant round of missiles and drones. And one final point, the ability to defend against that kind of incoming airstrike is also finite. There are only so many air defence missiles that Israel will have. And so it, the re it really does become more and more dangerous and the increasing chance of greater casualties rises the longer this continues. 
Yeah, absolutely. Deborah, thank you so much for all of that. Let's go straight to Sky News' military analyst, Sean Bell, who joins us now. And Sean, uh, we're still trying to ascertain, to figure out exactly what happened overnight. Uh, Iranian state media more or less um, tried to downplay things from, from the outset, and they said these were just drones, their air defences kicked in. Not sure we'll really fully understand exactly what was used, but what's your, your uh, analysis on, on what happened overnight? Yes, hi, Yelda. As you quite correctly said, I think we've got to be quite careful not to speculate too much at this stage. Uh, Israel's not saying very much. Iran sounds like it wants to downplay all this. I think after the attacks last Saturday, we've been sat on the edge of our seat wondering what Israel would do. Three options, really. Either do nothing, and that seemed to be what the international community was trying to get Israel to do, um, but that was something that couldn't play well um, domestically for Netanyahu. The other end of the spectrum was an Armageddon option, you know, 330 one missiles match it in some way, that would definitely have escalated in the region. Uh, and there was a hope that somehow there'd be a sweet spot in between. And I think there's a sense of relief almost this morning that what appears to have happened is there appears to have been very surgical strikes done. It doesn't appear so far as if there's any reports of casualties. Despite the attacks, the Iranians are already saying um, that uh, there's no plans to react. Um, I think we've got to be quite careful about some of the imagery we see because it's quite clear the Iranian air defences were very nervous last night. Almost certainly they'd have been firing at shadows overnight, so we've got to be quite careful about that. If I was to say, though, that I think the, the fallout's interesting, one of which Iran has been turning around and saying we've no plan to escalate. Israel, some of the hardliners, I think they were used the word feeble on social media. That just demonstrates it's probably not enough to appease some, but it's small enough probably not to escalate. And I think if you were to look at this objectively, um, there's probably three things Israel should be able to walk away from this. One of which is they've sort of had the last word, which was important for Netanyahu. Secondly, they've actually struck at not only um, the military sites, a storage of air, uh, missiles, but also threaten the nuclear site. And thirdly, very importantly, presentationally, Israel was able to demonstrate that it can target effectively on Iranian soil when Iran was not able to do so very effectively despite this huge barrage of missiles. So I think if we are going to see it, the dust settle, this might be an elegant end to the story. But it's also worth pointing out, it's probably the timing. It was um, um, the, uh, the birthday, 85th birthday of Ayatollah Khomeini today. So it's no surprise that this attack happened today. Sean, uh, thank you, as always, for all of that. Well, as we've been reporting here from Jerusalem and watching the developments in the early hours of the morning, Israel launched an attack on Iran. We've heard in the last couple of hours uh, Iranian officials uh, telling Reuters news agency that they have no intention of responding immediately and that they have no confirmation as to who exactly it was. We're also waiting to hear from the U.S. Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, who's at the G7 Foreign Ministers uh, Summit, and he is going to be giving a briefing. All week, we've heard the Israeli war cabinet, Israeli officials and leaders say they had to respond in some way, that they were planning on retaliating uh, because of Iran's attack on Israel, that certain red lines had been crossed. This now appears to be their response. Let's bring in Mohammed Morandi from the University of Tehran to get the view there from Iran. Professor Morandi, thank you very much uh, for joining us. Israel wanted to send Iran a very clear message. Has that message now been received? Well, the, they haven't done anything. There were three quadcopters near Esfahan that were down. There were no explosions. It's a hundred. It's a country of 90 million people. In no city have we had explosions. The only thing that woke me up this morning was an international reporter that called me asking what's happening, and I haven't been able to go back to sleep. So no, we haven't uh, seen anything in particular happen. Tehran, which I'm in, the capital, it has, is very quiet. And uh, I've spoken to people in Esfahan, uh, colleagues who also say they haven't heard anything. They've only read in the international news and Iranian local news. Just one thing, though, and that is that... Uh, 
Professor um, Mirandi, just, just to respond to what you just said there, that nothing has actually happened. I mean, there de does seem to be mixed messaging from the Iranian side. Iranian state media says there were drones, that the air defences kicked in and, and targeted them. Others are saying absolutely nothing's gone on. And then we've had Iranian officials tell Reuters news agency that they don't plan on responding in any way immediately. So is Iran sending mixed messages? Are they on high alert, given the attack on Israel last weekend? Well, two things. One is that I'm sure that no Iranian fish official has said anything to Reuters. Reuters has a history of um, inaccurate statements when it comes to Iranian officials. I know personally because I was involved during the nuclear negotiations. So that aside, uh, what happened... This whole story began with the Israelis bombing the Iranian embassy. Then the Iranians responded. And uh, as you know, most of the drones that the Iranians sent were, were inexpensive drones. They were to distract attention from air defenses. And the Iranians fired effectively a, a handful of uh, missiles that hit their targets, both in the south and the north. So it was a limited strike, but the teach. What 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 we saw was 300 uh, ballistic cruise missiles, drones in total. Um, was Iran surprised by what uh, Western leaders and Israel have described as Iran's failure last weekend to make any impact despite uh, the barrage of, of drones and missiles that sent Israel's way? No, Iran was highly successful. Those drones that Iran fired, 200, were very were dirt cheap drones, and the Israelis spent 1.35 penetrate billion. anything. It didn't do any any sort of damage. The only damage it did was um, at um, a, a military base and actually a, an a Arab Muslim girl who's seriously injured in hospital. Now, if you could allow me to explain, you'll see that uh, the Israelis are misleading you. Uh, those drones were not intended to hit anything. Those drones were a distraction. They were meant to draw fire, and that's exactly what they did, draw fire from Israeli regime defenses. They were sent three, four, five hours earlier to get the Israel to, to Israel. They gave the Israelis a lot of time to prepare themselves to down them. But the objective was to distract them. There were no th there were it wasn't as if Iran was firing three hundred missiles. The missiles that the Iranians fired that were intended to hit the targets were between 10 and 20, and they hit their targets, both in the air base in the south well, and well, the intelligence not, gathering. Not quite. I mean, what, what was the point? I, I know you say the drones were a distraction, but what were the point? What was the point? If you then saw a, a coalition coming together of Americans, uh, Britain, France, Arab countries getting involved, Jordan, namely Jordan, um, in Israel's defense. Well, in fact, that uh, increases the scope of the failure because these drones were downed by a huge number of very advanced missiles. So Iran was able to gather intelligence about what the Americans and the Israelis have, their radar systems, their missile defense capabilities, and they were also able to empty their stocks with a bunch of very old drones that Iran had in stock. And also the missiles that Iran fired were of two types. One were very old missiles that reached Israel alongside the drones. These were all for intelligence gathering, all to make sure that the Israelis and the Americans fired upon them, but and also in a distraction so that the main missiles, which were, uh, as I said, between 10 and 20 would strike their targets, and they both did in the Golan Heights. Well, and in well the Professor Mirandi, um you know, it, it, the, the, from one group, uh, it, it's being described as theatrics and, and Iran just, uh, you know, giving lots of warning uh, that, they, that this was coming. On, on the other hand, uh, there are others who say this displayed Iran's uh, weakness. Uh, unfortunately, we're, we're uh, trying to get to Rishi Sunak, who's speaking live, uh, so we'll have to leave it there. But Professor uh, Mirandi, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you.
Well, in the next uh, few minutes, we are expecting to hear from the Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, who will be speaking in central London. As soon as that happens, we will be bringing that to you. But I'm just going to bring in our Ali Bunkle, uh, who was listening to that interview and has been analysing the events of uh, the last few days. I mean, we have heard I I Iranian state media, Iranian officials downplaying what happened. Professor Morandi saying nothing happened, actually. I've called friends in Isfahan. I'm here in Tehran. Absolutely nothing has happened. So what exactly did they do? I mean, I think it's clear that something happened. I mean, the United States were given forewarning of it, and uh, they have confirmed, uh, U.S. officials confirmed to many media outlets in the United States that Israel carried out these attacks. Um, uh, you know, if, if, if nothing did happen at all, then we still await Israel's response, because, you know, they were always determined to carry one out. But look, the Israelis carried out an attack last night or in the early hours of this morning. Um, they targeted Isfahan. We know that um, if nothing did happen whatsoever, why therefore are so many um, state-related social media channels and media personalities in Iran talking about it uh, and mocking it as being rather feeble? Um, because something happened and they want to downplay it. That's why it's not just Rishi Sunak who's due to speak imminently. Another leader, Ibrahim Raisi, is due to speak imminently as well, the Iranian president. What he has to say will, I think, determine the course of the days ahead because if he feels that uh, Iran needs to respond, I'm sure we'll hear the words from him there. If he wants to bat it away, as state media seem to be doing so far, again, I think that is the language that he will use. Uh, and if that is what he decides to do, I think people will take a breath. Yeah, I mean, just yesterday, uh, Racy was saying, the tiniest invasion, the tiniest attack, we are going to respond much harder than what Israel saw last weekend. And then we heard from... Uh, I'm just being told Rishi Sunak has, uh, uh, has just arrived and is about to deliver his speech. Let's everyone. have a listen in. Uh, today I'd like to talk about the growing number of people who've become economically inactive since the pandemic and the moral mission of reforming welfare to give everyone who can the best possible chance of returning to work. Now, the values of our welfare state are timeless. They're part of our national character of who we are as a country. We're proud to ensure a safety net that is generous for those who genuinely need it and fair to the taxpayers who fund it. We know that there are some with the most severe conditions who will never be able to work and some who can no longer work because of injury or illness. And they and their loved ones must always have the peace of mind that comes from knowing they will always be supported. But we also have a long-standing and proudly British view that work is a source of dignity, purpose, of hope. The role of the welfare state should never be merely to provide financial support, as important as that will always be, but to help people overcome whatever barriers they might face to living an independent, fulfilling life. Everyone with the potential should be supported, and not just to earn, but to contribute and belong. And we must never tolerate barriers that hold people back from making their contribution and from sharing in that sense of self-worth that comes from feeling part of being something bigger than ourselves. And that is why this is a moral mission and why the value of work is so central to my vision for welfare reform. And it's fitting to be setting out that vision here at the Centre for Social Justice. Over your 20-year history, you've inspired far-reaching changes to welfare. And I want to pay tribute to you and, of course, your founder, my friend, Ian Duncan-Smith, who began that journey of reform in 2010, a journey carried through so ably today by Mel Stride. Because when we arrived in office in 2010, people coming off benefits and into work could lose £9 for every 10 they earned, by far the highest marginal tax rate. And that was morally wrong. So we created universal credit to make sure that work always pays, we introduced the national living wage and increased it every year, ending low pay in this country. We're rolling out 30 hours of free childcare for every family over nine months of age. We've halved inflation to make the money you earn worth more. And we've cut workers' national insurance by a third, a £900 tax cut for someone earning the average wage, because it is profoundly wrong that income from work is taxed twice when other forms of income are not. For me, it is a fundamental duty of government 
to make sure that hard work is always rewarded. I know and you know that you don't get anything in life without hard work. It's the only way to build a better life for ourselves and our family, and the only way to build a more prosperous country. But in the period since the pandemic, something has gone wrong. The proportion of people who are economically inactive in Britain is still lower than our international peers, and lower today than in any year under the last Labour government. But since the pandemic, 850,000 more people have joined this group due to long-term sickness. This has wiped out a decade's worth of progress in which the rate had fallen every single year. Now, of those who are economically inactive, fully half say they have depression or anxiety. And most worrying of all, the biggest proportional increase in economic inactivity due to long-term sickness came from young people, those in the prime of their life, just starting out on work and family, instead parked on welfare. Now, we should see it as a sign of progress, of course, that people can talk openly about mental health conditions in a way that years ago would have been unthinkable. And I will never dismiss or downplay the illnesses people have. Anyone who has suffered mental ill health or had family and friends who have knows that these conditions are real and they matter. But just as it would be wrong to dismiss this growing trend, so it would be wrong to merely sit back and accept it. Because it's too hard, too controversial, or for fear of causing offence. Doing so would let down many of the people our welfare system was designed to help. Because if you believe, as I do, that work gives you the chance not just to earn, but to contribute, to belong, to overcome feelings of loneliness and social isolation. And if you believe, as I do, the growing body of evidence that good work can actually improve mental and physical health, then it becomes clear we need to be more ambitious about helping people back to work and more honest about the risk of over medicalizing the everyday challenges and worries of life. Fail to address this and we risk not only letting those people down, but creating a deep sense of unfairness amongst those whose taxes fund our social safety net in a way that risks undermining trust and consent in that very system. We can't stand for that. And of course, the situation as it is, is economically unsustainable. We can't lose so many people from our workforce whose contributions could help to drive growth. And there's no sustainable way to achieve our goal of bringing down migration levels, which are just too high, without giving more of our own people the skills, incentives and support to get off welfare and back into work. And we can't afford such a spiralling increase in the welfare bill and the irresponsible burden that will place on this and future generations of taxpayers. We now spend £69 billion pounds on benefits for people of working age with a disability or health condition. That's more than our entire school's budget, more than our transport budget, more than our policing budget. And spending on personal independence payments alone is forecast to increase by more than 50% over the next four years. Let me just repeat that. If we do not change, it will increase by more than 50% in just four years. That's not right. It's not sustainable, and it's not fair on the taxpayers who fund it. So, in the next parliament, a Conservative government will significantly reform and control welfare. Now, this is not about making our safety net less generous, or imposing a blanket freeze on all benefits, as some have suggested. I'm not prepared to balance the books on the backs of the most vulnerable. Instead, the critical questions are about eligibility, about who should be entitled to support, and what kind of support best matches their needs. And to answer these questions, I want to set out today five conservative reforms for a new welfare settlement for Britain. First, we must be more ambitious in assessing people's potential for work. Right now, the gateway to ill health benefits is writing too many off leaving them on the wrong type of support 
and with no expectation of trying to find a job with all the advantages that that brings. In 2011, 20% of those doing a work capability assessment were deemed unfit to work. But the latest figure now stands at 65%. That's wrong. People are not three times sicker than they were a decade ago. And the world of work has changed dramatically. Now, of course, those with serious debilitating conditions should never be expected to work. But if you have a low-level mobility issue, your employer could make reasonable adjustments, perhaps including adaptations to enable you to work from home. And if you're feeling anxious or depressed, then of course you should get the support and treatment you need to manage your condition. But that doesn't mean we should assume you can't engage in work. That's not going to help you. And it's not fair on everyone else either. So we're going to tighten up the work capability assessment such that hundreds of thousands of benefit recipients with less severe conditions will now be expected to engage in the world of work and be supported to do so. Second, just as we help move people from welfare into work, we've got to do more to stop people going from work to welfare. Now, the whole point of replacing the sick note with the fit note was to stop so many people just being signed off as sick. Instead of being told you're not fit for work, the fit note provided the option to say that you may be fit for work with advice about what you can do and what adaptions or support would enable you to stay in or return to work quickly. 11 million of these fit notes were issued last year alone. But what proportion was signed may be fit for work? Just 6%. That's right. A staggering 94% of those signed off sick were simply written off as not fit for work. Well, that's not right. And it was never the intention. We don't just need to change the sick note, we need to change the sick note culture so that the default becomes what work you can do, not what you can't. Building on the pilots that we've already started, we're going to design a new system where people have easy and rapid access to specialised work and health support to help them back to work from the very first FitNote conversation. And part of the problem is that it may not be reasonable to ask GPs, who are perfectly very busy at the moment, assess whether their own patients are fit for work. It too often puts them in an impossible situation where they know that refusal to sign somebody off will harm that precious relationship with their patient. So we're also going to test shifting the responsibility for assessment from GPs and giving it to specialist work and health professionals who have the dedicated time to provide an objective assessment of someone's ability to work and the tailored support that they need to do so. Third, for those who could work with the right support, we should have higher expectations of them in return for receiving benefits. Because when the taxpayer is supporting you to get back on your feet, you have an obligation to put in the hours. And if you do not make that effort, you can't expect the same level of benefits. It used to be that if you worked just nine hours a week, you'd get full benefits without needing to look for additional work. That's not right. Because if you can work more, you should. So we're changing the rules. Anyone working less than half a full-time week will now have to try and find extra work in return for claiming benefits. And we'll accelerate moving people from legacy benefits onto universal credit to give them more access to the world of work. Now, one of my other big concerns about the system is that the longer you stay on welfare, the harder it can be to go back to work. Around half a million people have been unemployed for six months. And well over a quarter of a million have been unemployed for 12 months. These are people with no medical conditions that prevent them from working and who will have benefited from intensive employment support and training programs. There is no reason these people should not be in work, especially when we have almost a million job vacancies. So we will now look at options to strengthen our regime. Anyone who doesn't comply with the conditions set by their work coach, such as accepting an available job, will, after 12 months, 
have their claim closed and their benefits removed entirely. Because unemployment support should be a safety net, never a lifestyle choice. Fourth, we need to match the support people need to the actual conditions they have and help people live independently and remove the barriers they face. But we need to look again at how we do this through personal independence payments. I worry about it being misused. Now, its purpose is to contribute to the extra cost people face as they go about their daily lives. Take, for example, those who need money for aids or assistance with things like handrails or stair lifts. Often they're already available at low cost or free from the NHS or local authorities. And they're one-off costs. So it probably isn't right that we're paying an ongoing amount every year. We also need to look specifically at the way personal independence payments support those with mental health conditions. Since 2019, the number of people claiming PIP, citing anxiety or depression as their main condition, has doubled, with over 5,000 new awards on average every single month. But for all the challenges they face, it's not clear they have the same degree of increased living costs as those with physical conditions. And the whole system is undermined by the way people are asked to make subjective and unverifiable claims about their capability. So in the coming days, we will publish a consultation on how we move away from that to a more objective and rigorous approach that focuses support on those with the greatest needs and extra costs. We will do that by being more precise about the type and severity of mental health conditions that should be eligible for PIP. We'll consider linking that assessment more closely to a person's actual condition and requiring greater medical evidence to substantiate a claim. All of which will make the system fairer and harder to exploit. And we'll also consider whether some people with mental health conditions should get PIP in the same way through cash transfers or whether they'd actually be better supported to lead happier, healthier and more independent lives through access to treatment like talking therapies or respite care. I want to be completely clear about what I'm saying here. This is not about making the welfare system less generous to people who face very real extra costs from mental health conditions. For those with the greatest needs, we actually want to make it easier to access with fewer requirements. And beyond the welfare system, we're delivering the largest expansion in mental health services in a generation, with almost £5 billion of extra funding over the past five years and a near doubling of mental health training places. But our overall approach is about saying that people with less severe mental health conditions should be expected to engage in the world of work. And fifth, we can't allow fraudsters to exploit the natural compassion and generosity of the British people. We've already cracked down on thousands of people wrongly claiming universal credit, including those not self-reporting earnings or hiding capital. And we'll save the taxpayer £600 million by legislating to access vital data from third parties like banks. Just this month, DWP secured guilty verdicts against a Bulgarian gang, court making around 6,000 fraudulent claims, including by hiding behind a corner shop in North London. And we're going further. We're using all the developments in modern technology, including artificial intelligence, to crack down on exploitation in the welfare system that's taking advantage of the hardworking taxpayers who fund it. We are preparing a new fraud bill for the next parliament, which will align DWP with HMRC, so that we treat benefit fraud like tax fraud, with new powers to make seizures and arrests, and will also enable penalties to be applied to a wider set of fraudsters through a new civil penalty. Because when people see others in their community gaming the system that their taxes pay, it erodes support for the very principle of the welfare state. Now, in conclusion, some people no doubt will hear this speech and accuse me of lacking compassion, of not understanding the barriers people face in their everyday lives. But the exact opposite is true. There is nothing compassionate about leaving a generation of young people to sit alone in the dark before a flickering screen, watching as their dreams slip further from reach every passing day. 
And there is nothing fair about expecting taxpayers to support those who could work but choose not to. It doesn't have to be like this. We can change. We must change. The opportunities to work are there, thanks to an economic plan that has created almost a million job vacancies. The rewards for working are there, thanks to our tax cuts and increases to the national living wage. And now, if we can deliver the vision for welfare that I've set out today, then we can finally fulfill our moral mission to restore hope and give back to everyone who can the dignity, purpose, and meaning that comes from work. Thank you. Thank you. So we've got lots of time for some questions from the media. I'd like to try and get through as many as we can. So if I could ask you to try and keep it to one question, that will help. Uh, and if I could start with ITV. Thank you, Prime Minister. Um, on personal independence payments, 1.9 million people with mental health issues are currently sitting on a waiting list. Surely that's not the right moment to float replacing their cash benefits with access to treatment that they'll be worried they can't get. And I'm sorry, but I do just want to ask for a response to the Israeli strikes on Iran. Yeah, um, thanks, Anishka. Uh, we take mental health incredibly seriously, which is why we're investing record amounts into mental health services and treatment. If you look at what's happened, funding for mental health services has actually exceeded the increase that was set out a few years ago in the NHS's long-term plan. So it went up 10% last year. NHS mental health services are right now treating a record number of adults. We've rolled out mental health support in communities, in schools, and our actually world-leading talking therapies um, has been given extra funding and has, I think, a very successful recovery rate, and that's being expanded to more people. And we're preparing for the long term as well. The recently announced long-term workforce plan for the NHS trains a near, well, a near doubling of the number of mental health nurse training places are created through that. So I think that should give you a sense of our commitment to supporting those with mental health conditions, as I said, record amounts going in and a plan to continually expand them. Um, but I do think it's, it's right to make sure that our welfare system is supporting those who need it the most in the way that we intended it to. And you just have to look at the numbers. Over half of all the people who joined that group of the economically inactive last year uh, were citing mental health or anxiety as the main reason. Now, of course, we want to get people the support and the treatment they need uh, with those conditions. Uh, but I do think it's right that the welfare system doesn't over medicalize you know, the everyday challenges and worries of life, especially because I believe very strongly in the evidence support work is good for people's mental health, right? There's increasing evidence and a range of different studies that actually people being in work see huge improvements in their overall health and especially their mental health. So we're letting those people down if we persist with a system which at the moment is writing far too many of them off as just simply not able to work, when we know that work will be very good for them. And you've seen this massive increase since the pandemic, most worryingly, I think for all of us amongst young people, and that can't be right. right? That's an enormous loss of potential, and we don't want to lose all those people's potential. We want to support them so that they can have, as I described, you know, the purpose, the meaning, the hope that comes from good work. And that's why I think it is right to look again at how the work capability assessment works, and that's why we're going to tighten up the conditions there, but also how PIP supports those with mental health conditions. And it is I think the right thing to consider whether those people with less severe conditions do of course get the treatment and support they need and the right way to do that might not be through cash transfers. And it may also not be the case that the system as it is set up today in the way that it treats people with this one size fits all model is actually doing the right thing. There's a range of conditions and severities that people have and the impact on their daily living costs. And we need to be a bit more specific about that and actually ask ourselves, well, hang on, is everyone seeing these extra costs in their day-to-day -day living in the same way, particularly when it comes to mental health conditions? And I think, as I said, the numbers speak for themselves. If we don't do anything, the PIP bill alone is forecast to increase by 50% in just four years. 
And I don't think anyone sitting here thinks that is right, sustainable or fair. Um, and as I said, particularly when we think that work is good for people, it's, uh, it's the right thing to do to, tr uh, to try and tackle this in the way that I've set out. Um, that with the situation overnight, uh, as you would appreciate, it's a developing situation. It wouldn't be right for me to speculate until the facts become clear and we're working to confirm the details together with allies. You know, we have condemned Iran's reckless and dangerous barrage of missiles against Israel on Saturday, and Israel absolutely has the right to self-defense. Uh, but as I said to Prime Minister Netanyahu when I spoke to him last week, and more generally, significant escalation is not in anyone's interest. What we want to see is calm heads prevail across the region. Uh, next, we go to LBC. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Prime Minister. Um, I just wanted to ask, Job Centre staff have already reported across the country unsustainable workloads and huge backlogs. Under this plan, they're going to have 400,000 more people to support into work. That is a lot of people. Are you confident that they're going to be able to manage that? And I have to ask as well, should Mark Menzies quit as an MP? So on, uh, let me just take the second one first. It's right that Mark M Menzies has resigned the Conservative whip. He's been suspended from his position as a trade envoy whilst the investigations into those allegations continue. You know, for our part, I can't comment on our ongoing investigation while it's happening. And uh, he's no longer a Conservative MP, as I said. Now, with regard to, to work coaches, they do a fantastic job, actually. And they deserve an enormous amount of our praise um, for what they do. Because um, they're doing something actually incredible. I mean, they are transforming people's lives, right? Moving someone off welfare into work is an incredibly special moment, right? And any of us who have worked with them and heard about those stories or talked to constituents, colleagues in our communities who have made that transition will know what an incredible moment it is. Ian and I were talking about that just before we came in, and Ian's spoken about it so eloquently in the past. You know, work is an enormous force for good. You know, I believe this very strongly. It actually, when I first created the furlough scheme and people asked me about it, what drove me to do that was my belief in the fundamental importance of work to people's lives. It gives you purpose. It gives you dignity. It gives you pride. It gives you a sense of belonging. Uh, it gives you hope. And it's not just about, obviously, the financial security that it brings. It's about all those other things that strengthen your life. And, you know, we don't get anywhere in life without working, whether it's individuals, our family, or indeed the country. That's why, you know, I created the furlough scheme, because jobs are so important to me. And it's why this agenda for welfare reform is so important to me. And the people on the front line who are doing it are our work coaches. They are the people that are supporting people into work, and they deserve an enormous amount of thanks and praise for everything they do, and rightly championed by Mel. And Mel uh, has worked really well with the Chancellor to secure extra funding for all our uh, job coaches and our um, job centres and our work coaches. Ian talked about things like universal support uh, in his opening remarks. So actually, we've invested probably over the last two or three budgets and fiscal events, literally billions of pounds into new programmes that go into supporting our work coaches. You know, Mel could explain all the details afterwards. There's universal support, there's work well. All of these things essentially provide work coaches with more resources, more work coaches to support more people, to help them into work. So we've approached this from lots of different ways. It's not just about reforms of the welfare system. It's about proactive support, wraparound support. We've also invested in training as well. So actually, for all the people that we want to help, they have now access to completely free training, level two, level three qualifications, skills boot camps, all of these initiatives designed to help them get into work. So we are wrapping our arms around these people and helping them with everything that we've got. And we're also using new technology. And I talked a little bit about AI on the fraud side, but we're also <coughs> using technology to act as a co-pilot, essentially, for work coaches uh, so that it can make their lives easier. And we've already started rolling that out. The results are incredible in the amount of time that it saves work coaches. We've got more to do. But that's why it's so important that you've got, in this government, a government that understands the potential of technology to transform public services. You know, we all want more out of public services, and we'd all prefer to pay less taxes. You know, one way to square that circle is to make sure that we use technology to drive up productivity. And actually, the work Mel's doing across our job centres is a great example of that. And that's only going to improve over time. Uh, and that's why actually using AI and other technologies, making work coaches' life easier, saving them uh, from the bureaucracy that some of the they're going through with the forms, um, is paying real dividends and, and will only make life easier going forward. Uh, next, we go to the BBC. 
Vicky Young, BBC. Um, could you talk a bit more about the fit notes and the changes you want to make? Who is going to do this instead of GPs? Are there professionals? What training will they get? How will you recruit them, given that there does seem to be an issue with recruitment in uh, the NHS at the moment? And if you're going to have a more tailored service, that will, of course, take up more time and be more complicated. Isn't that going to just add to the backlog? And uh, secondly, why did you wait so long before acting on the serious allegations about Mark Menzies? So on, on Mark Menzies, I've already addressed that, and I said there's an ongoing investigation, so I can't really comment whilst that's ongoing. On, on the fit note, the broader point here, before we get into the practicalities of what we're doing is the why, and it's just to remind everyone of what I said, right? When, this, when we went from a sick note to a fit note, the whole point was we were trying to say, hang on, there, there's lots of work people may be able to do. Right? And we need flexibility in this gateway to focus on what people can do, not what they can't. Uh, but that hasn't happened. As I said, 94% of the 11 million fit notes last year were not fit for work. Right? So this idea that we would have more flexibility, focus more on what people may be able to do, hasn't happened. And that's why I think it's right that we look at this. Um, so there are, we've already started pilots. And so Mel's already been rolling out some pilots across the country to trial different ways in local areas. Uh, today, we're publishing our call for evidence, because I'm not saying I'm standing here today with the precise answer of what it's going to look like. But we're going to ask people's views. We're going to trial a range of different things. But I do think that there is a argument for moving away, as I said, from GPs doing this, who obviously there's a lot of demands on GPs. Um, and it may be that this is better done by other professionals. Also, that's it. It, GPs have a quite special relationship with their patients. And inserting this into it puts them sometimes in a, you talk to them in a difficult position because they don't want to damage that relationship with their patient. And it may be harder for them to, to be as objective. And I know, actually, I think the Royal College of uh, General Practitioners has, has kind of welcomed the call for evidence today. So that we want to explore different, different models. Uh, there's a range of different options you can do. But we want to figure out, well, what's a system that's efficient? Um, that's got the right number, you know, the right expertise and skills of people to make these objective assessments and do it in a way that is fair, that is also focused on figuring out what people can do, not what they can't, so that we change the culture around this whole, uh, this whole process. Um, so that, that, that's the approach on fit notes. As I said, uh, Call for Evidence is published today, um, but I think there's a very strong argument for changing our current system because it's not delivering on the aims that it originally set out to deliver. And you know, I, I said, if you believe, like me, work is a good thing, we've got to have a system and a culture that recognizes that and encourages it. And the current fit note system, unfortunately, is not delivering that for any of us. Uh, next, we go to GB News. Uh, Christopher Hope from GB News. Prime Minister, um, is this sick note culture a generational thing? Are you basically saying that Britain's got to pull itself together, get back to work, do older people just get on with it, and younger people don't want to? I can ask you a question about the Rwanda flights. You now won't say these flights will take off by the end of spring. Will you say well, they'll take off by the end of the summer? Right. So on this question of mental health, I just want to be really clear. I'm not in any way saying that mental health isn't a serious condition. Of course it is. And that's why, as I outlined earlier, we've invested a record amount in it, record amount of people getting treated for it. And it is a very welcome thing that we all can talk and acknowledge mental health issues in a way that we wouldn't or couldn't have done a decade ago. Uh, and look, if you're feeling anxious or depressed, then of course you should get the support and the treatment that you need to manage your conditions. But that doesn't mean that we should assume you can't engage in the world of work because that isn't going to help you when all the evidence says that work can be good for your mental health. And what we need to not do is risk over medicalizing these things when it comes to the welfare system and, and over medicalizing what are essentially the everyday challenges and anxieties of life. Right? That, that is distinct from a welfare system that recognises people with severe conditions need very specific help and support. You know, for lots of other people with less severe conditions, they can and should be expected to engage in the world of work. And that's why we're going to reform um, the work capability assessments again and look at how PIP treats these conditions. Uh, but this point on young people is important. And I said it should worry all of us. The biggest proportional increase in the group of people who have become economically inactive since the pandemic is young people. Right? That is a tragedy. 
right? I, it's enormous waste and loss of human potential. And so as a matter of urgency, we should be wanting to tackle that. And as I said, if you believe very strongly as I do that work is good for people, particularly early in their careers in life, then we must look at reforming the system because how it's working at the moment, forget about what it's doing on the money and everything else and it's unsustainable and bad for the economy. It is fundamentally letting these people down um, if we are writing them off rather than helping them get into work because that's probably one of the most positive things we can do for them. Uh, on, on Rwanda, look, the, the very simple thing here is, is that repeatedly everyone has tried to block us from getting this bill through. And, uh, you know, yet again, you saw it this week. Um, you saw, you know, Labour peers blocking us again. And that's enormously frustrating. Everyone's patience with this has run uh, thin. Mine certainly has. Uh, so our intention now is to get this done on Monday. No more prevarication, no more delay. We are going to get this done on Monday and we will sit there and vote until it's done. I think everyone will be able to see that, that there's a clear choice here. You've got a Conservative government that is doing absolutely everything it can to pass this bill so that after that we soon as practically possible can get flights to leave to Rwanda and build that deterrent so that we can stop the boats and you've got a Labour Party that is doing absolutely everything it can to delay and frustrate and us in that aim. I think the British people can see that very clearly but we're not deterred. We're going to do everything we can to stop the boats and get... As I said, look, the priority now is to get this bill passed, right? At the end of the day, like, we've got to get this bill passed and I said now very clearly we're going to get this done on Monday. We don't want any more prevarication or delay. Enough from the Labour Party. We're going to get this bill passed and then we will work to get flights off so we can build that deterrent because that is the only way to resolve this issue. If you care about stopping the boats, you've got to have a deterrent. You've got to have somewhere that you can send people so that they know if they come here illegally, they won't get to stay. It's as simple as that. The bill is the way we're going to deliver that. Uh, next, we'll go to the Daily Mail. Thanks, PM. Uh, Jason goes from the Daily Mail. Um, you, you talk in your speech about uh, removing benefits entirely from uh, long-term unemployed who won't take a job. Um, I mean, that could leave some people destitute. Some of your critics are going to say... The uh, Prime Minister continuing uh, the Q&A session after his remarks at the uh, Centre of Social Justice, where he announced uh, planned reforms uh, uh, to the welfare state, created, saying that uh, he had, quote, a moral mission to make sure hard work is rewarded. Uh, also saying on Rwanda, everyone's trying to block us, but no more delay. We will get this done on Monday. Only one... A uh, brief answer uh, given uh, so far on the latest situation in the Middle East. He said, it wouldn't be right for me to speculate on reports of uh, an Israeli attack on Iran. Uh, he said he was waiting for more information on that uh, and working with his allies. He said, quote, Israel has the right to defend itself, uh, that we want to see calm heads prevail uh, and significant escalation in the Middle East is not in anyone's interest. Well, the situation in the Middle East is the main story uh, this morning, and US officials say Israel has launched a retaliatory strike against Iran overnight. The Prime Minister not drawn on those specifics just now, though. Iranian state media say air defence systems were fired in several provinces with reports of explosions being heard. No casualties or damage have been confirmed. Well, this video, posted on Telegram by the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, uh, a branch of uh, Iranian armed forces, appears to show explosions over the Iranian province of Ishafan uh, earlier this morning. Well, Iran's uh, state-run IRNA news agency has said air defence batteries have been fired in several provinces. Flights were grounded uh, in the capital city of Tehran and Iranian state TV reported three drones were destroyed shortly after midnight in the sky over the central city of Isfahan, uh, close to uh, military and nuclear facilities. Well, this video from the semi-official Iran news agents, uh, agency Taznim, uh, verified uh, by Sky News, shows uh, Isfahan's uranium conversion nuclear site. They say anti-aircrafts at the facility fired at unspecified targets early this morning. Israel has not yet commented on the attack, but has previously vowed to respond after Iran's unprecedented attack at the weekend. A senior Iranian official has told uh, the Reuters news agency that the country has no plans to immediately retaliate. There's been plenty of international reaction to developments, uh, of course, in the Middle East this week. Israel's Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, said yesterday the country will make its own decisions about how to defend itself, despite facing calls from the West for restraint. Those comments came as the US and UK imposed sanctions against Iran in response 
to the missile and drone strikes on Israel at the weekend. Israel notified U.S. officials that a response was coming, but Washington was not involved in the strikes, according to a source who's spoken to our U.S. partner, NBC News. Well, G7 foreign ministers are meeting in Italy for a third day. The U.S. Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, will hold a briefing later this morning. We'll have that for you live. And reaction uh, this morning to the attack from Israel's hard-right security uh, minister, uh, Itamar Ben-Gavir. He posted on social media uh, just one word, feeble. Well, International Affairs Editor Dominic Waghorn in Jerusalem for us. Uh, Dominic, great to see you. Uh, first, what do we know about the specifics uh, of uh, the retaliation, I guess, in inverted commas? It's not yet been confirmed that that's what this was. Yeah, it seems to have been a counter-strike against Iran's retaliation for what Israel did on April the 1st, attacking uh, its embassy compound, the Iranian com uh, embassy compound uh, in Damascus. It's pretty murky, Wilf, as to what we know about what, ha what happened in uh, Iran overnight. But what it looks like, and, and you have to stress these are still early days, we may not get a full picture for some time to come, but what it looks like is Israel carried out a uh, calibrated, limited strike. It's not clear what it was using. The Iranians have reported quadcopters. Um, shadowy Israeli uh, units have reportedly used quadcopter drones in the past uh, to attack targets from the ground in Iran, or reportedly at least. But this, um, I think, is most likely to have been missiles fired from Israel, long-range missiles. And in terms of targets, it seems they attacked targets in Isfahan um, and possibly another place called Tabriz, according to what we're hearing from other reports, not confirmed uh, or verified yet. Isfahan is an important target and relevant and significant in a number of ways. It's a beautiful, very important Iranian city. It's where Iran's nuclear facilities, or some of them, are based. It's also where a drone factory or production uh, facility is based as well. So striking there, the Israelis, um, it's also where an air base is based as well. And and reports, some of the reports are claiming that this airbase was hit. So possibly this was sort of in the uh, sense of an eye for an eye, an airbase for an airbase retaliation, because, of course, the only place the Iranian counter-strike on Saturday was able to get through to and to hit was an airbase uh, in Israel. Limited damage done there, but successful in striking that at least. So this could be a retaliation for that very much directly and literally. But also it's sending a clear message to the Iranians. It's saying to the Iranians, we can strike you uh, in sensitive sites close to your nuclear facilities at will. And next time we can hurt you a lot more painfully. If they've struck Tabriz as well, that's also where ballistic missiles are based. And they, of course, were used in the attack on Israel on Saturday as well. So there are a number of messages being sent to the Iranians. And it does it does seem as though this was a, a limited calibrated strike, which is exactly what Israel's allies have been urging because they've been worried about the danger of uh, an overreaction by the Israelis that could then plunge the region into a much bigger regional war. And so far, it seems the Iranians are sticking to the script in terms of they are playing down their response. Of course, ahead of this, they were sounding very bellicose. We heard uh, one Iranian commander saying that the tiniest invasion, in his words, would lead to a massive and harsh response. Uh, warning the Israelis to do nothing. Um, it seems that, that they are not reacting to this in, in that sense. They are playing things down. They're effectively saying, you know, they, they are admitting there was some kind of activity, some kind of uh, incident around Isfahan overnight, but they're effectively saying now to their own people, move on. And the reason for that is there's still the assumption that Iran does not want to get engaged in an all-out war with Israel and its powerful Western allies for a number of reasons. It, it couldn't possibly win one. But also, it is still very much weakened at home by the impact the lasting legacy of the biggest threat to the Iranian regime since the 1979 Islamic Revolution. And that was a women-led uprising against the regime where we saw huge amounts of protests and really brutal repression following that. And uh, in the last few days, we've, we've heard reports of an intensification, a renewal of that kind of repression. And there have been reports of another woman dying in the same jail where Masa Amini, the woman whose death in jail sparked that uprising. We've heard reports of another woman uh, dying there. So the situation, even though that process, the unrest has been has been crushed by the Iranian regime, it's still difficult and uncertain, I think, for the regime. For all those reasons, the assumption is it doesn't want an all-out war and therefore it will be playing down the impact of what Israeli, Israel has done overnight because it doesn't then have to 
react. So I think in terms of the way allies will be looking at this, they will be reassured that Israel is following the script and the Iranians as well, and hopefully they can draw a line under this. It has to be said, though, Wilf, that the lasting impact of what's happened over the last few weeks um, still means that the region, I think, has become more dangerous because the rules of the game, the all-important rules of the game in the Middle East, have been changed by what both Israel and Iran have done. D Dom, um, so many, as you said, uh, moving pieces here, and you, you know, as you said, uh, a lot that we don't know for sure yet, not least what Iran might do in response. I'm interested, though, in, in the hypothetical question, your take on it, that earlier in the week we heard Lord Cameron use the phrase that Israel should take the win here. Uh, clearly, um, on Saturday, Iran's missile and drone strike was not largely successful on, on Israel. If things were to die down from here, um, would the response that Israel um, reportedly uh, launched overnight uh, cross the line to disappoint Western allies, that, that they went beyond taking the win, as it were? Or, or could this settle down as, as a sort of perfect response from Israel um, and keep Western allies and support on side in a way that we have seen return to Israel over the last week or two? I think the answer to that really depends on what has been going on diplomatically behind the scenes. Um, and you're right, David Cameron has repeated what Joe Biden said originally to the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, which was to take the win and not to do anything in the uh, wake of what Iran did against Israel on Saturday. And uh, the President's advice that's been uh, echoed by any number of Western allies is to that the win is not that just none of these cruise missiles, more than 300 cruise missiles, ballistic missiles and drones were fired at Israel, uh, not just that none of them got through to do any major damage, but also that that night showed that the air defences that America and its allies have been putting in place for a number of years now that involve Arab states as well, that air defence system that has worked and that Israel's allies rallied around uh, Israel on that night, not just Western allies, but also Arab allies as well. And I think, you know, that the message from Joe Biden was accept that, be bigger than this, don't overreact and don't do anything that could plunge the region into a much bigger war. But I think the Israelis have said in turn there's huge pressure, not just from within the Israeli government, but also uh, the wider sort of Israeli public saying that you can't just take this lying down. And the problem is that a line was crossed uh, by Iran attacking Israel. For the first time, Israel was attacked by another sovereign state in more than 30 years. And we have seen a shadow war for 45 years being played out between Israel and Iran. But Iran's never uh, gone out into the open and attacked Israel directly. The reason it did so was it felt that its diplomatic embassy in Damascus was sovereign territory. It also, uh, in that embassy, uh, was a very large number of, or high-level number of uh, Iranian military targets that the Israelis killed. And for those, those reasons, the Iranians felt they had to uh, respond. And in doing so, they crossed one of their own red lines, which is to never to attack uh, Israel directly. And the fact they've done so means that from now on that makes it more likely. Because up until this point, when considering how to respond to any number of attacks that Israel has carried out in this shadow war, the Iranians have always said to themselves, well, we can't attack Israel directly because we never have. They have done so now and therefore many Israelis have been saying that it makes it more likely they'll do so in the future. So, so the message from Israel was to the Americans and to Western allies was you know, whatever you say about not reacting, we have to do something because we are under huge pressure, not just uh, across the side, but also within our own governments to uh, respond. So I think there was a then there was a shift from, particularly from Britain and, and other, other allies saying, well, we accept you've got to do something, but if you're going to do something, please don't overreact. Don't do it in such a way that's going to plunge the region into a massive, very dangerous, uh, bigger war. And it looks as though so far the Israelis have followed that advice. They've reacted in a calibrated way that sends a clear message to Iran. And obviously the hope is that Iran doesn't react in turn uh, and does draw a line under this. The chapter is closed and we can move on. But the, the damage has, done, uh, has been done in some, in, to the extent that Iran has crossed this red line. That precedent has now been, a new precedent has been set. And that effectively changes the rules of the game here. Dominic, great stuff. Thanks so much uh, for that, Dominic Waghorn uh, there in Jerusalem. Well, uh, earlier this week, the International Atomic Energy Agency warned that amid rising tensions between Israel and Iran, nuclear facilities must never be targeted. The UN nations, uh, the UN's nuclear watchdog has confirmed this morning that all nuclear sites are currently safe and undamaged. And I'm joined now by the Director General of the International Atomic uh, Energy Agency, Rafael Marino Gross. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, what is your first take uh, on these attacks overnight? Well, as you were just uh, saying, 
uh, you, you know, we have our teams, our teams of inspectors that are permanently working uh, in, uh, in, in Iran, in all the nuclear sites of the country. And of course, uh, through the night, we were following with great attention, uh, very closely what was going on there. Uh, and of course, we uh, were checking also with the uh, Iranian uh, nuclear authorities as well, uh, getting the information about uh, things as they happened. And, and, and uh, fortunately, we were able to confirm early this morning that after these uh, attacks, there has not been any damage to the nuclear sites. You know that there are many nuclear sites uh, in, in the Islamic Republic of Iran. And, and, and uh, most notably in Isfahan, who, which, which has been targeted as a place, uh, not the nuclear sites, as I was saying. Uh, but of course, it is of a great concern that we are having. And I've been um, urging uh, everyone to exercise maximum uh, restraint in this regard. Let's talk about Isfahan. Do you think that nuclear facilities were not damaged by luck or by design? There was no, there was no attack on the simply like I mean I I I don't know what the military targeting acquisition was. It's not my my business, um, so I cannot tell you that part of your question. What I can tell you is that there hasn't been any uh, any damage at the site or anything that would indicate that were um, hits nearby or something that could lead you to believe that there was an intention uh, to, to reach these places. Um, is it possible uh, to attack, uh, say, infrastructure that supports uh, a nuclear strike and to do so uh, in a safe way or not? Is that a, a, a possible military uh, aim that's not dangerous? Uh, no, absolutely not. Uh, targeting a nuclear facility, apart from being forbidden by international law, uh, is, uh, you know, playing with fire. Uh, because there are so many, apart from the places where you can have, first of all, I don't want to get too technical here, but there, there, are, there are so many different kind of uh, nuclear facilities. You can have an enrichment facility, you can have a, a, a uranium uh, processing and conversion facility, you can have a research reactor, you can have different different things, all right? And in these places, you will have nuclear material in different dispositions and and uh, and physical forms, again. So everything would depend on the kind of facility, but after, but even considering that, you have the, uh, the uh, ancillary infrastructure that serves that facility, including external power uh, supply lines, that could be, um, you know, indirectly uh, triggering if you want a nuclear accident. This is why, um, as I always say, nuclear facilities are completely, absolutely off limits uh, in this in these cases. I and we were relieved to see that at least now uh, there has been no um, targeting or not hitting, of course, of any nuclear uh, facility. What nuclear capability does Iran have now? Well, Iran has a very ambitious uh, nuclear program, um, which includes uh, um, very, very high levels of enrichment, I would say tantamount to, to weapon grade. They are enriching uranium at 60%, military grade is 90%. They have an array of uh, uh, ultra centrifuges of uh, late, latest generation, more than uh, 14,000 uh, centrifuges of this type. So um, they have a very, I would say, um, uh, great capability to uh, manufacture nuclear material. Uh, um, uh, in parallel, they do have um, um, facilities related to what we call the nuclear fuel cycle, from mining to conversion to processing, fabrication of the fuel um, itself. Uh, so uh, it is a vast program spread uh, through, um, I would say, 10 at least nuclear sites across the country, from Tehran to Boucher in the south, where they have uh, a nuclear power plant. What have uh, your observations in just, let's say, the last month been uh, of what they're doing in those sites and your assessment of whether it has changed at all in response to the escalating tensions there? Are they 
doubling down on their efforts? Are they speeding things up? Well, it's been, there, uh, we have seen ups and downs here. One thing uh, that it's important to say is that there is, a, uh, there is continuity in the, uh, let's focus on the enrichment, uh, the uranium enrichment effort, which is the one that has drawn the most, uh, and for good reason, the most attention from the international community because of the uh, ability to use this material eventually, hypothetically, to uh, manufacture nuclear nuclear weapons. And, and, and in this regard, what we have seen is a steady effort. They are producing, you know, around nine kilograms of uh, uranium enriched at, at that very, very high level. Let me remind you that no country that does not have nuclear, nuclear weapons enriches uranium at these levels. For nuclear reactors, for example, you are talking at levels around between two and four percent. Here we are at 60 percent, close to 90, which mm -hmm. is the military level. And this, of course, raised eyebrows. And, uh, and we are trying to keep the maximum level of, of inspection uh, there. So what I would say is that we see we see continuity in, in the effort. We, do, we don't see a particular rush, uh, but at the same time, there is, uh, there is a steady pace, yes. Are you confident uh, that they aren't further down the line than that? Do you think your inspections uh, are effective? Absolutely, yes. But I would say what we have saying, and I intend to be continuing this conversation, perhaps even in Iran soon, what we have been saying is that the level of inspection is um, not at the level we, sh we should have. Uh, Iran has a inspections agreement, what we call in the jargon a safeguards agreement. Our inspectors are there. There is an important inspection effort. But uh, given what I said in the beginning of our conversation, uh, given the the the, uh, the depth and breadth of the of the program, uh, we should be having additional monitoring um, capabilities uh, about which we have been discussing with Iran. One should put things in context and re be reminded that uh, the IEA used to have much more visibility at the time of the famous JCPOA. You remember this mm. agreement that the P5 plus Germany uh, had with the Islamic Republic, which was abandoned in, in 2018 by the United States, then Iran itself abandoned it. So, the, and that agreement um, uh, foresaw uh, a, a much uh, deeper uh, and wider uh, capability, inspection visibility capability for the agency. This has disappeared. Mm -hmm. While at the same time, Iran is doubling down, to use your expression, on or on its um, enrichment uh, capacities. Um, I, I guess the sort of final final question for me on this is if you could just sum up where they are um, for us. If they decided, uh, given recent events or, or just uh, for other reasons, that they wanted an effective nuclear bomb or something that's 60 percent as as powerful as one, how quickly could they uh, deliver that in, in your assessment? In weeks, in months, in years? I would say in months maybe, but let me be clear because I think in this, on these issues one, one has to be very precise, at least from my perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, they do have uh, enough nuclear material for several uh, nuclear warheads already now. Does that mean they have a nuclear weapon? No. Uh, nuclear weapon require many other things, including testing. Um, uh, uh, but uh, uh, the the situation is a serious one, and this is why I have been saying to my Iranian counterparts that the world is looking at them, their neighbors are looking at them. There is a concern in the world, and they must accept and understand that credibility will come through work with the international inspectorate. It will not come from their own um, affirmations that they do not have an intention to have a nuclear weapon. And also, I was pretty concerned a few weeks ago when, uh, when I heard um, very high officials uh, from the Iranian 
government saying that, in fact, they have everything it's needed uh, to put together um, uh, a nuclear device. And uh, so at that time, my reaction was to say, well, if that is the case, maybe there is something they are not telling me. Uh, because in international law, they cannot have a nuclear weapon assembled, disassembled, or in any other way, uh, because they are party to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, unless they decide to abandon that. So I guess a very serious conversation is, is due. Uh, I must tell you that the Vice President of the Islamic Republic has called me um, uh, a few days ago, and we might be meeting soon. I think uh, this is important, and I really hope we can engage at the level and with the uh, substance that is needed. Well, uh, Mr. Grossi, thank you so much for, for joining us, and I hope you'll come back and join us again uh, if that meeting does take place. This has been enlightening. Thank you very much. It has been my pleasure to talk to you today. Thank you. Uh, the Director General there of the uh, I. A -E -A. You're watching Sky News today. Uh, lots more still to come. You can hear my interview with the former US uh, President, Vice President Mike Pence. I spoke to him yesterday afternoon, just before Israel's retaliatory strike on Iran uh, in response to Iran's attack last weekend. His views on how the US should be responding. Welcome back to Sky News Today. Uh, staying with the breaking news, U.S. officials say Israel's launched a retaliatory strike against Iran overnight. Well, Iranian state media say air defense systems were fired in several provinces with reports of explosions being heard. No casualties or damage have been confirmed. Uh, well, this video, just as a reminder, we showed it to you earlier, on Telegram uh, from the uh, Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, 
uh, a branch of the Iranian armed forces, appears to show explosions uh, over the Iranian province of Isfahan early this morning. Meanwhile, Iran's state-run IRNA news agencies said air defense batteries have been fired in several provinces. Flights were grounded in the capital city of Tehran. An Iranian state TV reported three drones were destroyed shortly after midnight in the sky over the central city of Isfahan, close to a major military airbase and close to nuclear facilities. Well, this video from the semi-official Iran news agency TASNIM, uh, which verified by Sky News, shows Isfahan's uranium conversion nuclear site, they say anti-aircrafts, at the facility fired at unspecified targets earlier this morning. Well, uh, earlier this hour, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak gave his response to the attack, saying escalation in the Middle East is not an option. It's a developing situation. It wouldn't be right for me to speculate until the facts become clear and we're working to confirm the details together with allies. You know, we have condemned Iran's reckless and dangerous barrage of missiles against Israel on Saturday, and Israel absolutely has the right to self-defense. Uh, but as I said to Prime Minister Netanyahu when I spoke to him last week, and more generally, significant escalation is not in anyone's interest. What we want to see is calm heads prevail across the region. Well, our political correspondent Tamara Cohen was there in the room. Uh, Tamara, did he expand any further than that on this? He gave one other answer. This was in a question and answer session during a speech about welfare reform. He gave one other answer later on just to reiterate that he had condemned Iran's uh, major attack on Israel with ballistic missiles, which occurred, of course, last Sunday night. And in fact, this speech had intended to take place on Monday, but was moved because of that. But he wouldn't give any further detail on the actual damage caused by the attack or how that factors into Western leaders' calculations about how this escalates further. He said he was waiting to hear more details. We haven't got any diplomatic activity by Downing Street confirmed today. We may hear more about that later. Of course, Western countries while saying that they expected uh, Israel to retaliate, given uh, the rhetoric that's come out uh, from uh, Israeli politicians this week, we're hoping for that strike back to be limited. And so we wait to hear further details about whether uh, they feel that this is what it is. And, and just give us the context uh, tomorrow. What was this event? What was he announcing? Was it a, was it a new big policy or was it uh, just a sort of uh, speech that, that didn't have too much content on it? So there were a few bits of new content. The Prime Minister was giving a big speech about welfare reform, saying that uh, welfare uh, should be a safety net, and not a lifestyle choice. Yes, we've heard that from Conservative politicians before. There were a few solid ideas in there, although none of them to come in immediately. Uh, the one that we've heard overnight was the idea that GPs will no longer give out sick notes and that will be delegated to other professionals. He said he feels that GPs are under too much pressure to agree sick notes and then people never come off them. Half a million people uh, been out of work for more than six months. Uh, he said in a quarter of a million for more than 12 months. Rishi Sunak talked about after the election uh, looking at legislation to take benefits away from people who've been out of work for a year and don't comply with the, with the conditions in their their work assessments, uh, serious benefit sanctions, uh, in other words, and measures to force those working currently less than half of the week to look for more work. He said the context of this is the number of people claiming disability benefits, particularly for mental health conditions like depression and anxiety, has doubled since the pandemic. He says it's costing £69 billion, more than schools at the moment, and it's economically unsustainable. He said he believes mental health conditions are real. He doesn't want to denigrate those who have serious medical issues but he said we can't carry on like this and it's about uh, he said a, a preference for trying to get uh, people back into work and what they can do rather than what they can't do but I think charities and others will have concerns about who will be making these crucial decisions uh, for people who may be waiting on waiting lists for a long time for, for NHS or mental health support. Mark Owen, thanks so much. Uh, well, uh, not much content from the Prime Minister on the situation in the Middle East uh, uh, during his uh, event this morning, uh, but we're going to pivot back to that once again now. It is the top story of the day. Uh, and discuss it with our military analyst, Sean Bell, uh, who's here with me on set. Sean, good morning to you. Morning, Wolf. What's your take on this uh, retaliation? 
I think we were sat on the edge of our seats, weren't we, after this current iteration, the 1st of April, those strikes on the Iranian uh, consulate. Then we were waiting for a response last weekend. There was this 331 missiles came across, and all of a sudden we were going, are we actually on the brink of a, a major escalation in the war here? And it looked like three options for Israel. Do nothing. Very unlikely Netanyahu was going to do that. The other end of the spectrum was in Armageddon, where he launched just as many missiles back, and that would have marked a massive escalation. Or I think, as some of our correspondents talked about, this sort of Goldilocks solution of uh, something in the middle. What we do know is Isfahan was uh, targeted last night. It's an, although we say it's a nuclear site, it's a nuclear research site rather than actually some of the uh, um, major potential of uh, lots of uranium around. Um, there are about 3,000 3, scientists work there. There's also a military airfield there. There's also reports of Tabriz, which has also been um, um, hit, which is right in the northwest up there. That's apparently where a lot of the ballistic missiles are stored and uh, stuff like that. Lots of speculation as to what weapons are used by Israel. I have to say, at this stage, I'm very nervous to get back getting too much into that. We talk about quadcopters. It's very... These are talking about 1,000 miles. This is a long way away, so it's, it's really missile territory, maybe uh, fighter jet territory. And also, when we've seen the footage of Iranian air defences going up, do remember that the Iranians were going to be very nervous. They were expecting something to happen. The very fact that lots of those operators, probably young men, have been firing away into the air doesn't necessarily mean there was something there. I think the three takeaways, though, are no report of major casualties. That was something that would have been a trigger. No apparent damage to the nuclear reactors at all. And it does appear, therefore, our worst fears of escalation have not been realised. Well, on that note, I mean, why would Israel have decided to, to do this strike just, just now, then, this type of strike just now? Well, it's interesting. I mean, only last night I was doing an interview and I, and I was asked specifically, are they going to attack tonight? And he went, probably not, and just shows how wrong we can be. What looks likely is the international community, there was pressure building on Netanyahu not to react. The United Nations were meeting at Brussels trying to put sanctions on Iran, trying to reduce the need for, um, for Israel to react. The trouble is Netanyahu would have looked weak if he didn't do anything, and every day that went by, it was building pressure on to do, to do something. So a short, sharp, surgical strike seems to be what he's done, wants to draw a line, stop escalation, a definite show of strength. I also think timing is interesting because it is Ayatollah Khomeini's 85th birthday today. I don't think it's a coincidence this strike's happened on that date. And then, finally, your take on what this means for that prospect of whether more escalation is coming or not? Well, we've worried about escalation and this it tit for tat. I mean, ultimately, we've got to let the dust settle. What, what, what was being struck? What casualties have happened? Um, Iran has already come out and said they don't see any need for an immediate reaction. I wouldn't underestimate the back channels that were going on here. America almost certainly acting as an interlocutor between the two, warning Iran trying to make sure that the casualties were smaller. There are three positives that come out from Israel, for, though, from this. I think it's worth... Um, first of all, Netanyahu gets to have the last word, which is really important in terms of the local dynamics. Secondly, it does appear as if he's struck targets that were directly linked to the Iranian attacks uh, on that uh, last weekend. And the, second, and the final one, which is really powerful, Iran, Iran launched 331 missiles, largely ineffective. It looks like Israel's done a much more measured strike but has got through. That is a powerful message to the leaders. But it is interesting, Israel's hardliners, even tweeting this morning, were describing the attack as feeble. Mm -hmm. It will not satisfy everybody uh, out there. The dust needs to settle, uh, but it does feel as if this might be the start of an, a de-escalation rather than the opposite. Sure. As always, thanks so much, Sean Bell. Now, uh, in an interview recorded before Israel's uh, strikes against uh, Iran uh, yesterday uh, afternoon, I spoke to former US Vice President Mike Pence about the tensions in the Middle East and how the US should be responding. He said his country should be ready to support Israel in its response to the attacks from Iran last weekend. Iran is engaged in an unprecedented attack directly on Israel. I think the only message uh, that I want my country and allies around the world uh, to send Israel is that we're with you. I think it's important uh, that uh, we make it clear to Iran uh, and to other uh, uh, actors in the region that they sponsor, be that Hezbollah or Hamas, that uh, we, we will support uh, Israel in doing whatever they need to do uh, to restore deterrence uh, and respond to this uh, this truly un unprecedented assault, 300 mm -hmm. uh, missiles and drones on Israel. And uh, uh, I I'm hoping that uh, what whatever the rumblings have been out of the White House, that uh, they've made it clear at the end of the day America stands with Israel.
Clearly, um, unprecedented in size were the missile and drones uh, sent from Iran to Israel, though largely unsuccessful. Um, one of the other messages coming from the UK to Israel has been yeah. to, to take the win, as it were, uh, and in particular enjoy broader Western support again that, that has returned um, largely to Israel. Do, do you agree with that or is that rather a sort of weak message to be sending? Well, I, I, I neither agree nor disagree with it. I, I just think in this moment it would be important uh, that the allies of Israel make it clear that we will support whatever decision uh, the leaders in, in Israel make and whatever action they take that they believe is necessary to respond to this attack. I look, it's just because Iran failed, uh, thanks to the air defenses in Israel and, frankly, uh, the support that the United States uh, and the UK provided with our own military personnel in the region uh, it is no reason to give them a pass. This was uh, 300 missiles and drones fired at civilian populations uh, in Israel. And, uh, but for the professionalism of, uh, of their forces, mm -hmm. uh, and frankly, ours and yours, uh, uh, the result of that could have been devastating. So I, I just think it's important uh, that uh, uh, that we make it clear that uh, that uh, our nation uh, will stand with Israel in doing whatever they believe is necessary. Again, I think, Wilf, the issue here is restoring deterrence. I mean, it's important to remember that in, in the modern era, Iran has never directly attacked Israel. Uh, they've, the, we know they've worked through surrogates, would be that Hezbollah or Hamas or uh, the Houthis, but uh, th this was a this was a completely unprecedented act, uh, and I think we have to respect Israel's right uh, and ability to respond to it as such. W with that in mind, uh, the U.S. has announced this afternoon sanctions uh, on uh, Iran. Uh, they don't appear to target Iran's oil making capacity. I, I wonder whether you think the West should be directly involved uh, in in the response and whether there's perhaps even an opportunity for, for the West to strike key targets in Iran? Well, I, I, think, uh, I think it's important uh, that we support whatever Israel determines that they should do. But I, I, I'm someone who believes that the Biden administration's decision to lessen sanctions against uh, Iran and to, and to not work to enforce the sanctions that have been into effect is has been all part of a policy of appeasement of the Biden administration that has simply emboldened the mullahs in, in Tehran. I, I, I support uh, the economic measures. I think the United States, uh, the UK, our allies uh, across the West ought to be doing uh, all that we can to further uh, isolate Iran economically or diplomatically. But uh, in terms of a kinetic response, I think, uh, I think we would do well to simply support Israel Mm -hmm. uh, in whatever it chooses to do uh, in the wake of this unprecedented attack. The former U.S. Vice President Mike Pence there. More from that interview coming up around 12.30. Specifically, uh, his belief that uh, the aid package going through Congress for Ukraine uh, will pass this weekend. Uh, more from Mike Pence around 12.30. Uh, also coming up uh, on, during the day here on Sky News, Yada Hakim will have a special programme uh, on uh, the Middle East situation at 5 p.m. here on Sky News and uh, a further special episode of her daily show, The World, at 9 p.m. tonight. If you're watching Sky News uh, today, still to come, we'll have more on Israel's retaliation strikes with the former British ambassador to Iran. That's next.
they push the protesters further back here. There's around two or 300 still remaining. I'm Dan Whitehead and I'm Sky News' West of England correspondent. This van goes onto the streets of Plymouth seven days a week, 365 days a year. These facilities at the moment are, are a lifesaver, it's all, it's all we've got. From fishing communities to bustling cities, we spend every day reporting from across the region. I'm going to have nowhere to live for about three or four months. They are coming from the epicentre of what is now a global health pandemic. We were seeing and speaking to young women who were selling themselves right on the high street. Before Brexit, these oysters were being exported to the EU, but the trade stopped overnight. What's your feeling about the future? Bleak. It'll be finished, I don't know. This is the game changer seat. Look, it even comes with binoculars. Fly Emirates, fly better. And welcome back. Uh, more now on the Israeli attack uh, on Iran. Joining me is Rob McCare, former British ambassador to Iran 2018 to 2021, just as the US was pulling out of the JCPOA. It must have been a contentious job um, to have, Ambassador. Thanks for, for, for joining us. My first question is, uh, I guess, your assessment, but perhaps more importantly, what you think Iran's assessment will be of this Israeli uh, response and attack overnight? So I suppose I think there, are, there are two questions, aren't there? One is what has been hit, and the other one is, is, is that it? Is there more to come? And, and those are the questions that Iran will be thinking about. Uh, I, I don't, it doesn't seem to be, we've got a clear picture yet of what's been struck at the targets in Isfahan. Obviously, Isfahan is, is a really important city in, in Iran, um, culturally and historically, as well as industrially. Um, but it is a site for... Uh, nuclear research and development, um, which you're showing on the screen now, uh, and also for uh, defense manufacturing, including of drones and missiles. And if the uh, Israeli attack has been clearly uh, tagged to to respond to the attacks last week by by targeting drone and missile manufacturing sites, that would be that would be a very clear signal that it's that it's directly linked. Uh, it might be uh, a, a signal to be easier then to regard that as a response which draws a line. Uh, if it's an attack on nuclear facilities, which seems to me much less likely, then Iran would typically respond by ramping up its nuclear program because each each step up in Iran's nuclear program has been uh, in response to uh, actions against that program, whether they're sanctions or, or sabotage attacks. Well, so assuming uh, it's the former and that this attack was targeted uh, without major casualties, casualties, without major hits to nuclear facilities in, in a way that could be framed as a specific response to, to the events of last Saturday. Do you think it's likely that Iran won't uh, respond more aggressively, that they are willing to, to try and draw a line under this? It, it's not sort of uh, an easy decision to make. Look, I think it's, it's important to remember that both sides have been in different ways attacking each other um, anyway, and to even before the, the recent uh, escalatory spiral. So it would be unrealistic to expect that to stop altogether, whether that's attacks through proxies that Iran carries out against Israel and Israeli interests, uh, or whether it's um, some of the uh, uh, some of the things that Israel has done against uh, Iranian targets in, in, in Syria or um, even inside Iran before. 
Uh, obviously, Iran, Israel doesn't tend to um, talk about or acknowledge a lot of what it does. Uh, so I think the question is not whether it goes to to uh, no confrontation, because there's already a, a, been an undeclared war going on. What recent events have done is they've brought that war out of the shadows into the open, uh, and they've sort of, in some ways perhaps lifted a taboo. And the main taboo, of course, is the direct strikes from Iran against Israel. Uh, Israel will be absolutely determined to deter anything like that happening again, uh, with both sides seeking to restore deterrence. There's a temptation that both sides want the last word. Uh, um, but also, if I could just say, I think both countries are really good at dealing with ambiguity and using ambiguity. And it may be that it, uh, uh, the Israeli side will want to not make it clear, entirely clear, whether this is the sum total of their response or whether there's more to come. Well, on that note, do you think that, uh, that this will be uh, all that Israel does? I, I don't know. I think there are really difficult calculations going on in both capitals. They're using force to send messages, and they're both looking at domestic audiences and regional audiences, as well as they, the other protagonist in this. It's a very, very complicated chess game that's going on between them with very high stakes. Um, what's your uh, take on, if things did escalate, how things would would play out? I mean, it, it seems on the surface that a very major missile attack from Iran was unsuccessful, whereas a fairly minor one uh, from Israel at least got through in, in part. Uh, is that indicative of, of how things would play out if there was a significant escalation? Well, yeah, you're right. There's clearly an asymmetry in terms of, of missile defences, with Israel having very capable support and also more allies. Um, but both sides undoubtedly have the ability to hurt the other, and uh, escalation could take a number of different routes. You know. It's long been talked about that the, one of the things Iran can do that that, uh, it, that it would affect the world economy is is to seek to close the Straits of Hormuz. Um, the, it, you know, there's there's already a maritime um, tit for tat conflict that's been going on uh, sort of in in a, in a low key way for for um, many months. So um, yeah, I think there is there is a um, there's a range of of options that both sides could take. Um, in an escalation. Um, the, the, the concern, of course, is that no one quite knows what happens in an escalation, uh, and no one knows if others are going to be drawn in. Uh, and there are um, a lot of um, uh, a lot of concerns about uh, Iran and its nuclear program. Um, and uh, j just finally, in, in terms of the nuclear capability, we were discussing that with the uh, Energy Agency earlier on in the show. Is, is that something that you think they could be further ahead than the world knows about uh, in your assessment or not? The fact that the uh, IEA uh, inspectors have, have had less uh, access than they had in the past obviously is a, is a concern on that. Uh, I think the, the outside world watches very closely what Iran is doing. Uh, but there's no, certainly there's no doubt about the fact that Iran has ramped up its nuclear program and has more for some material and more uh, enrichment capability than it has ever had before, which means that it's able to get the material for a, a bomb um, very quickly. And uh, what what Iran will know is that if it makes a dash to try to mm -hmm. try to make a nuclear weapon, um, that successive U.S. administrations and others mm -hmm. have said that would be unacceptable and that uh, okay. no options are off the table in terms of preventing that. Rob, thanks so much for joining us. Rob McKay, the former UK ambassador to Iran. We're out of time for this hour, but uh, ongoing coverage of this uh, breaking story when we come back.
This is Sky News Today with Wilfred Frost. It's 11 o'clock. Your headlines. U.S. officials say Israel's launched a retaliatory strike against Iran with reports air defences were fired and explosions heard. No casualties or damage have been reported in the apparent missile strike near the central city of Isfahan. Reports this morning say Iranian officials have no plan for immediate retaliation. The Foreign Secretary David Cameron is at a G7 meeting in Italy where we're expecting an update from the US this hour. Plus my interview with the former US Vice President Mike Pence and his views on Israel and Iran and Ukraine. And coming up at half past on Business Live with me, Ian King, I will be bringing you all of the latest market reaction to events overnight in the Middle East. The main story this morning, Israel's launched a retaliatory strike against Iran overnight. Iranian state media say air defence systems were fired in several provinces with reports of explosions being heard. No casualties or damage have been confirmed. Well, this video posted on Telegram by the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, a branch of the Iranian armed forces, appears to show explosions over the Iranian province of Isfahan early this morning. Meanwhile, Iran's state-run IRNA news agency has said air defence batteries have been fired in several provinces. Flights were grounded in the capital city of Tehran and Iranian state TV reported three drones were destroyed shortly after midnight in the sky over the central city of Isfahan, close to a major military air base and nuclear facilities. This video from the semi-official Iran news agency, TASNIM, verified by Sky News, shows Isfahan's uranium conversion nuclear site. They say anti-aircrafts at the facility fired at unspecified targets early this morning. Well, uh, about an hour ago, uh, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak gave uh, a short response to the attack, appear appealing for calm. Unequivocally condemned the dangerous escalation that uh, they displayed over the weekend, um, condemned it in the strongest possible terms, and that's why we participated in an international effort over the weekend. Uh, right now, everyone, calm heads should prevail. Any significant escalation in the region is not what anyone needs. It wouldn't be in anyone's interests. Um, but as I said, we're working now to establish the facts and the details of, uh, of what happened overnight with our allies. Our international affairs editor Dominic Wagcorn is in Jerusalem for us this morning. Dominic, uh, good morning again. Calm heads there, the Prime Minister uh, was uh, seeking. Will, uh, will that apply as a label uh, in the eyes of the international community, some of those uh, foreign secretaries that are meeting in Italy at the moment, uh, towards uh, Benjamin Netanyahu with this response overnight in mind? Well, the, the original uh, preference for Joe Biden and others was to not do anything at all. And Joe Biden and his uh, allies said to the Israelis, take the win, saying that there was opportunity in what happened on Saturday when this unprecedented coalition of Western but also Arab uh, allies of Israel uh, intervened and prevented the onslaught of missiles fired by Iran doing any damage uh, in Israel or very limited damage. Um, uh, but that was obviously pushed back against by the Israelis who said that they couldn't let this uh, unprecedented attack, the first direct attack by a sovereign nation on Israel for more than 30 years, they couldn't let that go unpunished because it would set a precedent. It would make future attacks more likely. Uh, and so the Israelis made that clear. And then we heard from people like David Cameron saying, well, if, if there's going to be retaliation, which we think there is, it has to be restrained. It has to be limited. It can't lead to a much bigger escalation into what uh, has been the great great fear all along, ever since October the 7th, that the war in Gaza, what Israel did there in retaliation to those appalling atrocities carried out by Hamas on October the 7th, could then spiral and escalate and expand into a much broader, wider regional uh, conflict. So that, that has been the great spectre haunting the Middle East since October the 7th. And the fear was that what happened in the wake of Israel's attack on the uh, Iranian uh, embassy compound in Damascus uh, and then the counterattack. Uh, using multiple missiles by Iran could lead to an Israeli retaliation that could then plunge the region into a bigger war. So I think at the moment, and it is really too early to say, it looks as though the Israelis have launched what the Allies hoped would be a limited calibrated attack because they've only tar targeted, it seems, one or two uh, places uh, and they have done so in a kind of deliberate way, looking at somewhere like Isfahan, where there are nuclear facilities, where there's a drone uh, factory, where they can say they've attacked Iran within Iran's borders, but it... It looks like it is limited. And the message really to the Iranians is we can strike you where we want. Next time it could be a lot more painful. I think it's also what is reassuring, will be reassuring 
for those allies looking on uh, anxiously is the, the Iranians also are not turning this into a much bigger thing. They had warned before this that the tiniest invasion, in the words of his one Iranian official, could lead to a massive and harsh response. So that sounded as though they would, they would seize on anything the Israelis threw their way to then escalate things further. But the assumption has always been the Iranians do not want a much bigger war. They could not possibly win one against Israel and its Western backers. But also things are pretty precarious still politically uh, back home because of the uprising against the regime that they've crushed but remains a threat. And therefore, all those reasons, there's no real margin in the mullah, in, for the mullahs in Tehran of a wider... Uh, escalation and so the assumption was that if the attack was limited uh, then the Iranians would not overreact and so far the Iranians are saying kind of airstrike what airstrike they're, they're admitting there was some kind of air activity but they're saying move along there's not much to look at here certainly that's what they're saying publicly but it is very early to say the questions remain you know is, is this what happened overnight is that just the beginning of what Israel plans is there more on its way, and exactly how are, the, how are the Iranians going to retaliate? I think it is simply too early to say still uh, what the answers are to those two questions. It's so interesting, Dominic, what you're saying towards the end there. I mean, in terms of the domestic political pressures on the respective leaderships, uh, is it fair to conclude from what you're saying that the pressure to escalate and respond firmly is greater domestically on Netanyahu than on his Iranian counterparts? Hard to call that. It's a very good question, actually. And I think, you know, on the one hand, the Israelis... The Israeli Prime Minister has been torn between... And one commentator said he had to choose between uh, his coalition government, which, which is a pretty uh, broad church. There's Likud, uh, his uh, right-of-centre party, and then there are far-right extremists also in the party. And one of them, Mitamar Ben-Gavir, the National Security Minister, who's regarded as a racist pyromaniac uh, by many people here, his response to what Israel did overnight, even though he's a member of the government, was one word. He tweeted the word feeble. So he will be pressing for more action and others uh, like him. Uh, and there are those who said, as I say, that uh, Netanyahu would have to choose between his coalition in government and this uh, sort of unprecedented coalition that rallied around Israel on Saturday. He may have found a kind of Goldilocks option that won't satisfy Ben Gavir, but uh, it isn't weak enough to threaten Ben Gavir and others walking out of government and collapsing his coalition, but also which keeps uh, the Allies on side. A lot depends on whether anything else is planned and, all, and how the Iranians uh, respond, uh, but he looks as though possibly he has found an option that will satisfy or, or certainly keep all sides on side. On the Iranian side, uh, yeah, they, they have, the Iranian government has its own internal political challenges and I think the biggest one of those is, is what uh, has been the legacy and remains the lasting impact of that massive uprising against the regime, led by women, um, you know, uh, in the wake of the death of Masa Amini, a, a young Kurdish woman uh, in jail. And interestingly, in the last few days, there have been reports of another young Iranian woman dying in exactly the same jail. So that raises the fears of that unrest returning. You know, it's fair to say that with extraordinary brutality, uh, the regime has crushed that uprising. You know, Amnesty International has reported how uh, young girls have been raped um, as a means of repression uh, in jail. There's been no limits to the extraordinary brutality the regime has used to repress and crush that uh, uprising. But the damage has been done. You know, there are Iranians, for many Iranians, this was, these are women, these are wives, daughters, sisters who rose up against the the government uh, and they th believe that they should be given the rights that they've been demanding and effectively that uprising the way the regime has dealt with it has really discredited the regime beyond all repair and so in a sense uh, waging the first direct attack on Israel is a useful distraction for the Ayatollahs but it's also a big risk for them because if it does draw them into a much bigger war with Israel it can't possibly win that and that could weaken the Iranian government back home. So it, it, it explains why they are not overreacting to what Israel's done, despite their rather bellicose warnings ahead of, tonight, ahead of last night. Dominic, stick with us, because uh, we've got some international reaction coming through on one side from the Kremlin, saying uh, that uh, they are uh, studying information on the reported Israeli strike on Iran and they're urging uh, restraint from both sides. Of course, uh, uh, the Kremlin and Russia, one of uh, Iran's major and few significant uh, allies. Uh, also, Dominic, getting some comments coming out of the G7 foreign ministers meeting and we should say we are expecting to hear from the US Secretary of State Antony Blinken uh, any moment uh, now in the next sort of 20 minutes or so we'll, we'll join his press conference of course live when it begins but uh, some of the the, the lines coming across uh, more broadly from the G7 foreign ministers uh, meeting and a statement they've issued they're urging uh, Iran 
uh, and Israel to avoid any further um, escalation. Uh, they are saying that uh, they will hold Iran accountable for its malicious and destabilizing actions in the Middle East. Um, that uh, they're calling for an immediate release of Israeli hostages and a sustainable ceasefire in Gaza, uh, that uh, a full-scale Israeli military operation in Rafah would have catastrophic consequences on civilians, uh, that uh, more must be done to relieve the devastating and growing humanitarian crisis in Gaza. Uh, just uh, scanning through some more of this, um, they're saying they continue to look at ways to use frozen Russian sovereign assets to help Ukraine. Uh, moving on to a separate issue there, of course. Um, just uh, skipping through, Dominic, some of the stuff on Russia and Ukraine, and uh, those were the headlines really on the Middle East. Interesting there um, that uh, while calling for, for no ground invasion in Rafa and uh, wanting to see uh, a ceasefire in Gaza, the, the other headline is that is that they want to hold Iran accountable for its malicious and destabilizing actions in the Middle East, uh, Dominic, and uh, suggesting there uh, that uh, they were the aggressor, perhaps, between uh, Iran and Israel. Yeah, I think, I think what we're hearing is sort of cautious and tentative sounds of relief from uh, allies of Israel, but also uh, from Russia, because the great jeopardy uh, was that we could see this shadow war that's been fought between Iran and Israel for 45 years erupting into a direct conflict. And the beginnings of that seemed to be on Saturday when Iran took the gloves off and fired more than 350, I think, uh, cruise missiles, ballistic missiles, uh, drones at Israel. I think astonishing Israel uh, and uh, also its allies. Uh, and, you know, I think allies will be uh, cautiously relieved so far, and it is still quite early to say, that the region possibly is pulling back from that brink. The way Israel's carried out this attack, as I say, but also the way Iran uh, is reacting to it. You know, for Russia, there's been a lot said about how Russia is kind of uh, wanting on and egging on a bigger conflict here. In one sense, the Gaza war, the, you know, a spiralling conflict in the Middle East, is a very useful distraction for the Russians from what they're doing in Ukraine. It also, you know, it, it reduces the amount of bandwidth that can be spent uh, focusing on the Russians. It distracts attention. It also distracts things like Patriot missiles, a lot of which have been sent here instead of to, to Ukraine, the Ukrainians have said. But on the other hand, I don't think the Russians want to have such a big war that they would have to choose sides. That would be very awkward for them if Iran was to directly fight uh, Israel. Um, that would be a nightmare for them as much as it would for the, for the rest of the world. You know, the priority for the West, though, meeting the G7, uh, is to welcome restraint, if that's what they read uh, Israel's action as, but also to recognise that there's still a huge amount of jeopardy, whatever Israel does and whatever Iran does in response to that. Because this war, ever since it began on October the 7th, has always had the potential to turn into a much bigger all-out conflict. You know, people have said it is one shell, it's one missile away from a much bigger regional conflict. And what they mean by that is if a shell went into a kindergarten in southern Lebanon, fired by Israel and killed a lot of Lebanese children, Hezbollah would feel it has to react, probably, uh, with a much bigger reaction and it has 150,000 missiles it could fire in Israel uh, if it really wanted to take the gloves off uh, itself. You know, equally, a Houthi missile fired into a lat, flattening an Israeli uh, hotel, killing lots of Israeli tourists, could then lead uh, us into a much uh, bigger war as well. So wh whatever goes on uh, in, return, in response to uh, what Iran did and what Israel did to Iran in that attack in April on the embassy in Damascus. This war itself, as long as it goes on for, has the potential to spar into something much bigger. So the priority for, I think, people like David Cameron and G7 leaders is to, uh, to uh, you know, support Israel, to put, keep pressure on Iran, but also to try and de-escalate the conflict itself in Gaza. And one of the reports that I think will have worried diplomats outside of Israel was that the Israelis had kind of done a deal with the White House. They'd said to Joe Biden, we will limit our retaliation against Iran, but you've got to give us a bit of a carte blanche in terms of what we do in Rafah, which is where we understand the Israeli Prime Minister wants to go in harder because that's where he believes the Hamas leadership is based, but where there are two million Palestinians. You know, the great fear for uh, Western allies is that the conflict in Gaza escalates further and then that, you know, for as long as it goes on for, there is that risk of a, a much bigger war spiralling out of it. So there's going to be, I think, support for Israel, condemnation for Iran, but also pressure on Israel to try and bring this devastating conflict in Gaza to some kind of con a conclusion relatively uh, quickly. Great stuff. Dominic Waghorn for us live in Jerusalem. As I mentioned, we are expecting to hear from the US Secretary of State Antony Blinken uh, at the G7 Foreign Secretaries Summit. Uh, that is expected any moment now. We'll join him uh, when it does begin.
uh, live here on Sky News. Uh, well, let's uh, discuss in a, a little bit more detail uh, some of the aspects of the strikes overnight. Uh, our military analyst, uh, Sean Bell's here with me on set. Uh, Sean, great to see you. Talk well, us through your, your assessment of the, the Israeli retaliation. Yeah, it's worth just grounding this, isn't it? We've been, uh, ever since the 1st of April attack, this current iteration of uh, conflict, 1st of April attack, Israel on the Iranian consulate in Damascus, killing 13 people, expected to have some sort of Iranian response last Saturday, 331 missiles, a massive wave of strikes. As a result, we were looking at what does Israel do? It felt like three options. Do nothing, Netanyahu wasn't going to do nothing. The other end was an Armageddon-type option, 331 missiles go back again. That would be the precipitation for a major conflict in the region. But that sweet spot in the middle seems to be what's happened. We do know Isfahan seems to have been targeted overnight. There are nuclear facilities there, but it seems to be a research site. About 3,000 people uh, uh, work there. And likewise, there's reports, although we haven't got them confirmed yet, about Tabriz up to the north, where apparently a lot of the um, uh, weapons, these cruise missiles and uh, ballistic missiles are stored. There's been some speculation at exactly how... Israel has conducted the attacks, lots of speculation about drones, about gyrocopters, all sorts. It's a thousand miles. I think it's very unlikely it's any of that. What we have seen is the Iranian air defence system starting up. Again, that doesn't prove that anything was in the skies. A lot of the Iranian young men who will be manning those will be really nervous. They'll have expected something coming in and they'll be firing at shadows. So I don't think that's any proof. I think the main things we can take away, it appears there's not been any casualties. I'm pretty sure that Iranian television would have put those up had there been then. It does appear there's been no damage to the nuclear capability in Iran. Again, that would be a cause for uh, escalation. And it does fear that our worst fears about potential escalation have not been realised. So, so let's come to that point then, um, to, to round things off. I mean, what, what are the prospects uh, for escalation from here? Well, I think the worry is this sort of tit-for-tat um, um, regime at the moment. I think uh, that will depend on whether there are any more casualties, um, what was actually struck at the time, and is this the beginning of the end or the end of the beginning? And that's the, the challenge here. Iran has already said that he has no plans for immediate retaliation, and I wouldn't underestimate the role of President Biden in all of this, trying to act as an intermediary, knowing that Netanyahu needs to do something, but placating Iran along the way. I think there are three positives that uh, Israel will take away from this, one of which is that they wanted to have the last word. They can say that, but Iran can also say... Yes, there's nothing to see here. Move on, as Dominic said. It does appear Israel's managed to hit some sites that were related to the attacks on last weekend. That will be powerful. But probably for me as a military man, the most powerful is Iran. You launched 331 missiles that largely ineffectively. You provoked us. We have launched a, a precision strike and we have hit our targets. That's a warning for the future. Now, it doesn't placate the Israeli hardliners exactly as Dominic talked about. One of them, the uh, National Security Minister, de described it as feeble, the attack. But these sorts of um, retaliations are never going to satisfy everybody. But the mood music from the Americans and the Iranians does appear that we're avoiding the risk of escalation. Sean, sure. as always, thanks so much, Sean Bell. You're watching Sky News uh, today. Lots more still to come. Uh, the US Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, due to speak at the uh, G7 gatherings of uh, foreign uh, ministers, and we'll bring you that uh, live in just a few moments. further back here. There's around two or three hundred still remaining. I'm Dan Whitehead and I'm Sky News's West of England correspondent. This van goes onto the streets of Plymouth seven days a week, 365 days a year. These facilities at the moment are a lifesaver. It's all, it's all we've got. 
from fishing communities to bustling cities, we spend every day reporting from across the region. I'm going to have nowhere to live for about three or four months. They are coming from the epicentre of what is now a global health pandemic. We were seeing and speaking to young women who were selling themselves right on the high street. Before Brexit, these oysters were being exported to the EU, but the trade stopped overnight. What's your feeling about the future then? Blake, they'll be finished, I don't know. Welcome back. Uh, a reminder of the top uh, story this morning. US officials say Israel has uh, launched a strike on Iran. Let's have a look uh, at some of the events that led to the strike. Well, on April the 1st, Israel struck the Iranian consulate in Syria. Seven of its military advisers, including three senior commanders, were killed. Well, on Saturday, Iran fired 170 drones, uh, over 30 cruise missiles and 120 ballistic missiles at Israel. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu vowed to respond. Uh, and, uh, of course, overnight we did see uh, that response as reported uh, by uh, some of our US counterparts. Well, Sky's international correspondent, Alex Rossi, uh, is in northern Israel uh, and has this update. There are crises on multiple fronts. The fact that the Iranians are saying that they won't uh, retaliate to this does suggest that in terms of the direct con confrontation uh, between Israel and Iran, there may be a chance to de-escalate. Remember, the attack on Saturday by the Iranians was the first time that Iran has fired directly at Israel. But all of the other pieces around the region uh, remain, and that means that things remain extraordinarily tense. I was speaking to um, uh, a former IDF commander yesterday who was saying that, you know, he, he, he could not remember a situation in the Middle East like this for decades. In fact, you have to go back four decades, probably to the Yom Kippur War of 1973, to find a similarly uh, dangerous position. Now, what the Israelis have done with this strike, and remember, it's not, it's not just brute military force, Military power has its own language. And in this, uh, on this point, the strike in central Iran is basically symbolic. It's sending a message that the Israelis can penetrate Iranian air defences. They can get through. They can do so at their choosing. They chose, it seems, if this is a limited strike, not to go out for all-out destruction. But it sends a very, very clear signal. In the same way that the Iranians sent a very clear signal on Saturday, the war that had been fought between Israel and Iran previously is referred here as a shadow war. It's hidden. It's um, fought through proxies. It's fought without um, admitting that you were behind it, whether it's an Israeli uh, assassination of a nuclear scientist or whether it was the attack on the consulate. The Israelis haven't admitted that they were behind that. It happened on April the 1st. But what the Iranians were doing with the counter-attack on Saturday is sending a message that you can't do this anymore. We're with, we are redrawing the red lines. And the problem is, is that those red lines aren't really set out at the moment. October the 7th changed the dynamic of many of the red lines, whether it's proxies, whether it's the direct confrontation between Iran and Israel. And as they are being redrawn, the possibility of miscalculation or accident becomes that much bigger. And the problem is that that could lead to a broader regional war. That is why... The, 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 the time that we are in at the moment is so very dangerous. Uh, Alex Rossi there for us. Well, earlier this week, the International Atomic Energy Agency warned that amid rising tensions between Israel and Iran, nuclear facilities must never be targeted. The United Nations nuclear watchdog has confirmed this morning that all nuclear sites are currently safe and undamaged. Well, earlier, I spoke to the Director General of the International Atomic Energy Agency, Rafael Grossi. We have our teams, our teams of inspectors that are permanently working uh, in, uh, in, in Iran, in all the nuclear sites of the country. And of course, uh, through the night, we were following with uh, great attention, uh, very closely what was going on there. Uh, and of course, we uh, were checking also with the uh, Iranian uh, nuclear authorities as well, uh, getting the information about uh, things as they happened and, and, and uh, fortunately we were able to confirm early this morning that after these uh, attacks there has not been any damage to the nuclear sites. You know that there are many nuclear sites uh, in, in the Islamic Republic of Iran and, and, and uh, most notably in Isfahan 
who which which has been targeted as a place, uh, not, not the nuclear sites, as I was saying. Uh, but of course, it is of a great concern that we are having, and I've been um, urging uh, everyone to exercise maximum uh, restraint in this regard. Let's talk about Isfahan. Do you think that nuclear facilities were not damaged by luck or by design? There was no, there was no attack on the simply like I mean I I, I don't know what the military targeting acquisition was. It's not my my business, um, so I cannot tell you that part of your question. What I can tell you is that there hasn't been any uh, any damage at the site or anything that would indicate that were um, hits nearby or something that could lead you to believe that there was an intention uh, to, to reach these places. Um, is it possible uh, to attack, uh, say, infrastructure that supports uh, a nuclear strike and to do so uh, in a safe way or not? Is that a, a, a possible military uh, aim that's not dangerous? Uh, no, absolutely not. Uh, targeting a nuclear facility, apart from being forbidden by international law, uh, is, uh, you know, playing with fire. The head of the International uh, Atomic Energy Agency earlier. We're well, watching Sky News today. Still to come, uh, Ian, we'll have a look at uh, how the markets have reacted to Israel's strike on Iran. And we'll also join the US Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, live when his press conference begins in Italy. The top business stories live from the Sky News City studio. We'll have a look at how the markets have reacted to Israel's overnight attack on Iran. 
plus UK retail sales flatlined during March, according to figures published this morning. Good morning, this is Business Live with me, Ian King. We start today with reaction to Israel's attack on Iran overnight. Let me tell you what's been going on on the markets. News from the Middle East sent a barrel of Brent crude, which had been falling every day this week, as high as $90.75 a barrel, or around 4%. Brent crude has, as you can see from the screen, given back all of those gains as the day has gone on. The current price, barrel of Brent crude, is $86.61 a barrel. That is currently down just over half of 1% on the session. National gas prices, natural gas prices also saw a slight rise. The main contract was up by just under half of 1% at one point. Over on the equity markets, well, the Asia-Pacific region was still open when news of the attack filtered through and a sell-off followed. The biggest faller in the region, as you can see in the top left-hand corner of the screen, was the Nikkei in Tokyo. That fell by nearly two and three-quarter percent to suffer its worst one-day fall since September 2022. And that completed the Nikkei's worst weekly decline since June of that year. All of the main indices in the Asia-Pacific region were down overnight. Well, here in Europe, stocks have also fallen this morning. Here's the uh, picture right now. All of the main continental European indices are trading to the downside. Here in London, the FTSE 100 is also in negative territory, currently off by nearly two-thirds of 1%, with retailers among the biggest fallers. Well, we'll come back to some more of the details uh, of what's happened uh, in the markets. Uh, just wanted to bring you those uh, updates on what's been going on on the uh, reaction to uh, the Middle East situation. I'll just show you the uh, FX markets as well, because we've seen some safe haven buying of the Swiss franc and the yen. In terms of sterling and uh, the dollar and the euro, the main currency pairs that we talk about on this programme a lot, very, very little change indeed going on there right now. Well, joining me this morning is Sophie Lundy-Yates. She's the lead equity analyst, of course, at Hargreaves Lansdowne. Sophie, good to see you this morning. Very, very muted reaction when you look at things as they were now. I mean, it was very lively overnight, but right now it all feels quite calm. Hi, good morning. Yes, absolutely. So in terms of really what we've seen is as much as things are calm, I would still say there's quite a lot of uncertainty, particularly when we look at what global stock markets are doing. Um, now, the reason that the, the UK has come off quite as much as it has is we have, if you think about it, we have a great deal of exposure to things like airlines um, and the industries that surround that, so things like Melrose, Rolls-Royce, and the airline um, like IAG, who of course own British Airways, mm -hmm. you know, they've really suffered today because this conflict that we're seeing um, really has heightened uncertainty and it obviously affects individual sectors such as the airline in really quite big ways. But what I would say is the language that's being used around this attack, as well as, as I'm sure you're aware, is, is it's a limited attack. So it's yeah. not great news, certainly not. But for now, things are looking relatively stable. But of course, I've probably just jinxed it. <laughs> Let's hope not, Sophie. I mean, the thing is, in terms of Iranian oil production, I mean, it doesn't look as though Israel was... I mean, the, the region that they've attacked is where Iranian nuclear installations are. Iran produces about 3 million barrels a day normally. I mean, the, the suggestion is in the markets it's been up to 4 million barrels a day recently, with a lot of that ending up in China. Yes, absolutely. So certainly it's, it's a very important region when we look at the oil market and oil production, but it's not the be all and end all. Um, so as much as we have seen initially, we saw quite a significant spike in the oil price on the, on the back of all of this. Start, some of that is starting to pair back. So we're, we're back around the $86, $87 a barrel mark, you know, whereas that had gone up to over 88. So we're already seeing a little bit of anxiety coming out. But one extra pillar to that is, of course, that's the supply anxiety. One part of this is there's a demand anxiety yes. as well around difficult conditions in China as well on the demand side as well. And, of course, also, we got those blowout US retail sales figures earlier in the week. It doesn't look like the Fed are going to be cutting interest rates anytime soon. And that has kind of rekindled concerns about inflation and what that means for demand for oil with interest rates at an elevated level for longer. Absolutely. The US is in a really quite difficult position when you when you look at that. The, the inflation figures as well that we're seeing from there, and I know we're hearing this word a lot and we're all probably sick of it, but inflation is incredibly sticky. So basically everything that has been sucked out of the economy and spending has already been done. Um, so what's, what remains is really, really entrenched and that's difficult to get rid of. So there are interest rate concerns there as well as those retail figures as well coming in better than expected. There's a lot of heat in the economy that still needs to leave. What about the FX markets? I mean, the, the main, you know, sterling and the euro and the dollar, very little movement there. I mean, you always get a bit of safe haven buying of things like the Swissie and the yen when uh, you get this sort of geopolitical uncertainty, don't you? 
Yes, absolutely. So I think, you know, you've summed it up really well there. We've seen a little bit of a flight to safety, um, but we haven't seen certainly an upending of, of those markets at the moment. And at the moment, I'm, again, don't want to jinx it, I don't think that we're going to see too much of an upheaval unless we see something really quite dramatic happen on the geopolitical scale over the next couple of days. But for now, relatively stable. OK, so if you do stay with us, because uh, we're going to be talking about wider market uh, stories in a little while, but thanks for now. Let me talk to you about some of the other main news stories around this morning. And UK retail sales flatlined during March, according to figures published this morning. Uh, the Na Office for National Statistics said retail sales volumes were unchanged from February, but it revised higher the February figure from no growth to growth of 0.1%. The strongest growing category during the month was motor fuel, sales of which volumes of which rose in March to reach their highest level since May 2022. And uh, the ONS also said rises were seen in second-hand goods stores, including antiques and auction houses, hardware and furniture stores and clothing. But department store and food store sales volumes slipped during the month. The gaming group, which owns William Hill, said this morning that trading in the first three months of the year had been better than expected. Triple Eight Holdings said this was despite sales in the UK and Ireland in its online betting arm falling by 1% year on year, due partly to heavier promotional activity a year ago around the Cheltenham Festival. Well, betting and gaming revenue in the group's high street betting stores during the period were down 7% on the same period last year. The French contract catering giant Sodexo said this morning it is looking forward to a big boost to trade from this summer's Paris Olympic Games and Paralympics. The company, which employs 430,000 people across 43 countries worldwide, has been chosen to provide meals for athletes during the Games and said today it expects sales growth this year to be at the top of the 6 to 8 per cent range to which it had been guiding investors. Well, Sodexo, which recently demerged its voucher business Pousse, reported an annual underlo uh, an underlying operating profit of 612 million euros for the six months to the end of February. That was up 12% on the same period last year. The French energy technology giant Schneider Electric confirmed this morning it's in talks with the US engineering software company Bentley Systems over a potential strategic transaction. The company, which owns the UK heating control brand Drayton, did not give further details, although Reuters reported last night it could be a possible buyer of the Pennsylvania-based company. Well, Schneider Electric has expanded rapidly in recent years, most notably with its acquisition early last year of the FTSE 100 software company Aviva for just under £10 billion. Pounds. And Norway's $1.6 trillion sovereign wealth fund today backed calls for Goldman Sachs to split the roles of chairman and chief executive. The Wall Street banking giant has come under pressure from shareholders to separate the roles on the grounds that Goldman's size and complexity makes it too difficult for one person, currently David Solomon, to do both jobs. Well, Norway's sovereign wealth fund, which is one of the world's biggest investors, is currently the 12th largest shareholder in Goldman, with a stake of 0.84% worth $1 billion just now. Well, back to the markets now. Let me talk you through some of the uh, wider issues uh, been going on this morning away from the Middle East. As I said earlier on, stocks have fallen in Europe this morning. Here's the current uh, picture in continental Europe. Talking points in uh, Europe today include the French cosmetics giant L'Oreal. Its shares are currently ahead in Paris by some 4.5% after its quarterly sales came in better than expected. Well, here in London, retailers have been among the biggest percentage fallers this morning in the FTSE. That's, of course, on the lacklustre March retail sales numbers. Uh, FTSE off uh, just under uh, two-thirds of one percent right now. In terms of some of those big percentage fallers in the FTSE today, well, I can tell you, JD Sports is currently the uh, biggest uh, faller in the London market, uh, currently uh, off by uh, some three percent or so. Other big fallers to mention... Marks and Spencer off by just over 2.5%. Sainsbury's is off by 1.83%. And uh, B&M European Value, that is off currently as well by some 2%. There are not too many gainers to mention, but you can see one of the main ones on the screen right now. Croda, the speciality chemicals company. Well, that's risen in four of the last five sessions, and it's up again today. 1.5% uh, to the good. Croda shares up by some 9% during the last fortnight. Outside the FTSE 100, well, Zope Foams, which uh, we had the CEO of, the, uh, of that company on the programme a few weeks ago, they're up nearly 5% on a contract win right now. But the hedge fund manager, Man Group, uh, you got a shot of that right now. That is currently off by nearly 5.25% on a trading update. Well, with me still is Sophie Lund Yates from Hargreaves Lansdowne. Sophie, um, very interesting situation in uh, L'Oreal. What was uh, behind that? 
Yes, absolutely. So just for that in context as well, you know, we're talking about how tough the markets are today. So that 4% um, gain, that, that reward from investors is really very significant. And essentially what we've seen is that like for like sales have come in a lot better than expected. So they're over 9% when they'd been expected to be about 6%. Now, broadly, the L'Oreal story uh, has been really quite robust for, for, for quite some time. You know, they are absolutely the world leader in, in beauty. They are benefiting from a number of, of different trends. One of those being this massive pivot that we've had towards wellness and beauty and things like that you know that's really more entrenched now than it has been um, and they are very very good at targeted acquisitions you know they they own an, an enormous stable of brands and they are able to make a lot of money out of them you know they're very accretive and uh, yeah they're doing a splendid a splendid job would be my analysis on, on that one and the market has rewarded them for that today well, it's quite interesting though I mean you look at some of the other trading up I mean Unilever are obviously a big player in beauty and cosmetics uh, so too Estee Lauder which has gone through quite a rough couple of years but even their recent numbers have been pretty good. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would I would completely ag agree with that. I think one one of the things that the market likes about L'Oreal is this pivot towards the higher end of the wellness market. So we look at that two point five billion dollar acquisition of Esop last um, last year. Um, you know things like that. The market's very uh, you know happy about it. Now one thing I would say is when you actually you look at the valuation of L'Oreal, I do think we're potentially looking at slightly dangerous territory. You know it's about thirty two times forward earnings is that valuation. You can pick up mm. some tech stocks for less than that. So you know. <laughs> You know, there are some questions to, to answer there, I think. I wonder whether, I mean, I haven't really seen any explanation as to why Croda has been so strong lately, but obviously it is a major supplier to the cosmetics sector. And we, we have, as you say, had quite a few decent trading updates from that patch of late. Absolutely, that's precisely what's going on. And we know that the market prefers uh, these kind of pickaxes and uh, these pickaxe options, these suppliers into these favoured industries. They're, they're often seen as slightly more defensive. Um, and obviously, there is some, there's quite a wide, you know, what we'd call an economic moat um, in terms of what Croda does. There's not a lot of people that do what they do. Um, so you've got that protection as well. And yeah, the market is, is clearly very. Um, Crow Beauty at the moment, which is uh, which is a nice nice topic to talk about. Yeah, decent uh, company, Crowder. Now uh, closer to home, Triple Eight Holdings. Uh, what 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 did you make of the numbers there? Yeah, so of course we've had a trading statement from them today. They of course own William Hill, um, and revenues actually come in ever so slightly uh, above expectations, which has been really nice to see. You know, the group is in the middle of quite a significant overhaul. They've got new management, a new strategic plan, new targets. You know, after what's been quite a tumultuous uh, couple of years, really. So the the market has rewarded them for for that. Revenue beats today, um, as you say, they're helped by things like like Cheltenham, but there are challenges still to, to traverse. I think the investor base is still going to set them or hold them up against some very high standards, given the troubles that have been going on. And of course, we can't take our eye off the regulatory framework and, and outlook either, because that's the biggest risk, in my opinion. The, the strategy is really curious, isn't it? Because I mean, obviously, this was a pure online gaming business that's bought a traditional high street betting operation. I mean, it's so counterintuitive to everything else going on in the sector. You're absolutely right. And I think, you know, a lot of the rationale there is that there's still a place for some physical betting shops. The problem is, is when there's oversupply. Um, but I would actually agree, you know, that it has to be very, very carefully executed there because the costs associated, the numbers of people that are doing physical betting as well um, is falling. But the argument being that there's a lot of cross-selling potential as well. If you can get them in through the door um, on a high street, then, you know, you have, you have the potential to, to funnel them towards your more lucrative online um, options as well. Um, but of course, it is something that the market I think still needs a little bit of convincing that they're, that they're doing the right thing there. Now, the big story overnight from the United States was the uh, trading update from Netflix, their Q1 numbers. I mean, the numbers surpassed all expectations, but the share price came off a bit. Why was that? Yeah, it seems a bit harsh, doesn't it? You know, we look at this in, in some perspective. So the market was expecting Netflix to have added about 5 million subscribers last quarter. They've actually added over 9 million. And yet, as you say, the share price has, has reacted quite badly. Now, one of the reasons for that is they've announced that they are no longer going to be... Uh, producing numbers on quarterly membership numbers. So that those subscriber numbers are no longer going to be reported on a quarterly basis. That has spooked the market a little bit. But what I would just to say is that that is actually a natural progression. The plan has always been they're going to mushroom the customer base, which they have done, and then provide revenue growth off, off this large customer base through other ways, so price increases, things like this, ad-supported tier. You know, they've talked about sports, they've talked about gaming, and creating these new revenue funnels, if you like, revenue streams. That's the point that we're at now, but we're at an inflection point in this stock and the market is a little bit nervous. All right, well, we're at an inflection point in the programme because we're going to go to an ad break. Sophie, lovely to have you with us this morning. Thank you. Well, still to come on Business Live here. Bees of my soul, you said you would keep it, so where did it go? You 
broke it to pieces, the piece of my soul. You couldn't resist, are you sorry at all? A new campaign from the biggest telecoms company in the Netherlands to stop the sending and sharing of intimate images without consent. This is a really, really important story. Don't go away. Protesters further back here. There's around two or three hundred still remaining. I'm Dan Whitehead and I'm Sky News's West of England correspondent. This van goes onto the streets of Plymouth seven days a week, 365 days a year. These facilities at the moment are, are a lifesaver, it's all, it's all we've got. From fishing communities to bustling cities, we spend every day reporting from across the region. I'm gonna have nowhere to live for about three or four months. They are coming from the epicenter of what is now a global health pandemic. We were seeing and speaking to young women who were selling themselves right on the high street. Before Brexit, these oysters were being exported to the EU, but the trade stopped overnight. What's your feeling about the future? Blake, you'll be finished, I don't know. If you forgot your pyjamas, Emirates has got you covered. Fly Emirates, fly better. Welcome back. The sending and sharing of intimate images without the consent of those pictured blights the lives of millions of people, and particularly thousands of young people, some of whom have even taken their own lives. Well, now KPN, the leading telecoms provider in the Netherlands, has launched a campaign to highlight the issue and the damage it does. It's produced a hard-hitting music video created by the Dutch pop star Mo, which in just three weeks has had 31 million views and six and a half million plays on Spotify. And a UK version of the song called Peace of Me is about to be released. Bees of my soul You said you would keep it So where did it go? You broke it to pieces That bees of my soul Well, joining me now is Yust Varvank. Varvank. He is the chief executive of KPN. Yust, very good morning to you. Congratulations on a fantastic uh, campaign. What was the inspiration for it? Well, uh, good morning and uh, thank you for having me. Uh, the inspiration is that we are, like you said, the largest uh, telecom provider in the Netherlands. We want to grow our business and margins, of course, but we also want to contribute to uh, the Dutch society. And therefore, we started a campaign around a better internet. Uh, and internet is not only about fast, uh, secured, uh, green, 
um, internet, but it's also about a, a more social internet. And uh, like you also said, uh, uh, life increasingly is uh, taking place online, uh, especially among uh, youngsters. And we think it's a big topic on what's happening online. Usually telecom providers don't take responsibility for what's happening uh, uh, over their networks. And uh, of course, we are not about the content on what's happening on our network and via our services, but we think it's a very important topic to make a statement. And that's why we started this campaign. How widespread a problem in, in the Netherlands is uh, the unauthorized sharing of images? Yeah, there's a, there's a number of 60,000 people uh, being uh, a victim in some kind of a way by uh, shaming uh, via internet. Uh, so that's a bit of a big number. And, uh, and uh, uh, sometimes with uh, dramatic uh, uh, results, um, um, it's, it's typically something that's happening uh, among uh, young people. Uh, I have children myself, so uh, I think it's an important topic to, to try to make a statement here and get things in moving. You st how did you get Mo, the uh, pop star, on board? Well, she, she's a very popular uh, singer-songwriter. We approached her and, uh, well, she's young herself and she was immediately touched by the topic. She really thought it was a great idea to, uh, to get involved and uh, she decided to write a song uh, around this. Uh, so we didn't have to encourage her a lot. Uh, our, our team approached Mo and she immediately said yes. So that's how we started. And then we built a great video around it. And I gather she did a lot of research into the topic before she wrote the song. Yes, that's true. She, just, she didn't just start writing a song before she did. I understand she really investigated uh, the topic, the numbers and what's happening in the Netherlands and all, all around the world on the topic of uh, naming and shaming on the Internet. And, I mean, the response has been absolutely amazing. Did you expect such a take-up? Uh, to be honest, no. I was really uh, now surprised uh, by the effect it had in the society, uh, the response of people. I, I, I had uh, thousands of messages from all stakeholders. Uh, almost everyone in the Netherlands has seen the video and the song. Um, it stimulates people to talk about the topic uh, with friends, family or at school. Uh, we observed a huge increase uh, online uh, in discussions about cyberbullying. So it really impacted uh, the society, uh, even uh, led to uh, questions raised in the House of Representatives uh, around the process to legislation around uh, the topic. So it had a big impact, and I didn't expect that. I didn't see that one coming. It is, as you say, it's fantastic. I mean, do, do you think there will actually be legislation in the Netherlands on the back of this video? Well, I'm not sure if it's on the back of the video. I mean, uh, it's a statement we do, and we think it's an important topic. I don't think we can really impact people's behaviour, but perhaps this is helping a little bit. Uh, and uh, as far as I understand, our government is working on legislation around uh, 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 online shaming. Well, that's great to hear. Now, you're all, you've got a, an English version uh, coming up for release in the UK. What do you hope will be the, the response here? Well, it would be great if it uh, uh, would have the same effect uh, as it has in the Netherlands, uh, in Britain. Uh, it's, it's a topic all, all, all around the world, and uh, it's good to uh, wake up uh, younger people uh, on the effect of uh, um, forwarding content to others. So um, that, that is a topic that uh, should be raised in all countries. But what made you think that uh, this campaign would have legs in the United Kingdom? Well, I, I'm not sure if I uh, made uh, a decision there. I think uh, that Mo translated her song in English and that we're launching it now uh, in the UK is Mo's decision uh, first. But on the back of that, I really hope that it uh, will uh, start discussions in the UK as it did here in the Netherlands. Well, let's hope it did. Uh, what, what's the cost to KPM been of this campaign used? The cost? Hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, our spend is uh, in the Netherlands on, on, on the investments is 1.2 billion. So on the scale of bigger things, this is uh, not that uh, impactful when it comes to cost. So creating a video, uh, <clears throat> encouraging uh, Mo to join us is for us not that uh, big of a cost uh, uh, topic. It's more a decision, do we want to make a step into this area? Because telcos never, never uh, worried about the content on what's happening on, uh, on the internet. So that was more a decision. It, I, I've, I, to be honest, I haven't really thought about the costs. 
Yeah. So it's a really, really important point you make there. You aren't necessarily responsible for content on the internet. Do, do you think some of the internet service providers ought to have been taking a lead on this, this subject rather than leave it to a company like yours? Um, well, I think it's a topic for internet service provider to really keep an eye on what's happening. Of course, there's a lot of criminal behavior online and we have a cooperation there to really uh, discourage that and uh, investigate a lot on uh, criminal behavior. And uh, this, of course, is not directly criminal behavior, but I think it's a good topic if internet service providers like ours, we have an internet service provider ourselves, of course, uh, take the lead in the discussion. And, and some of the big social media giants, again, why, why has this been left to you to do? Well, I'm not sure it's left to, to us, but um, we thought let's uh, make a step and uh, start. Uh, hopefully others will follow. Now, while we have you used, you mentioned just now you're, you're currently investing something like 1.2 billion euros, uh, I said. What is, what is the intensity of investment like for your business now compared with how it's been over the last few years? Yeah, usually telcos invest around 15% of their revenues and we do 23-24% currently because we're um, rolling out fiber to the home in the Netherlands. We cover 60% now and in uh, two years time it will be 80%. Uh, we built uh, the best 5G network in the world. Umlaut uh, awarded us a couple of months ago for that. So uh, we're also digitizing the whole company. So that's pretty capital intensive. In a couple of years we will... Um, lower our uh, cap expense uh, because of uh, everything we built. Um, so we are um, building a beautiful future-proof uh, company in the Netherlands and uh, it's leading to growth. So that's the good part. Our top line and margins are growing um, related to that. Very good. Joost, uh, lovely to talk to you this morning. Congratulations again on a really powerful campaign. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. That's it from me for now. Just to let you know that the US Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, is at a meeting of G7 foreign ministers in Capri in Italy. We are expecting some words from him very shortly on events overnight in the Middle East. And taking you through that after this short break will be my colleague, Wilfred Frost. Thanks for joining me this morning. Cheerio.
Good afternoon. This is Sky News Today. It's 12 o'clock. Your headlines. Israel has launched a retaliatory strike against Iran with reports air defences were fired and explosions heard. No casualties or damage uh, have been reported in the apparent missile strike near the central city of Isfahan. Reports from Iran say Iranian officials have no plan for immediate retaliation. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has called for calm in his response to the attack. Right now, everyone, calm heads should prevail. Any significant escalation in the region is not what anyone needs. Plus my interview with the former US Vice President Mike Pence and his views on Israel, Iran and also Ukraine. Uh, good afternoon uh, to you. The main story this lunchtime, Israel has launched a retaliatory strike against Iran overnight. Iranian state media say air defence systems were fired in several provinces with reports of explosions being heard. No casualties or damage have been confirmed. Well, this video posted on Telegram by the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, a branch of the Iranian armed forces, appears to show explosions over the Iranian province of Isfahan early this morning. Iran's state-run IRNA news agency has said air defence batteries were fired in several provinces. Flights were grounded in the capital city of Tehran. And Iranian state TV reported three drones were destroyed shortly after midnight in the sky over the central city of Isfahan, close to a major military airbase and nuclear facilities. Well, this video uh, comes from the semi-official Iranian news agency Tasnim. It's been verified by Sky News and it shows Isfahan's uranium conversion nuclear site. They say anti-aircraft weapons at the facility fired at unspecified tar targets early this morning. Well, Egypt has reacted to today's events, calling on both parties to exercise the utmost levels of restraint. Uh, in a statement, the foreign ministry said the Arab Republic of Egypt expresses its deep concern about the continued mutual escalation between Israel and Iran following reports of missile strikes and uh, marches against sites in Iran and Syria. Egypt confirms that it will continue to intensify its contacts with all concerned and influential parties in order to contain the ongoing tension and escalation. Well, uh, I'm joined now by our Middle East correspondent, uh, Alistair Bunkle, who joins me from Jerusalem. Ali, great to have you with us. Um, uh, as more time has passed since those uh, early hours this morning, have we learned uh, any more uh, firmly exactly uh, whether these were Israeli attacks and uh, the success or failure of them? I think we have to assume there are Israeli attacks because, I mean, the Americans came out and briefed Israel, um, American media saying that they had had forewarning of these attacks. And I think if you just look at the, sort of the messaging in, the, uh, in Western circles, uh, nobody is denying that these were the Israeli attacks that had been threatened for the last five days. There's been no comment uh, from the Israeli government except for the national security minister, the far right, uh, politician Itamar Ben Gavir, who actually described Israel's attacks as feeble. And he would have been one of those in Netanyahu's ear demanding that Israel go in hard at Iran. Uh, in a way, he has actually confirmed, being the national security minister, he has confirmed that Israel was behind this. But there's been no official statement from the prime minister's office or the war cabinet. That's not unusual. Uh, the Israelis don't tend to officially claim any strikes within Iran or assassinations within Iran. And it's possible that in the case of what happened overnight, they don't want to exacerbate the situation further. They don't want to appear as though they're gloating or something like that. So they're, they're keeping quiet about it at the moment. Um, so, you know, as, as the day is worn on, I'll tell you what we haven't seen. We haven't seen any some damage or purported damage to the airbase where the airstrikes were supposed to land. But we have sort of started to get a sense of where Iran is going to go on this. And it looks as though they're going to try and downplay it, even dismiss it, even mock it, really. Uh, and I think that indicates that Iran wants to take the off-ramp. It doesn't want to respond, doesn't want to escalate further. And I think if that turns out to be the case, uh, everyone's going to breathe a huge sigh of relief. Well, uh, Ali, stick around with us uh, because I want to bring in now our international correspondent, uh, Alex Rossi, who, uh, as you know, is in uh, Tel Aviv. Um, Alex, uh, what's the latest that we're hearing as the, the possible response on the Iranian side? 
Well, it's difficult to say. They are indicating at the moment that they don't seek any further escalation. They do say, however, that they are still look looking into what exactly has happened and who was responsible for it. I think the positive sign of it, Wilf, is the fact that both sides can draw what they want from it. From the Israeli side, they can say, well, you know, we penetrated uh, Iranian air defences, we can reach deep into the country, we can strike uh, cities, the third city in Iran, next to their nuclear facilities, and there can be more of that. So they're indicating their strength. On the other side, the Iranians can say, well, this was really a pretty weak effort by the Israelis, didn't do any damage, and we can call, really, a score draw and draw a line under this episode. The danger, though, and this is a danger, really, in terms of the tensions that remain within the Middle East, is that the rules of the, the game, if you want to call it that, are being rewritten. And the danger, when that happens, is of miscalculation, misreading the situation, or perhaps accident. Before this, Israel and Iran were engaged in this shadow war. On the Iranian side, they used what's known as the axis of resistance. These are their proxies, the ring of fire, as they call it, around Israel, Hezbollah in Lebanon, the Houthis in Yemen, uh, militias in Syria and Iraq, Hamas uh, in Gaza. But there was no direct confrontation. Israel, for its part, would carry out airstrikes, which it would never acknowledge, say weapons transiting uh, across the Shia Crescent from Tehran to, to Lebanon or Iraq or Syria, and it would take, take them out and it would continue in that way. The attack on the consulate has changed that because the Iranians have seen that clearly as an attack on Iranian soil. And what they are now indicating to the Israelis is that if you carry out these kinds of strikes, we will attack you directly. And uh, we've obviously seen the Israeli response, and you, you, you it's easy to see how you can get into this escalatory spiral of violence that leads to a far broader confrontation. That really is the big worry. But you are hearing, of course, from countries around the region, uh, Western diplomats, that the aim now will be to try and sort of dampen the fuse of what has happened in this round and de-escalate uh, further. But, but, you know, great danger and jeopardy remains. Ali, to bring you back in from, from Jerusalem, I mean, we are waiting for this press conference. It's due to start imminently with the US Secretary of State, Antony Blinken. It will be interesting to see whether he frames things uh, as this being a significant ongoing escalation by Israel or, all things considered, being a relatively reasonable, tempered response. Well, you know what? I think if he, if he comments um, sort of categorically on either of those things, he's effectively acknowledging, as the US Secretary of State, that uh, Israel was behind this. And I think that would uh, be one step up from uh, currently US officials briefing the US media. I don't think he will criticize uh, Israel. America has stood behind Israel's right to defend itself. What they have been trying to do, though, is influence what Israel was going to decide. And so I think we'll hear from the US Secretary of State as he walks in uh, to this press conference in Italy, America's response to what happened overnight. Let's listen in now to the US Secretary of State. Their wonderful hospitality, but also their remarkable leadership. The G7 is in many ways a, a steering committee for the world's most advanced democracies. And we emerge from this meeting of foreign ministers uh, more united than ever, uh, more united in facing critical challenges that uh, lie before the international community, including Russia's aggression uh, against Ukraine, the conflict in the Middle East, uh, and as well uh, the importance of sustaining, supporting a free and open Indo-Pacific. These and many other subjects were the focus of our conversations over the last two days, which uh, I found to be extremely productive. Uh, and again, what strikes me the most, um, and it, it, you can really see this over the last three years, is the extraordinary convergence um, in our approaches to these challenges, convergence between the United States, Europe, major partners in Asia. Uh, let me touch on some of the most important uh, things that we discussed and concluded over these past couple of days. And of course, I'll, I'll com I commend to you the statement that uh, we put out or will soon be out on the part of the entire G7. Uh, first, the G7 condemned the unprecedented uh, Iranian attack on Israel, unprecedented in scope and scale. Scope because it was a direct attack on Israel from Iran, scale because it involved more than 300 uh, munitions, including 
ballistic missiles. We're committed to Israel's security. We're also committed to de-escalating, uh, to trying uh, to bring uh, this tension to a, to a close. Um, you saw as well, or you'll see soon in the G7 statement, a commitment to hold Iran to account, uh, to account for its destabilizing activities, uh, holding it to account by uh, degrading its missile and drone capabilities. Uh, and yesterday, the United States announced additional sanctions on Iran, targeting UAV programs, the steel industry, companies that are associated with the IRGC, the Ministry of Defense, and its Armed Forces Logistics, the G7 statement makes clear that G7 countries will adopt uh, additional sanctions or other measures in the days ahead. Even as we've been dealing with the conflict in the Middle East and, uh, again, the unprecedented attack by Iran on Israel, we've remained intensely focused on Gaza. We urge the rapid implementation of Israel's humanitarian assistance commitments. More aid, more crossings, better deconfliction, better distribution of the assistance to all who need it. We have seen important steps over the last couple of weeks with more crossings opening, uh, more aid getting in, more aid getting around. But we need to see sustained results. And we need, in particular, to make sure that there is distribution throughout Gaza. We also focused on the imperative of getting to a ceasefire with the release of hostages. Such a ceasefire would facilitate the dramatic expansion of the humanitarian assistance. It would also let Gazans return to the north, those who have been displaced from the north. The only thing, the only thing standing between the Gazan people and a ceasefire is Hamas. It's rejected generous proposals from Israel. It seems more interested in a regional conflict than it is in a ceasefire that would immediately improve the lives of the Palestinian people. It continues to move the goalposts. And the world needs to know and needs to understand, again, that the only thing standing between a ceasefire uh, and uh, the Gazan people is Hamas. The G7 is also very clear in its unwavering support for Ukraine, faced with aggression from Russia. Putin thinks that he can outweigh Ukraine and outweigh Ukraine's supporters. The message coming out of Capri is he can't. Every G7 member is making extraordinary contributions to Ukraine's defense. And as I've said before, this is the best burden sharing that I've ever seen across the Atlantic in more than 30 years of being engaged in these issues, with Europe as well as Asian partners picking up more than their share of the load. Um, I want to particularly recognize Prime Minister Maloney for her leadership, her decisive leadership. Um, we can see two things right now. Together, we are helping to put Ukraine on a long-term path where it will stand strongly on its own two feet, militarily, economically, democratically. More than now 30 countries are engaged in negotiating, and some have concluded negotiations with Ukraine on security pacts. Uh, and together with what I'm convinced will emerge from the NATO summit, uh, you can see Ukraine effectively building a force for the future, one that can deter aggression and defeat it as necessary. We're working to drive private sector investment into Ukraine and also help it develop its own defense industrial base in ways that will provide for a strong, uh, enduring economy. And of course, now that uh, the accession path to the EU is open, that will help Ukraine deep root its democracy. But even as we're doing all of that, uh, we heard clearly from Foreign Minister Kaleba uh, that it's imperative that in this moment, Ukraine get more resources that it needs to deal with the ongoing Russian aggression. It needs more air defenses. It needs more munitions. It needs more artillery. Allies and partners, including the G7 countries, are committed to delivering on that. Uh, we discussed steps to uh, provide more assistance more immediately to, uh, to Ukraine. We also discussed ways to protect and help restore its energy grid which Russia has sought to decimate. Uh, and here again, I think uh, we can see important steps that were already taken, uh, but more to come in making sure that Ukraine has sustainable energy for its people. We're also working to strengthen efforts to disrupt uh, the transfer of weapons 
and also inputs for Russia's defense industrial base. When it comes to weapons, what we've seen, of course, is North Korea and Iran primarily providing things to Russia. But when it comes to Russia's defense industrial base, the primary contributor in this moment to that is China. Uh, we see China sharing machine tools, semiconductors, other dual-use items that have helped Russia rebuild the defense industrial base that sanctions and export controls had done so much to degrade. Now, if China purports, on the one hand, to want good relations with Europe and other countries, it can't, on the other hand, be fueling what is the biggest threat to European security since the end of the Cold War. And you don't have to just take that from me. This is what I heard around the table at the G7. Progress on solutions also to use Russia's sovereign assets for Ukraine uh, was on the, uh, on the agenda. And here, uh, I think uh, we're working on getting to an agreement on that, consistent with international law, consistent with different countries' laws. Uh, the Kremlin has called this theft. The real theft is in Ukrainians' li lives taken, in so much of Ukraine's infrastructure destroyed, in so much of its land seized. Uh, being able to use these Russian sovereign assets to help rebuild Ukraine uh, is critical, uh, and it's also uh, something that one way or another, one day or another, is going to happen. Uh, it's also a complement to, but not a substitute for, the assistance that we all need to be providing in the moment uh, to Ukraine, and in particular, the supplementary budget request that President Biden has made, and that it appears will be before the House this weekend. And again, I just want to emphasize two things. First, this money and everything it will provide is urgently needed by Ukraine, by its people who are so bravely defending their country and defending their democracy. Second, as I said, we have European and uh, other partners, including in Asia, who are doing so much themselves to help provide for Ukraine. And finally, uh, virtually all of the supplemental uh, will be invested in the United States in defense production, in our own defense industrial base. And that means good jobs in the United States. Finally, we focused intensely over these last couple of days on reaching out to new partners. Uh, and this includes in the Indo-Pacific, where we're working to promote a free and open Indo-Pacific. Uh, here, I think it's very instructive that the support that Russia's received from China, from North Korea, from Iran, uh, demonstrates that security in Europe, security in Asia, and other parts of the world are indivisible. They're deeply connected. And this is something, again, that we heard around the table over these last couple of days. Uh, the G7 is united on the need for peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait, the South China Sea, the Korean Peninsula, and also united in standing up to China's unfair and non-market practices especially when it comes to overcapacity, that is, flooding the markets of our own countries with uh, new products and technologies that are um, heavily subsidized and so underpriced, driving our own businesses out of the market uh, and seeking to dominate these markets themselves. Again, this is a, a, a very clear common concern among all of our countries. Uh, finally, the other piece of this is that the G7 continues to work to deepen engagement with global partners to help deliver results everywhere. Uh, we had uh, the uh, chair of the African Union with us uh, yesterday for very good conversations. And what we're really looking at is working in practical ways with countries in Africa and beyond to make clear, tangible, deliverable improvements in the lives of their people, and as a result, the lives of our own people. Um, we have the AU that's now a member of the G20. Uh, we're particularly focused on how Africa can play its rightful role in meeting both regional and global challenges. There's growing collaboration on infrastructure and technology to improve connectivity, uh, to, uh, to build resilience. Uh, we reaffirmed our commitment to sustainable development and especially to the sustainable development goals. Uh, also to reforming the international financial institutions, multilateral development banks, to make them both more uh, representative and more effective and responsive to meeting the needs of countries around the world, addressing issues like climate change, debt, 
food security. So in all of these areas, um, I found the, the conversations and the work over the last couple of days reflected in the statement that you'll see uh, to be extremely productive and also, and maybe most importantly, a very good setup for the leaders that are meet, uh, the meeting that our leaders will have, excuse me, uh, in June. Uh, that's what we're tracking toward. We'll continue the work that we did here over the next, uh, next couple of months, and the leaders uh, will follow up. With that, happy to take some questions. The first, qu the first question goes to Olivia Gazes with CBS News. Thank you very much. Mr. Secretary, there is a lot to ask you about today, so with your indulgence. Um, first, on Israel's strikes in Iran. Was the U.S. indeed alerted in advance? How far ahead of time? And did it raise any objections when it was? Are the strikes now over? And do you have any indication at this early stage via direct or indirect messaging that Iran will respond? And have there been any changes in Iran's nuclear program? On Israel, there are reports that your department has made recommendations to cut military aid to certain Israeli units for possible human rights violations in the West Bank before October 7th. Will you take action on those recommendations? And finally, on the recent U.S. Uh, assessments, you mentioned that China may be growing its support for Russia uh, for its war effort in Ukraine. Do you believe that President Xi is sensing an opportunity amid flagging U.S. support to the Ukrainians? Hmm. Thank you, sir. Great. Thanks, Olivia. Um, on the first uh, question, the reports that uh, you've seen, um, I'm not going to speak to that, except to say that the United States has not been involved in any offensive operations. Uh, what we're focused on, what the G7 is focused on, and again, it's reflected in our statement and in our conversation, is our work to de-escalate uh, tensions, um, to de-escalate from any potential conflict. Uh, you saw Israel on the receiving end of an unprecedented attack, um, but our focus has been on, of course, making sure that Israel can effectively defend itself, but also de-escalating tensions, uh, avoiding uh, conflict, uh, and that remains our focus. Um, again, I'm not going to speak to anything other than to say we were not involved in any offensive operations. Um, with regard to um, the other questions, uh, first, on uh, China and Russia, uh, look, I think that what uh, we're seeing is uh, a product of the relationship between those two countries. You've heard them, them speak to it, uh, including just before Russia's aggression against Ukraine. We've made very clear to China, and many other countries have as well, um, that they should not be supplying Russia with weapons for use in its aggression against Ukraine. We've not seen the direct supply of weapons, but as I said, what we have seen is not only the, the direct supply, but the critical supply of inputs, of components for uh, uh, Russia's defense industrial base, which is allowing two things. It's allowing Russia to continue the aggression against Ukraine. It's also helping uh, Russia overall rebuild its uh, defense forces and defense capacity that um, so much damage has been done to by the Ukrainians, but also by our sanctions and export controls. And that means that not only is Russia a current threat to Ukraine, it will remain an enduring threat to other European countries. And that's why I said China can't have it both ways. It, it can't purport to, to want to have positive, friendly relations with countries in Europe, and at the same time be fueling the biggest threat to European security since the end of the Cold War. Uh, that was uh, very clear from our conversations around the table. Um, I believe Europeans have expressed that and will continue to express that clearly uh, to China in the days and weeks ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, uh, so on that, I think you're referring to the so-called Leahy uh, Law and um, our work under that. Um, so this is a very important law, and it's one that we uh, apply across the board. Uh, and when we're doing these um, investigations, these inquiries, it's something that takes time, that has to be done very carefully, both in collecting the facts and analyzing them. And that's exactly what we've done. And I think it's fair to say that um, you'll see results very soon. I've made determinations. You can expect to see them in the days ahead. For the next question, Oliviero Bergamini with RAI TGI. Good afternoon. Two quick questions. First, do you have the feeling that the, today's strike was limited so that Iran was not compelled to react? 
in that sense, are you optimistic about not a big war break, breaking out? And there is an Iran issue. Do you think that in the future, other countries like Italy that has historical ties with Iran could play a role in the de-escalation and stabilization that you mentioned? Thank you. Uh, well, two things. Again, I'm, uh, I'm not going to, uh, to speak to these reported events. Um, all I can say is that for our part and for the entire G7, our focus has been on de-escalation, on avoiding a larger conflict. Uh, and actually, that's been true since day one uh, after the horrific events of October 7th. Uh, a big part of our approach has been to prevent the conflict from spreading, to avoid escalation everywhere. Uh, and that's uh, a common policy across the G7. And it's uh, very much our approach now. So we've been engaged in efforts to avoid escalation. Those efforts will continue. Italy plays a critical role in this uh, as, a, as a leading country. Uh, as a country that's engaged uh, around the world with many other countries that have their own relationships with countries involved in the Middle East. Uh, uh, Italy has its own direct engagements. And I think what we've seen over the past uh, 10 days or so, a couple of weeks, is that those engagements um, have been and remain very important to keeping things calm, to avoiding escalation, to preventing a larger conflict. Italy is an important player in this. Nadia Bilbasi with Al Arabiya. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I want to pursue again on the Iran question. It seems that both the Iranian and the Israeli responses were measured and calculated. Um, would you say that now we are averting a major confrontation and a possible war? And what messages would the U.S. played in sending to both sides to, for restraint? And are we back to the proxy war? And if, uh, if you allow me on Rafah, um, the U.S. position is very clear. You are opposed a military operation in Rafah as long as there is no plan to evacuate one and a half million Palestinian civilians. The Israeli government is adamant to go ahead. What is your understanding of the plan now, and what is acceptable for the U.S.? Mm. And finally, on the U.N. Security Council, the United States looks isolated yesterday. Uh, your allies, close allies, France, Japan, and South Korea, both voted for admitting Palestine as a member. The Israelis, including Netanyahu, on the record saying they oppose two-state solution. So what is the path forward, and what message do you give to Palestinians and to moderates in the region if you truly want to isolate extremists? Thank you. Good. Thanks very much for the questions. Uh, let me simply, first of all, repeat what our focus has been and what it remains. De-escalation, avoiding conflict, and so yes, calling on all concern to uh, exercise restraint. That's what we've been doing uh, over the, uh, the last couple of weeks. And as necessary, that's what we'll continue to do. And again, that's reflected in the statement that you'll see coming from all of the G7 countries. Um, on Rafa, we uh, have been very clear about this. President Biden's been very clear about this. Uh, we cannot support a major military operation in Rafa. First, there are currently somewhere around 1.4 million people in Rafah, many of them displaced from other parts of Gaza. Uh, in the first instance, it's imperative that people uh, are able to get out of the way of, uh, uh, of any conflict. Uh, and doing that, getting people out of harm's way, is a monumental task uh, for which we've yet to see uh, a plan. And not only getting them out of harm's way, making sure that they can be supported with humanitarian assistance if they're out of harm's way. Uh, but second, even if people are largely out of harm's way, inevitably there's going to remain a pretty significant civilian population in Rafah. And we believe that a major military operation with a large presence of a civilian population uh, would have terrible consequences for that population. Uh, we are committed, uh, as Israel is, to ensuring that Gaza cannot be controlled uh, by Hamas. We've seen the devastation and destruction that have resulted from Hamas's uh, leadership and the actions that it's taken. Uh, and well before October 7th, um, what it was providing, or rather not providing, for the Palestinian people made clear that its concern had nothing to do with the Palestinian people and everything to do with its objectives to uh, destroy Israel. Uh, so making sure that Hamas cannot repeat the events of October 7th 
that's something that we uh, were uni united in. But in terms of major military operations in, in, uh, in Rafah, it's something that we don't support, and we believe that the objective can be achieved by other means. We've been engaged in conversations at senior levels with Israel over the past couple of weeks on this, including as recently as this week. Those conversations continue. Uh, finally, on the UN Security Council resolution. First, we are committed, the United States is committed to achieving a Palestinian state. We believe that that is vital to having long-term, sustainable, durable peace and security. And of course, it's the only way to fulfill the aspirations, the rightful aspirations of the Palestinian people. But getting to that, achieving that state has to be done through diplomacy, not through imposition. And the resolution that was voted at the Security Council will have no effect on actually moving things forward and achieving a Palestinian state. Again, that can only be accomplished uh, by diplomatic means. It's also important to, to point this out. Under, under United States law, um, even if we had wanted to vote for this resolution, had we done so, under our law, it would have obligated us to cut off all of our funding to the United Nations. Clearly not in the interests of anyone, uh, including the Palestinians, particularly given uh, the contributions we make to programs that are vital to them. But as I said, we're committed to working to achieve a Palestinian state with the necessary guarantees for Israel's security. Um, and we've been working on that, including as part of the potential normalization process between Israel and Saudi Arabia, something that we've intensely engaged on uh, over the last several months and, uh, and, and weeks. So you can see uh, an important path forward that, that's there. Uh, and in fact, we saw it uh, in the wake of the unprecedented Iranian attack on Israel. You can see for Israel a future where a coalition of countries are working together, working together to deal with the Iranian threat and to isolate it, with Israel that's integrated into the region, with normal relations with its neighbors, and a resolution to the Palestinian question, which is necessary to really um, deep root and, uh, and achieve that coalition. Um, that's an incredibly powerful future. It answers what Israel has long sought, which is to have normal relations throughout the region. It deals with the single biggest threat to Israel's security, and for that matter, to the security of most countries in the region, and our own, which is Iran uh, and its proxies. But to get there, it's going to require calm in Gaza, and it's going to require a clear pathway to a Palestinian state. So, we see that as one of the best ways to actually achieve results. Um, again, you can put something down on a piece of paper and wave it around, it has no effect. What does and can have an effect uh, is actual diplomacy, working to achieve these agreements and then delivering concrete results. That's what we're focused on. Finally, I would say this. Um, also take a look at the G7 statement today. Uh, which, shows, uh, which shows unity on this question. It says that there's going to be a proper time, a rightful time for recognition. This is not that time. We need to do the diplomacy. We need to do uh, the hard work to bring uh, parties together, to bring the region together, and to demonstrate that there's a much better future that awaits everyone if they follow this path. And for the final question, Jessica Parker with BBC. Uh, thank you, Jessica Parker, BBC News. Um, if I can first ask, why won't you address events that have happened overnight? Isn't it important that you do so? Can you tell us if you've spoken to your Israeli counterparts? And I'm interested to know how you would characterize the US-Israel relationship right now. And if I can, on Ukraine as well, hopes are obviously rising. The US may pass this $60 billion aid package for Ukraine, but given the amount of time it's taken, given the situation in Ukraine, is it coming too late? Good. So I'm going to be incredibly boring and not make your day by saying, again, I'm not going to speak uh, to what's been reported, other than to say that the United States has not been involved in any offensive operations. The United States, along with our partners, will continue to work for de-escalation. Um, on Ukraine, most important thing is getting this aid voted. 
and moving it forward. And it will, um, I know, make a profound difference and make a profound difference almost right away in making sure that Ukraine has what it needs to defend itself effectively against the ongoing Russian aggression. No. Is it too late? No. If it happens now, uh, it's not too late. If it doesn't happen um, or takes a lot more time, there is a real risk that, yes, it will be too late. And you've heard others speak to it, um, including the Secretary of Defense. Now, would it, have been, uh, would it be better if that aid had, had been voted months ago? Absolutely. But in terms of meeting U uh, Ukraine's urgent needs, <laughs> uh, it's incredibly timely to get it done right away this weekend. Uh, so I'm convinced and uh, our, all of our experts are convinced that it can and will make a usually important material difference in the success of, of Ukraine's defense uh, and the success in uh, repelling the Russian aggression. But if this, um, if this continues to linger, yes, there is a, there is a real risk that it, we'll get to a point where it's simply too late. Um, we uh, are engaged on a regular, pretty much daily basis. And we're committed to um, helping Israel defend itself uh, and, as necessary, uh, participating in its defense, as you saw uh, just a few days ago, and uh, as you saw not only from us, but from a number uh, of other countries. Um, again, Israel makes its own decisions, but we have a commitment to uh, defending it. And you saw an unprecedented attack from Iran into Israel and the United States and others working with Israel to uh, make sure that that attack would not have uh, devastating consequences, and thankfully uh, it did not. But on all of these issues, whether it's relationship with Iran, whether it's the uh, conflict in Gaza, whether it's uh, Lebanon, uh, you name it, we're in uh, constant engagement with Israel, just as we're in constant engagement with uh, allies and partners throughout the region and around the world. This is a collective effort to try to manage the, uh, the conflict in, um, in the Middle East, to bring the, uh, the conflict in, in Gaza to a close, uh, to achieve a, uh, a ceasefire and the release of hostages. And by the way, uh, a number of other countries around the table today also have hostages in, um, in Gaza held by Hamas and other, and other, uh, and other groups. Uh, and it's also important to, re to remember because uh, I, I sometimes think that uh, people have forgotten this. We have American hostages, American hostages, who've been held in the most deplorable conditions all of this time. So uh, all of us are working on all of these issues. And what's so important and what's reflected in the G7 statement is we're doing it together. And my belief is that our collective influence, uh, our collective diplomacy can make a real difference, uh, first of all, in ending the uh, the conflict in Gaza, ensuring that Hamas can never repeat October 7th, getting that, uh, that ceasefire, the release of hostages, uh, a major expansion in humanitarian assistance, and then uh, turning the corner for the people of Gaza so that uh, we can help rebuild uh, their lives, their livelihoods. And, as I said, deal with the critical uh, long-term issues to enduring peace and stability, including a Palestinian state. Thank you. Thank you all. The U.S. Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, there wrapping up his press conference uh, following the foreign minister's meeting uh, in Capri, Italy, saying he wasn't going to speak to whether Israel warned the U.S. of its overnight uh, response in advance, just that the U.S. was not involved in any offensive uh, action. He said that the U.S. continues to work to de-escalate the situation in the Middle East. Uh, he did explicitly condemn, though, the Iranian attack on Israel of last Saturday, both its scope uh, and scale, uh, clearly not specifically addressing even that there was an attack overnight uh, in response by Israel on Iran. Uh, as it uh, relates to the situation in Gaza, he says the only thing standing between uh, the uh, Gaza people and a ceasefire is Hamas. Uh, on the flip side, he did say, we cannot support a major military operation uh, by Israel in Rafah. Uh, he expresses unwavering uh, support for Ukraine and uh, did say uh, that China is sharing machinery, uh, industrial machinery and semiconductors with Russia and is the primary supporter 
of the Russian defence industrial base as th things stand. A wide-ranging uh, press conference there from the US Secretary of State. Delighted to say that uh, to discuss the implications of it is joining us now is General Lord Richard Dannett, the former chief of the British, uh, uh, of the General Staff in the British Army, uh, of course now a member of the Lords. Lord Dannett, great to see you. Thanks for joining us. I, I want to go back, first of all, to military capability uh, and the attacks, of course, that we've seen both last Saturday uh, and overnight. Is it fair to draw a conclusion from that, that uh, if things did escalate, Israel, Israel would be in a, in a much stronger position than Iran? Well, from a defensive point of view, um, I think what we saw Saturday night, Sunday morning, is that Israel, with the help of its allies, is in a good position to protect itself. Um, somewhere over 300 missiles, drones and whatever, attacking uh, Israel with very limited effect uh, as far as the Iranians are concerned. So, so there's no doubt that um, Israel is quite capable of defending itself. And of course, by the same token, uh, it has got um, some sophisticated offensive capability. I think the interesting thing about what we know and what we don't know of what's happened in the last 12, 18 hours or so is that it would seem that uh, whatever strike Israel has mounted in retaliation towards Iran has been very limited in its scope and probably limited in its scope by design. And I think that says uh, a lot about the international calls and pressure on Israel to show restraint. It, it does. I, I also wonder, based on that press conference from Anthony Blinken, where he didn't even really acknowledge that there was anything that happened overnight, but he did once again reiterate his uh, clear uh, condemnation for the Ira Iranian attack on Israel uh, of last Saturday, that uh, this Israel response overnight didn't go too far to turn the West uh, against uh, Israel once again? Well, I think you're right. I think there's a balancing act going on here. Um, in uh, Tel Aviv, as far as Netanyahu is concerned. Uh, he's under pressure from the more extreme elements in his cabinet to retaliate, to give it back to Iran in the same way that they took it, albeit unsuccessfully, Saturday night, Sunday morning. So I think he felt he had to do something. But equally, he knows that he's got to keep support from the West, particularly support from the United States. So I think he's tried to calibrate uh, what he was going to do and what he was not going to do. And that's what we've seen uh, in the last 12, 18 hours or so. Um, in, in terms of the, uh, the likely steps from here, in, in your assessment of various uh, military uh, exchanges through the years, do you think de-escalation from here is possible, is even likely, or will Iran be forced to respond in some way? Well, if we listen and take at face value what appears to be coming out of Tehran, they say that they want to draw a line under this. And, and I think that's actually understandable and perfectly reasonable. Yes, of course, we know that Iran is the sponsor of Hamas, the Houthis and Hezbollah. And actually, that means that uh, Iran holds quite a lot of the cards in terms of being able to dial this up or dial this down. I can pull the strings on any of those terrorist organizations uh, directly or through the IRGC if it chooses to do so. And I think the judgment in Tehran is that it's not in their interest to provoke a major conflict at this stage with the United States. So I think they've done what they've done, and I think they'd, they would quite like to draw a line under this at the present time. And frankly, Netanyahu and the Israelis would be very well advised to do the same, and for them to focus back on trying to complete their operation in Gaza in the way mm. that they want to do it, bearing in mind world opinion, which is that we don't want to see mm -hmm. a genocide uh, in Gaza. We want to see aid getting through. We don't want to see millions of starving people. So that's the balance that uh, Israel has got to strike to try and finish off and diminish Hamas, but also not incur the world's wrath about promoting a famine and starvation in Gaza. Lord Dannett, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, we appreciate it. Well, we got the view uh, just before Lord Dannett from the Democrat side from the U.S. government and Anthony Blinken. Now for a view uh, from the Republican side in the U.S. Yesterday afternoon, before the overnight response from Israel, I spoke to the former U.S. Vice President Mike Pence and started by talking about tensions in the Middle East. Iran is engaged in an unprecedented attack directly on Israel. I think the only message uh, that I want my country and allies around the world uh, to send Israel is that we're with you. I think it's important uh, that uh, we make it clear to Iran uh, and to other uh, uh, 
actors in the region that they sponsor, be that Hezbollah or Hamas, that uh, we, we will support uh, Israel in doing whatever they need to do uh, to restore deterrence uh, and respond to this uh, this truly un unprecedented assault, 300 mm -hmm. uh, missiles and drones on Israel. And uh, uh, I I'm hoping that uh, what whatever the rumblings have been out of the White House, that uh, they've made it clear at the end of the day, America stands with Israel. C clearly um, unprecedented in size were the missile and drones uh, sent from Iran to Israel, though largely unsuccessful. Um, one of the other messages coming from the UK to Israel has been yeah. to, to take the win, as it were, uh, and in particular enjoy broader Western support again that, that has returned um, largely to Israel. Do, do you agree with that or is that rather a sort of weak message to be sending? Well, I, I, I neither agree nor disagree with it. I, I just think in this moment it would be important uh, that the allies of Israel make it clear that uh, we will support whatever decision uh, the leaders in, in Israel make and whatever action they take that they believe is necessary to respond to this attack. I look, it's just because Iran failed, uh, thanks to the air defenses in Israel and, frankly, uh, the support that the United States uh, and the U.K. provided with our own military personnel in the region uh, it is no reason to give them a pass. Uh, this was uh, 300 missiles and drones fired at civilian populations uh, in Israel. And, uh, but for the professionalism of, uh, of their forces, mm -hmm. uh, and frankly, ours and yours, uh, uh, the result of that could have been devastating. So I, I just think it's important uh, that... Uh, uh, that we make it clear that uh, that uh, our nation uh, will stand with Israel in doing whatever they believe is necessary. Again, I think, Wilf, the issue here is restoring deterrence. I mean, it's important to remember that in the, in the modern era, Iran has never directly attacked Israel. Uh, they've, the, we know they've worked through surrogates, would be that Hezbollah or Hamas or uh, the Houthis, but. Uh, th this was a this was a completely unprecedented act, uh, and I think we have to respect Israel's right uh, and ability to respond to it as such. W with that in mind, uh, I wonder whether you think the West should be directly involved uh, in in the response, and whether there's perhaps even an opportunity for for the West to strike key targets in Iran. Well, I, I think. Uh, I think it's important uh, that we support whatever Israel determines that they should do. But I, I, I'm someone who believes that the Biden administration's decision to lessen sanctions against uh, Iran and to, and to not work to enforce the sanctions that have been into effect has, has been all part of a policy of appeasement of the Biden administration that has simply emboldened the mullahs in, in Tehran. I, I, I support uh, the economic measures. I think the United States... Uh, the U.K., our allies uh, across the West, ought to be doing uh, all that we can to further uh, isolate Iran economically or diplomatically. But uh, in terms of a kinetic response, I think, uh, I think we would do well to simply support Israel mm -hmm. uh, in whatever it chooses to do uh, in the wake of this unprecedented attack. I wanted to move on, uh, Mr. Vice President, to uh, in particular... Uh, Ukraine and issues that, that might arise in Congress this weekend. I was listening to your um, comments to the German Marshall Fund just now in Brussels. One phrase struck me. You said, weakness arouses evil. Is there a portion of your party that doesn't understand that, doesn't agree with that right now? I have, I have uh, great concern, and in my campaign for president last year expressed uh, my concern of a rising tide of uh, Republican isolationism in America. And, on the right, there are many uh, that are frustrated with the crisis at our border, with record inflation, uh, and they believe that uh, America needs to choose between being leader of the free world and solving our problems at home. My, my view is anyone who thinks that we can't solve our problems at home and, and lead the free world has got a pretty small view of the greatest nation on earth. We can do both. Uh, and in this dire moment in Ukraine, uh, in this... Uh, uh, and the widening threats against our cherished ally uh, Israel uh, and with China continue to menace across the Asia-Pacific. I think now more than ever, 
uh, the United States needs to embrace our role as leader of the free world, and I believe come this weekend on Capitol Hill, uh, we'll renew our commitment to providing that leadership uh, to the West. I mean, clearly Speaker Johnson's comments in just the last 24 hours seemingly show a, a change in view from him personally. If it, it cost him the speakership ultimately, should he press ahead with trying to get this bill over the line this weekend? Well, I think Speaker Johnson for some time has made it clear that uh, he understood the threat that Vladimir Putin represents uh, should he overrun Ukraine. And uh, his support for Israel's willingness to stand up to China has been a part of his record. But I, I, I want to commend Speaker Mike Johnson uh, for showing the moral courage to uh, stand strong and to move these important bills to the floor of the Congress this week. Not just, not just support for Ukraine and for Israel and for Taiwan, but also a measure that we've strongly supported, and that is forcing the sale uh, of TikTok, uh, a social media platform controlled by the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, forcing the sale in the United States, I think, is enormously important. It's, again, part and parcel of standing up to China. So I, I, I commend Speaker Johnson for his leadership. I, I, uh, uh, I understand the political currents and the pressures within his own conference uh, and on Capitol Hill, but I expect you're going to see that, uh, that leadership uh, uh, acquitted this weekend when uh, the Congress, through the House and the Senate, uh, send a measure to uh, the president's desk uh, that will reaffirm uh, our commitment to stand strong in Eastern Europe, uh, stand with Israel, and mm -hmm. uh, stand up to China in, in material ways and, and in ways that bear upon the privacy of the American people. Well, we will certainly be monitoring that all, all weekend, as I'm sure will uh, people in Ukraine, people in Russia, and probably in China too. W what is your view as to the message China might have taken by the way that West has dealt with the Russia invasion of Ukraine initially might it have sent a shiver down their spine and more recently uh, would they have been licking their lips a little bit at the disunity? Well, you, I think it's important to recognize that there is a new axis of evil in the world and the relationships and the mutual cooperation and support between Russia and China and Iran and North Korea uh, represents uh, a, a real threat to the peace and stability of the wider world. And, Wolf, I have no doubt that China's been watching what's happening in Ukraine very carefully. And, and if, uh, if the West were to falter, if America was to falter uh, in our commitment to support the military in Ukraine and Vladimir Putin were able to overrun that country, I, uh, I, I have no doubt that that would embolden Beijing. Uh, on its own ambitions in the Asia-Pacific. It's, uh, as Ronald Reagan said some 40 years ago, standing at Point du Hoc, uh, isolationism has never and will never be the answer uh, to authoritarian regimes uh, with territorial ambitions. I think by standing firm in Ukraine, uh, we'll, we'll not only do our part uh, to ensure the sovereignty and ongoing vitality of that nation and its freedom, but we'll also send a deafening message to China that America, UK, and the free world will not tolerate authoritarian regimes redrawing international mm -hmm. lines by force. Um, you know President, uh, former President Trump better, better than most, and you know his views towards NATO better than most. Uh, we both know how sometimes he, he says a little bit more than, than he thinks. What do you think, if he won another term, would be his actions towards NATO? I'm very proud of the fact that in our administration, uh, we, uh, uh, we stood firm on our historic alliance, now 75 years in the making in NATO, but we also, we also demanded that our NATO allies uh, live up to the promises that we've made to one another. I mean, when we came into office, I think there were two NATO countries, Wilf, that actually were meeting their 2% commitment. Uh, of spending that amount of their GDP on our common defense. By the time uh, we left, it was many multiples of country and $140 billion mm -hmm. in our common defense being spent. So I, I would expect uh, if, uh, if the former president uh, earns another term, uh, he'll come in with an equal expectation uh, that, our, uh, that our, our allies and partners in NATO live up uh, to their commitment to our mutual defense. Uh, but I truly do believe that the American people, uh, regardless of the outcome of the election, uh, will demand that the leaders of our nation stand by that historic alliance and, 
and discharge our role as leader of the free world. Are you concerned about the type of people that will serve uh, alongside uh, if he wins President Trump in, in a new term? I mean, presumably you wouldn't return, um, uh, given what you've said on the campaign trail previously. And, and does that worry you of the caliber, perhaps, is the right word to use of the people that will end up in his cabinet or not? Well, I, I'm, I'm spending most of my energies focused on the policies themselves. Um, I mean, honestly, the, uh, I've, I've made it clear that, that uh, I, I will not endorse Donald Trump uh, in this election year. I could never vote for Joe Biden. Uh, he's weakened America at home and abroad. But my, my differences with the president have to do not just uh, with the day that I discharged my duty under the Constitution uh, to see to the peaceful transfer of power, but also I've, I've, I've seen the president signaling an uncertain degree of support uh, for uh, 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 our, our allies in Ukraine. I've, I've, I've seen the president uh, 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 preparing to walk away from uh, a national debt that is now the size of our nation's economy. I've seen the president now shy away from a strong stand on the sanctity of life. So uh, in the coming months, I'm going to focus my energies on uh, what I believe the vast majority of Republicans and a majority of Americans believe, and that's a traditional conservative agenda. We'll continue to advance that and uh, and hope whatever the outcome of the election that uh, uh, that will will drive those issues and that agenda to the fore. So, so you're not going to cast your vote? <laughs> well, I'll be voting and uh, I'll, I'll keep my vote to myself, which has always been uh, my practice. Uh, but uh, I understood uh, people were curious after I'd run for president and some of the differences the president and I had on issues where I might come down. And so I've made it clear that, uh, that while I will not be endorsing Donald Trump, I certainly, I certainly would never vote for Joe Biden. I honestly think, uh, I honestly think uh, the crisis at our border, mm -hmm. uh, record inflation, the disastrous withdrawal from Afghanistan, uh, it, is, it is my uh, hope uh, and desire uh, that uh, we'll, we'll have new leadership in this country, but the vote that I cast will be my own. The former U.S. Vice President Mike Pence speaking to me late yesterday there. Lots more still to come here on Sky News today. Up next, it is Yada Hakim live from Jerusalem and Sam Washington.
You're watching Sky News. It's 1 o'clock in the UK, 3 p.m. here in Jerusalem. I'm Yalda Hakim. The headlines. Israel's retaliation and attack on Iran overnight, with reports that their air defences were fired and explosions heard. So far, no casualties or damage reported in the apparent missile attack near the central city of Isfahan. Iranian officials say they have no plan for immediate retaliation for now. The global response G7 leaders are meeting in Italy with a call for all parties to prevent further escalation in the region. We're committed to Israel's security. We're also committed to de-escalating, uh, to trying uh, to bring uh, this tension to a, to a close. At home, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has also called for calm in response to the attack. Right now, everyone, calm heads should prevail. Any significant escalation in the region is not what anyone needs. Welcome to Jerusalem. I'm Yalda Hakim. We've been waiting for an Israeli response to last weekend's ex uh, extensive, uh, if mostly ineffective, aerial attack from Iran. Well, in the early hours of this morning, uh, it appears that response arrived. There has been no confirmation yet from Tel Aviv, but U.S. officials say Israel launched a retaliatory strike against Iran overnight. Iranian state media say air defense systems were fired in several provinces with reports of explosions. So far, no casualties or damage has been confirmed. Well, this video posted on Telegram by the Islamic Revolutionary Guard, a branch of the Iranian armed forces, appears to show explosions over the Iranian province of Isfahan early this morning. Iran's state-run IRNA news agency uh, said air defense uh, batteries were fired in several provinces. Flights were grounded in the capital city of Tehran, and Iranian state TV reported three drones were destroyed shortly after midnight in the sky over the central city of Isfahan, close to a major military air base and nuclear facilities. This video from a semi-official Iran news agency, Tazneen, verified by Sky News, shows Isfahan's uranium conversion nuclear site. Uh, they say anti-aircraft uh, guns at the facility fired at unspecified targets early in the morning. Well, let's bring in our international affairs editor, Dominic Waghorn, for more analysis live here uh, in Jerusalem. Um, Dom, just bring us up to date. We've just uh, given a sense to the audience of what happened, but it was in the early hours of this morning, about four o'clock in the morning in Iran. Yes, but it's, it's really unclear as to what happened, and we don't have much hard evidence as to, as to what happened. We have the word of the Iranians who say they shot down a number of drones. Most recently, they also uh, said um, a, a General Slaviash Mahandust Army Senior Commander in Isfahan, which is the, the area where we think the attack happened. Uh, he, says, he says the sound heard earlier in the morning today in Isfahan was not an explosion. It was our powerful air defence firing at a suspicious Object. Now, we've not had any confirmation from the, from the Israelis that this happened, except for the National Security Minister, um, Itamar Ben-Gavir, uh, putting on Twitter a one-word uh, tweet, feeble. So he's expressing disapproval of what's happened, assuming he's referring to this, which we, we think he is. And the US Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, has, uh, when asked about this, uh, just said that the US wasn't involved, but he can't confirm if it's happened. So, you know, although it's difficult and rather unsatisfying for us as journalists and observers to deal with what are pretty murky facts, I think people like Blinken and other allies of Israel will be rather reassured by this because the big fear was that this shadow war being fought between, between Israel and Iran for almost half a century was emerging out into the open, was going to turn into a much bigger conflict following that massive missile onslaught on Israel over the weekend. And now that we're sort of receding, I think, possibly back into the shadows, given the murkiness of what we're trying to find out about what's happened this morning in the fog of war. That will be reassuring that Iran is not saying we were attacked and we're going to strike back. You know, it, it, it looks as though Iran, Israel has carried out some kind of more calibrated, limited attack that sends a message decisively to Iran, but doesn't give Iran an excuse to strike back, because the assumption still is that Iran, whatever it said ahead of this, does not want to get drawn or to create a much bigger conflict, because it's simply not in its interest to do 
so. As you say, uh, Israel has sent its message to Iran, but there is still so much at stake here, Dom, for both countries. Yeah, I think it's fair to say that many people in both countries do regard this as existential, particularly the Israelis. You know, they've been told a number of times that Iranian leaders have talked about wiping Israel off the face of the earth. That's certainly the words that some Iranian leaders have used, big arguments about what they've meant. But if you're hearing that in Israel, that sounds like an existential threat and has for years. Iran also supports powerful armed groups who do not accept that Israel has a right to exist. So when Israel is attacked directly for the first time in more than 30 years by another country, and that country is Iran, a country that um, is alleged to be pursuing nuclear weapons, that is seen as very existential. From the Iranian point of view, um, I think the fear from the regime, or certainly how the Iranian government sees it, is that Israel is trying to destroy, certainly, the regime. Now, when we spoke last night, uh, looking back over the events of the week, I said, and I misspoke when I said, that both countries are sworn to each other's uh, destruction. That's not accurate, and uh, a lot of people have got in touch to express pretty forcefully that that's not the case. It misrepresents particularly Israel's position on this. You know, Israel has not talked about wanting Iran wiped off the face of the earth, doesn't support groups that say Iran ha has no right to exist, even if the Iranian government feels that Israel does want to destroy itself, the government. Um, whatever they feel about Israeli-Iranian relations. Yeah, and Dom, just to the point that you made uh, earlier about the shadow wars and it being covert and now what we've seen state on so state very much overt, but the fact is that on some level it will have to go back to that, won't it? That's the hope, certainly. And, you know, the assumption is that the fundamentals remain the same. Iran uh, has a powerful military, has a particularly powerful ballistic missile arsenal, but it's weakened economically. Its economy is doing pretty badly, um, particularly in the wake of COVID and particularly in the wake of the uprising. This unprecedented threat to its power, the, the biggest threat to its power since the 1979 Islamic Revolution that was led by women following the death of Masa Amini, uh, a young Iranian girl in, in prison. Uh, in fact, we've recently heard reports of another girl dying possibly in the same police station. So it's, it's crushed that uprising brutally. Um, using very repressive techniques. Amnesty International says it's used rape as a weapon of repression in its jails against young women. That's how brutal it's, it's uh, been in repressing that uprising. Um, it's crushed it, but it's still a big threat to the regime. It could spring back. So, on the one hand, the Iranian government clearly would welcome a distraction in terms of looking like it's attacking Israel. It doesn't want to, that's the assumption at least, doesn't want to get drawn into a big war that would threaten its own grip on power back home. So that's why diplomats, Western diplomats, have been saying to Israel, take the win, don't do anything that could provoke Iran, back it into a corner where it could draw, get drawn into creating a much uh, bigger conflict. And I think that's why they'll be reassured, even though we're still waiting for real confirmation and a clearer picture about what's happened in, in Iran, they'll be reassured about what they're hearing from the Israelis, but also, I think, from the Iranians who do seem to be playing this attack down. Yeah, I mean, uh, we heard earlier from uh, Ibrahim Raisi, who opted to speak about the economy and all sorts of other things rather than addressing this. And, and, and I spoke early this morning to an Iranian official who was very much like there's nothing to see here. Did anything happen last night? Which is very telling. And, and, and he's particularly close to the, to the government. Um, and they said before this uh, action, whatever the action is uh, in Iran, the Iranians said the tiniest invasion tiniest provocation will lead to a massive and harsh response. So if they accept or admitted there has been some kind of attack on their country, uh, then they will feel behoven to respond to it. Um, so that the idea, the fact that they are playing it down, saying effectively there's not much to look at here, been a bit of a bang over the city of Isfahan, um, a bit of an explosion, but we've dealt with it, move along. That, I think, looks like they're sticking to the script that Israel and Western allies will be relieved to hear they're doing. And just um, briefly, I mean, for Iran, that red line that Israel says was crossed last weekend when 300 missiles and drones were, were launched here, was crossed on April the 1st when a diplomatic compound, they say, was targeted. Well, I think it's fair to say since October the 7th, all kinds of rules uh, have been broken uh, have have changed in the region and the reason that's so important to observe is that this is a very volatile region there is a total lack of trust in the region and therefore in that situation you have to have rules of engagement each side has to know roughly how the other side is going to respond should something 
be done against it. So what happened on April the 1st was Israel attacked the embassy, the Iranian embassy in Damascus, and that was seen by the Iranians as a direct provocation, something they couldn't ignore unlike all the other attacks on their assets in Syria and Lebanon uh, through the war, and they felt they had to respond. They then chose to cross their own red line by launching a massive attack on Israel. There is a debate as to how much that was anticipated, how much warning they gave the Israelis and their Western allies to defend uh, against it, or how intentional it was to cause damage. But the fact that they did that, even though it caused no damage, is a red line that they've crossed. And that's why, you know, in the future, that taboo has gone. So that's why Israelis feel particularly especially because they feel that the Iranians will be more likely to do something similar, to attack Israel directly, which they haven't done you know, since um, the Islamic Revolution, should Israel attack Iran. So that balance of deterrence has shifted. And I think the question for the Israelis in particular, has, have they managed to restore that deterrence back again? And if they have, will that restore some kind of predictability, some kind of stability to the region? Dom, uh, thank you so much. And uh, as uh, Dom was uh, just saying there, not much of a response from uh, the Americans. We heard earlier from Secretary of State Antony Blinken, who's at the G7 foreign uh, ministers meeting in Italy. And uh, he was asked a question, a direct question about this strike. He said, I'm not going to address it, but made it very clear that the United States was not engaged or involved in any way. But the G7 foreign ministers have put a strongly worded statement together and they've condemned Iran in that statement and they've offered their full support to Israel. Let's just have a look at that statement. They've said, Israel and its people have our full solidarity and support and we uh, reaffirm our commitment towards Israel's security. Iran's actions mark an unacceptable step towards the destabilization of the region and a further escalation which must be avoided. We call on Iran to refrain from providing support to Hamas and taking further actions that destabilize the Middle East, including support uh, for Lebanese, uh, Hezbollah and other non-state actors. So that's the statement there from the G7 foreign ministers that has come out um, condemning Iran and their actions here in Israel over the weekend. And as we said, no real uh, comment there about um, the actions of Israel today against uh, Iran. Let's just bring in the comments of the US Secretary of State who reinforced those views uh, when he spoke at a press conference. Uh, let's just have a listen to what Antony Blinken had to say. First, the G7 condemned the unprecedented uh, Iranian attack on Israel, unprecedented in scope and scale. Scope because it was a direct attack on Israel from Iran, scale because it involved more than 300 uh, munitions, including ballistic missiles. We're committed to Israel's security. We're also committed to de-escalating uh, to trying uh, to bring uh, this tension to a, to a close. That was U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken really reiterating what leaders have been saying all week, that they want to see this situation uh, de-escalated. Well, earlier this morning, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak also gave his response to the attack. Um, just have a listen unequivocally condemn the dangerous escalation that uh, they displayed over the weekend, um, condemned it in the strongest possible terms, and that's why we participate in an international effort over the weekend. Uh, right now, everyone, calm heads should prevail. Any significant escalation in the region is not what anyone needs. It wouldn't be in anyone's interest. Um, but as I said, we're working now to establish the facts and the details of, uh, of what happened overnight with our allies. That's Prime Minister Rishi Sunak calling for calm there. Well, the Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, has also been responding to events in Iran overnight and his urge restraint. I'm deeply concerned about the prospect of escalation. Escalation of the conflict in the Middle East is uh, in nobody's interest. And so it's very, very important, therefore, that everybody urges restraint on all sides. More than that, we really need that ceasefire in Gaza now um, straight away so that hostages can come out. Desperately needed aid uh, needs to get in, desperately, desperately needed. And we need, if you like, a foot in the door for the political process to peace. So I've been concerned about escalation for a long time now. Restraint has to be the way forward. 
It was Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer speaking there uh, with all of those uh, leaders really calling for, for calm. Um, let's bring in Sky's uh, security and defence editor Deborah Haynes. And Deborah, all week we've heard that same messaging, haven't we, uh, that we heard today from Anthony Blinken. Uh, we heard there from Rishi Sunak as well, calling for calm, calling for de-escalation because no one wants to see these two countries in all-out war. No, and I think actually it's really telling that Israel hasn't come out officially, formally, uh, to talk about what happened overnight, what this strike was. And its allies, who clearly know what has been going on, have chosen not to talk about it either. Anthony Blinken there specifically saying, in response to a question from a journalist at the press conference, that he wasn't going to go into that topic. We've not heard anything from the British government ministers either, even though both those countries all this week have been very closely engaged with their uh, Israeli counterparts, cautioning calm, um, cautioning against a retaliation that escalates what is already an unprecedented situation with Iran having crossed that red line of launching direct attacks against Israel and Israel so clearly wanting to restore some semblance of deterrence while at the same time having to deal with two other fronts, the war in Gaza and increasing hostilities on its northern border with Lebanon against Hezbollah. An incredibly combustible situation. And I think the messaging around this, including inside Iran, you'll remember after Iran launched those missile and drone strikes overnight on Saturday into Sunday, they came out very decisively and strongly warning Israel not to retaliate and even the slightest response from Israel would trigger a greater escalation in attacks from Iran. That hasn't happened. Neither side is acknowledging even that this attack was an Israeli attack on Iran. It's not being confirmed, even in terms of the way that the state media in, inside Iran is reporting what had happened. And so that does point to the two sides maybe also wanting to calm this down. But of course, it's calming down to what was already a shadow war. It's not like this is a, a region at peace, is it? Um, and so the fact that these red lines have now been crossed means that we are, we are in a much more dangerous era. Deborah, thank you as always uh, for all of your analysis there. Well, as we've been reporting, despite those calls for, for calm, uh, Israel's overnight strikes are bound to cause further tension uh, in the region. We've already seen uh, increased fighting between Israeli forces and Hezbollah in Lebanon and northern Israel. Well, let's bring in our special correspondent, Alex Crawford, who joins me from Beirut. And Alex, there has been such a desperate attempt all morning to really de-escalate the situation. Antony Blinken didn't even want to really address it. We haven't heard from the Israelis are unlikely to. Um, but what are people and the likes of Hezbollah saying where you are? Well, certainly th I think there's been a very concerted effort all week since that uh, drone and missile attack over the weekend. Um, behind the scenes, in front of the scenes, the Lebanese foreign minister talking, Hezbollah hierarchy talking, Hezbollah fighters all talking about how uh, they didn't want to see a massive escalation. However, they were ready for any if it did come. And if we see, view Hezbollah as the strongest Iranian proxy, very aligned with Iran, we see them as probably echoing a lot of what the Iranian uh, hierarchy might be thinking and feeling. Uh, that possibly is a reflection uh, uh, of the same. They very much have been saying that they don't want war. Speaking to people who are very close to the Hezbollah leadership over the past few days, they kept on reiterating 100%, one of them said, Hezbollah do not want war. The Lebanese foreign minister telling us over and over again that this was the bull was very much in the Israeli court, that if they did something that was considered to have crossed red lines, that was considered to be even more provocative than what they viewed as extremely provocative, that hit on the Iranian consulate in Damascus, then they would have no choice, as it was the Lebanese foreign minister, the Lebanese authorities here saying that Iran was left in no choice to respond with those 300 drone and missile attacks in, in the first place, that they considered the provocation to have initially come from Israel. Today, there seems to be a much more 
calm view about everything, an almost disdain, disdainful reaction to what is being touted as this precision attack with no actual confirmation of it having landed. Much of the social media posts from within Lebanon and Iran seems to suggest that possibly this was just a defensive uh, response from Iran and that even some conspiracy perhaps theories suggesting that no attack actually took place. But certainly the Hezbollah experts, those who are closest to Hezbollah are suggesting that uh, if this can be seen as not having crossed a red line, and that's how it's being viewed at the moment, that perhaps this latest spark might be enough to de-escalate the current flare-up. However, the foundations of possible future potential war are very much still there, and still, as far as southern Lebanon is concerned, and tens of thousands of people who have been bombed out of their homes or frightened out of their villages, nearly 80 or so have been left empty and are now ghost towns. Uh, the war is, is very much felt here. They feel they're in the middle of a third front of the war. We saw earlier this week um, IDF soldiers actually being found inside Lebanon and, and being hurt and injured by explosive devices triggered by Hezbollah when they entered Lebanese territory. So for them, the war is still very real, it's still very prevalent, and it's seen a big, intensive, uh, increased action and activity since that weekend. Right now, they feel those foundations for war and for a spillover and for an escalation still exist. Speaking to a number of Hezbollah loyalists, supporters and fighters over the past few days, they say that, you know, their message is, you hit us, either Lebanon or Iran, you're taking on the whole of the axis of resistance. And that would involve militia group in Iraq, Syria, Lebanon and, of course, Iran. So they, they felt that they saw the Western community, Britain, France and America standing by Israel when those uh, 300 drone and missile attacks happened on on Saturday. This was this is their message. We're we're all also together. We're also unified. We're also much stronger. Lebanon Lebanese uh, Hezbollah being the strongest of them all. And you know don't don't mess with us seems to be their message. But right now seems to be a lot calmer to be honest. And no rhetoric coming from anybody about firing back or really, you know, this, this, this uh, weird uh, rea reaction earlier about, um, you know, they're going to be a, a full-scale war. That seems to dampen down a little bit now and maybe a little sigh of relief as a result. Yeah, uh, Alex, as you say, I mean, here in Israel, we hear uh, this phrase, don't mess with us, and that's what I've been hearing. Uh, but as you say, where you are, the feeling very much is an attack on one is an attack on all, uh, don't mess with us. So really, things uh, could easily uh, get uh, tense again. Uh, but as you say, uh, very much an effort to de-escalate the situation. Alex, thank you so much for bringing us up to date. Now let's just step away from the Middle East for the moment and for some breaking news. The former SNP leader Nicola Sturgeon has uh, given her first reaction uh, after her husband uh, was charged by the police with embezzlement uh, of funds. Uh, now uh, Peter Burrell, uh, the former chief executive of the Scottish National Party, was charged last night by police and uh, Scotland, who are investigating the SNP finances, um, uh, have uh, 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 police uh, have held uh, from police custody to return home and a report is being sent uh, to the Crown Office. Ms Sturgeon spoke earlier. Let's have a listen. There is absolutely nothing I can say uh, given the circumstances. So I'm now going to go out for a, a walk if that's all right with you. Um, I know you've got jobs to do but I'd also ask you maybe to give my neighbours some peace. There's nothing going to be happening here. Um, so. That's How difficult is this for you personally? It's incredibly difficult, but you know that's not the main issue here. So um, I can't say any more. I'm not going to say any more. Um, and if you don't mind, I'd also really appreciate. It. I'm still quite a new driver, so please try not to distract me when I'm driving away. Thank you. That's Nicola Sturgeon there. Let's go straight to our Scotland correspondent, Connor Gillies. And Connor, just bring us up to date there. We're hearing there from Nicola Sturgeon. 
Yeah, another major moment in what has been an extraordinary 24 hours that has seen uh, the former chief executive of almost 20 years, Peter Murrell, uh, charged in connection with embezzlement of SNP finances as part of a long-running police investigation here in Scotland, examining uh, the largest political party's funding and its finances. Uh, Nicola Sturgeon, uh, the wife of Peter Murrell, uh, the political power couple for so long here in Scotland until last year. She exited uh, the property that the pair share here on the outskirts of Glasgow in the last few moments. And when I asked her how she was feeling, uh, she told me this was an incredibly difficult moment. Uh, and she said clearly that was an understatement. Now, this is an investigation that, as I said, is three years in the making. It is investigating uh, £600,000 of uh, funds that were ring fenced for the cause of a second Scottish independence referendum. Uh, forensic detectives have spent many a month, many a year now, looking at those claims, looking at that allegation. And yesterday came more than nine hours of questioning for Peter, Mur Peter Murrell uh, and then came that charge. What happens next? Well, uh, the prosecution service here in Scotland is waiting for the file to be handed over from police, at which point they will decide on what the path is ahead. Uh, Hamza Yusuf, the current First Minister of Scotland, has also said in the last hour that this is a serious, serious moment and a very difficult time for the SNP. Connor, thank you very much uh, for bringing us up to date there. Well, let's get more now on that international reaction to the overnight attack by Israel on Iran. Joining me now is Sir Richard Dalton, former British ambassador to Libya and Iran and the associate fellow at Chatham House's Middle East and North Africa program. Thank you so much, Ambassador, for joining us here uh, on the program. You know all too well, having spent so much time in this region, how much is at stake, even if there is an attempt now by diplomats to de-escalate the situation? Yes, I mean, the analysis by your correspondence is, is absolutely right. I wouldn't want to add to that. Uh, I would want to utter a word of caution, uh, namely, is it really over? Uh, Israel might have something else that it wants to do, and there will be disappointment amongst the more hawkish in Israel that this slap on the wrist of Iran was not more serious. Uh, Personally, I would say that Israel has shown much better judgment on this occasion than it did in launching this cycle of retaliation on the 1st of April with its reckless and unlawful attack on the Iranian uh, consulate in Damascus. Uh, it's also significant and I hope a good omen for future relationships between Israel and its uh, United States uh, partner uh, that while emphasizing the independence of their decision making, nevertheless, the Israeli war cabinet decided to, to heed the advice uh, not to undertake a significant escalation. I mean, they have left their calling card on Iran, reminded them of what Iran knew already, that Iran's highly sensitive facilities uh, were within reach of the long Israeli arm. Ambassador, the Israeli officials I've been speaking to, namely two former prime ministers, Ehud Olmert and Ehud Barak, yesterday said to me that the first strategic blunder that um, this current government in Israel made was the security failings of October the 7th. And the second was to underestimate how Iran would react to the April 1 attack on their uh, diplomatic compound in Dam Damascus. Do you think that's a fair assessment, that, that Israel didn't quite understand how forcefully uh, Iran would respond and react? Uh, it is a fair assessment. Uh, I mean, I don't want to excuse Iran. They were bound to retaliate, but they did choose uh, to cross a red line they haven't crossed hitherto. Uh, and their attack on Israel was reckless, given their fundamental interest in there not being a wide regional war. So if we can get away with the exchanges that we've seen 
uh, subsequent to the Israeli attack on the consulate on, on the 1st of April, we should count ourselves lucky. And I guess, um, do you think the Iranians knew when they launched those 300 drones and missiles on Israel that there would be no doubt that uh, Israel would respond? Uh, absolutely. Uh, but they uh, felt that they had to vindicate their honor and vindicate their policy that if anybody touches Iranian soil, uh, then there is, is, is bound to be a firm reaction. They, they wanted to show, as Israel does, uh, that they are ready and that they can't be pushed around. So in many ways, is this, do you think, a um, face-saving exercise for, for both sides, with the United States standing on the sidelines saying, OK, this is it, you've settled the bill? Uh, so far, that's what it looks like, but it's only a matter of hours uh, since the event uh, in the vicinity of Isfahan took place. So I, I wouldn't want to relax if I was in the region. And of course, um, the shadow wars will no doubt continue, regardless of how this confrontation, uh, whether it de-escalates or escalates. As you say, it's still early hours. We still don't know a lot of information about how this strike was conducted. But those shadow wars and the proxies that we've seen, um, Iran's proxies, will continue to, to operate and function in, in, in the region. I prefer the word allies myself within the resistance front. Uh, because proxy implies a degree of control from Tehran, uh, which doesn't necessarily exist. Uh, certainly, Iran is arming and supporting and encouraging in some cases. Um, and uh, you're right that uh, the risk of confrontation and matters getting out of hand uh, exists. The important thing now, as Blinken said, that, it, that the G7 and everyone else should pivot back to the Gaza situation, which is at the root of the instability, achieve the ceasefire and exchange of prisoners and work on a permanent solution as soon as possible. Sir Richard Dalton, former British ambassador to Libya and Iran, thank you so much for joining us here on the program. Thank you. Well, as we've been saying, Israeli officials are yet to comment publicly on what appears to be retaliatory action for Iran's attack over the uh, weekend. Uh, well, joining me now to discuss uh, this further is Israeli, former Israeli ambassador to Germany, Jeremy Isherov. Thank you very exactly. much. Uh, thank you very much for joining us here, Ambassador. Yes. Um, I want to get your reaction first to what we saw uh, overnight transpire with Israel um, attacking Iran. First of all, as you said, everyone is being very tight-lipped about who did it exactly. Um, but in any event, I think the last few uh, days have shown uh, uh, that Israel is very capable of defending itself very decisively. And in the event this turns out to have been an Israeli attack, of being able to target in a very selective way uh, um, place in Iran, which is a, a province which houses a number of uh, nuclear uh, uh, installations. Uh, it seems the apparent target was this air base, but it showed that this is a demonstration of Israeli ability to, uh, to be able to, as I said, defend itself and to uh, be able to uh, also relate to the broader reality and take into account broader interests broader regional interests. What message directly do you think Israel was sending to Iran? It's sending that, you know, Israel uh, will work with its allies, will take into account regional considerations, but first and foremost will take into account our national security and will be very decisive in uh, restoring and maintaining our deterrence. Um, and I think that anyone, again, as who looks over the last few days will see the great disparity between the Israeli ability to uh, safeguard its national security and the Iranian ability to attack it. Do you think this has now drawn a line on these events or do we need to be cautious? From what one hears, uh, it's, it would seem that the Iranians seem to be playing this down and as there is no uh, grand acceptance of responsibility, I think it's not... I think it's quite likely that this could 
actually draw a line at this point in time. But let's not forget, we're still involved in a war in Gaza. The situation in the West Bank is uh, not simple. Uh, we're still involved in hostilities with Hezbollah, which is a totally sponsored Iranian organization operating out of Lebanon against our northern border. So, yes, it might be a line drawn in terms of Israel and Iran to a certain extent, but it doesn't draw a line between the ongoing Iranian use of this access of terror against Israel. And that's the point, isn't it? That Israel is dealing with a number of crises on a number of fronts. Absolutely. Can it deal with an all-out confrontation, which we could see the, the Americans counselling uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, you know, for restraint, for de-escalation. Um, really, we had a number of leaders come here over the past week just saying, look, mm -hmm. just try and de-escalate. Think with your head and your heart, as Lord Cameron said. Well, I think uh, it's quite... Uh, sounds looks to me as if that advice was taken into account. But I think it also reflects a basic Israeli interest in uh, dealing with these various multi-front military challenges. I mean, we're talking about, as I said, Gaza, Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, uh, the Houthis in Yemen and Iran, and let's not forget the Iranian nuclear program. So I think it definitely, you know, we need to balance our interests. I think this week uh, demonstrated the strength of the Israeli-American uh, strategic alliance, and I also think it showed a great deal of coordination uh, and similar thinking with our European allies. Uh, the Foreign Minister of Great Britain was here along with with the Foreign Minister of Germany. Um, and it's not simply a matter of everyone telling Israel, you know, calm down, relax. Uh, you know, the, the messages are more nuanced. You can see a greater call for sanctions against Iran on their missile and uh, drone activities. I can foresee also um, a much uh, a more intense international effort regarding the Iranian nuclear program. Now you can see what Iran might have done had it attained already a, a mili you know, military nuclear capability. I mean, over the last two or three years, the uh, program has advanced to the highest level up till now, um, and it's something that we should be very, very mindful of. Indeed, and so therefore, any kind of all-out confrontation with Iran right now would just be, you know, not something that the international community was advising Israel to do. There are still hardline elements, though, within the Israeli government, who we saw Ben Gavir today tweeted feeble, for example. So, you know, there are voices uh, from within who want a harder response. Well, uh, there may be harder voices, but I think a very calm, collected uh, Israeli estab defense establishment prevailed today and uh, gave a very measured uh, response, if in fact again it was well, we, uh, Israel, and but we probably may never find we'll out. They never will know, but never know. The, <laughs> yeah, but as you say, there have been so many reports, uh, and I, I think, uh, you know, I would relate much more to that calm, collected sense of maintaining our deterrence and national security than some marginal uh, political minister who reflects a very minor part of Israeli public opinion and definitely not my public, my, not, definitely not my opinion. Ambassador, uh, really grateful for your time and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Uh, now, we've got some breaking news that's uh, just being reported in Paris. The police have intervened at the Iranian consulate after a suspicious uh, man was seen entering the building. All we know at the moment is that around 11 a.m., a suspicious man uh, was seen by a witness entering the consulate. A security perimeter was then set up, and we are trying to establish more information. But uh, a, a bit of activity around the Iranian consulate in Paris... Um, and a man believed to be looking quite suspicious entering uh, the building. Police have now um, surrounded the, the area, um, but as soon as we get more information, we will be bringing that to you, and we are following that story closely. Now, let's get more on the developments here in the last few hours. I'm joined by our international correspondent, Alex Rossi, who joins us from Tel Aviv this afternoon. And Alex, the last time we spoke, you were, on, uh, you were in northern uh, Israel, and you were, uh, you know, reporting on... That uh, you know that war, uh, really that minor war that you've you've described um, over the last few days, um, small scale war uh, between Hezbollah and and Israel. A number of 
crises that Israel is currently dealing with. And then on top of that, overnight, we've seen uh, this strike on Iran. Yeah, it may be that the direct confrontation between Iran and Israel is de-escalating. We wait to see exactly what will happen on that, whether there'll be an Iranian response, whether or not there may be more Israeli uh, responses to the attack on Saturday. But yeah, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. Israel faces a number of crises. One of the most significant and challenging ones in terms of maintaining peace, which could actually affect the entire region is happening on Israel's northern border with Lebanon. Uh, since October the 7th, Yalda, there have been daily exchanges of fire between Hezbollah and the Israeli Defense Forces. Um, Alex Crawford, my colleague, has been talking about the number of people who've been evacuated from the towns and villages on the border. It's replicated here in Israel as well. Uh, something like 60,000 people have been evacuated from the north of the country and are currently living in hotels and guest houses as a result of the mandatory evacuation policy put in place uh, by the government. I mean, the, the, the sense that I have got from traveling along that border over the last two or three days is that the situation really is untenable. Something at some point will give, the, will, the, the strikes will become uh, more significant, more harder, deeper into Israel, and we've already seen deep uh, strikes into Lebanon. Remember, wind back to 2006, the war there, the summer war that went on for about a month, that started as a result of the kidnapping of two Israeli soldiers by Hezbollah. Uh, Hezbollah was surprised by the Israeli reaction. Now we have a situation where there are, is rocket fire uh, missile fire every day back and forth so that the chance really of that igniting into a broader conflict really is very high and at the moment there isn't really any way that you can see that that de-escalates because the situation in Gaza remains that war is far from being over so yeah the, the, the chance of this igniting into something a bit much bigger uh, still remains. Yeah, I mean, Alex, as you say, it feels like it's, uh, you know, things are one strike away from some kind of miscalculation which can lead to all sorts of misunderstandings and then uh, an escalation of the situation. But today, uh, you know, with this fear of a confrontation between uh, Israel and Iran, uh, perhaps, um, you know, people can take um, a, a sigh of relief and, and breathe again because for the last week it has been exceptionally tense. We've all been here uh, in Israel reporting on the situation, reporting on the war cabinet, uh, meeting every day and saying that we have no choice but to respond. Yeah, I think the, the positive sign in all of this is on the Iranian side, they can, they can look at this in the way that they want and, and score it up, chalk it up as a win. The Israelis can also do that as well. I'll, I'll explain further. The Iranians, in terms of the attack on April the 1st, can say, well, look, we launched this barrage of um, missiles and drones at Israel. We made our point, a, a really a significant confrontation between the two powers, the first attack directly by the Iranians. The Israelis can say, well, you know, we responded to that. We showed that we can penetrate Iranian air defences whenever we wish to do so. Symbolically, we chose a, a target in the heart of Iran, uh, close to nuclear facilities and close to the Iranian Air Force, so that, you know, they can say that they made their point and also de-escalate. The, the dangerous bit, and we'll get to the dangerous bit now, is that in many ways all of this is to do with deterrence and red lines on both sides. October the 7th has effectively uh, changed everything. The fact that Iran chose to directly attack Israel after the consulate attack shows that they are not prepared for the shadow war, for their interests to be hit in the way that they have been hit up until this point. So they are redrawing a new red line. Israel, for its part, needs to try and re-establish its deterrent. October the 7th really shattered the shield of invulnerability that it had built up as this significant military. Its country was penetrated by uh, Hamas uh, fighters coming across, killing uh, civilians, uh, capturing civilians, taking them hostage, soldiers too. It needs to try and um, show its deterrence again. It needs to try and, try and build that up again. And that is not easy to do. The rules of engagement on all sides have changed and that makes the current situation extremely dangerous because, 
you know, there really is, and, and you can't understate this, Yalda, there's a really big chance of miscalculation or accident going forwards, which can, of course, trigger a much broader conflict. It's why many people over the last couple of weeks have been saying to me that, you know, this really is the most dangerous moment the Middle East has experienced for the last four decades. It really is a very, very significant moment. But again, perhaps go back to the, the good news in terms of the direct clash between Iran and Israel, it does appear that there really is a good chance of de-escalation. But a lot of the factors that could light the fuse for a broader conflict still remain. Yeah, Alex, as you say, a great deal of, of jeopardy. Thank you so much for all of your reporting there. Let's just bring you up to date on that bit of breaking news that we brought you in the last few minutes. Now, we were saying that it's been reported in Paris that police have intervened at the Iranian uh, consulate after a suspicious man was seen entering the building. Um, as we also reported that it was around 11 a.m., a suspicious man was seen by a witness entering uh, the consulate. A security perimeter was then set up. We've now got a, a bit of an update uh, where we understand uh, that uh, the man said that he was carrying explosives. So this is why a more heightened uh, security situation there at the Iranian consulate. That's all the information we have at the moment, uh, that there are reports that the man said he was carrying explosives and uh, that he was seen around 11 a.m. entering uh, the consulate, the Iranian consulate in Paris. So as soon as we get more information on that, we will be bringing that to you. Uh, but what we know so far is that a suspicious man entered the Iranian consulate. He said he had explosives and there is now a security perimeter that's been set up. Well, we'll have much more on Israel's uh, strike on Iran coming up in the next few uh, minutes. We'll be speaking with a former Israeli Defense Force colonel. further back here. There's around two or three hundred still remaining. I'm Dan Whitehead and I'm Sky News's West of England correspondent. This van goes onto the streets of Plymouth seven days a week, 365 days a year. These facilities at the moment are, are a lifesaver. It's all, it's all we've got. From fishing communities to bustling cities, we spend every day reporting from across the region. I'm going to have nowhere to live for about three or four months. They are coming from the epicenter of what is now a global health pandemic. We were seeing and speaking to young women who were selling themselves right on the high street. Before Brexit, these oysters were being exported to the EU, but the trade stopped overnight. What's your feeling about the future? Blake, you'll be finished, I don't know.
Welcome back to Jerusalem with me, Yalda Hakim. We've got special coverage of the developing situation uh, after Israel's attack on Iran. Now, Israel has so far made no official comment about that attack, which happened at around 4 o'clock this morning, Iran time. I'm joined now by Miri Eisen, who is a former IDF colonel and the current managing director of the International Institute for Counterterrorism at Reichman University. Thank you so much um, for joining us here on the program. I first want to get your reaction to the developments uh, in the early hours of this morning that we've all woken up to. I think we're all seeing the continuation of the way it's being framed this week of what everybody's calling the tit for tat or the open overt stages between Iran and Israel. But if I broaden it out for a moment, we're looking at what is an alleged Israeli response directly onto Iranian soil. And I'm seeing the Iranians very much trying to belittle what happened to them and to make whatever they did on late Saturday night, early Sunday morning, way bigger um, and more intense. So you're also seeing part of an information warfare going on, not only the military strikes. Yeah, I mean, all morning we've been watching uh, Iranian state TV and they've been really trying to downplay this. Uh, we've heard conflicting messages, um, you know, one lot saying that nothing has happened. I interviewed someone who said he doesn't know if anything happened. What, what, what was I talking about? And, and others saying uh, something completely different. But the fact of the matter is, right across the board, it does feel like global leaders are now trying to de-escalate. Uh, we heard from Antony Blinken as well, who said, um, I'm not going to comment on this, but the United States was not involved in this offensive. One of the things that all of the different leaders kind of as if are pushing for is that this should be covert, not overt. Because at the end, the, the, the challenges of the Islamic regime of Iran, of their exporting through the Iranian Revolutionary Guard, not ideology, hardware, weapons, capabilities, and training is something that all of the arena is aware of. And within this area, if you do not take action, that actually has a price to pay. You need to take the action. Doing it in a way, allegedly Israel, not doing it the way that Iran did overtly, not overplaying it, is to me both playing within the rules of the Middle East of action, but staying within the lines, both of the coalition, and it will be continued in covert ways. This is not over. Yeah, uh, Israeli officials uh, that I've spoken to have uh, almost expressed shock. They've said a, a red line was crossed last weekend. Uh, they almost didn't expect that kind of reaction from uh, Iran following uh, the, the Iranian consulate or diplomatic building, which uh, Israel says it wasn't a diplomatic building, but is widely believed it was in Damascus, which was hit. Do you think, though, that was a, a significant um, strategic blunder by Israel? Because on the Iranian side, they view that um, uh, consulate or diplomatic building being hit as the thing that really broke the red lines. And maybe perhaps that it is an enormous diplomatic or military blunder of Iran, showing that they can fire rockets and we intercepted them, showing that allegedly Israel can attack on Iranian soil and they could do nothing to that. They continue to be the main supplier. So there's different ways of looking at that game. I heard Alex before also of deterrence, and it's very important within the Middle East. I think that directly the supreme leader, Khamenei, who is the one who spoke, who the one who talks about, I listen to what he has to say. And in this case, he is talking clearly about the annihilation of what he calls the Zionist regime. You're standing in the middle of Jerusalem, the beautiful view behind you. And he looks at that and on Kutz Day, he again, which was just a few weeks ago in the month of Ramadan, called for the annihilation of Israel. So in this case, to me, this is the Iranian miscalculation. And I, I very much want to try to break the frame that they're showing it as being something calculated that is diplomatic, that they're the ones who were victims. Iran, the Islamic regime, are not the victim. They are the destabilizers in the Middle East. Do you think this now creates almost a new phase, a dangerous precedence, where we've, we're seeing a sort of state-on-state -state attack? Or do you think this can just go back to being the, the shadow wars that it ha always has been? 
I think you just hit the nail on the head on the biggest challenge, because until now, it really was very covert. You've never had that overt action. But look at that sense, as we keep saying, the alleged Israeli response. That was, it may have been a military one, but Israel did not take responsibility. Israel did not come out with infographs and, and United Nation resolutions um, a minute after they attacked. That's what Iran was doing. Iran is doing this hand-in-hand -hand with information warfare. In its own way, as an Israeli, I'm kind of glad it's out in the open. It's scary, it's tense, but it's always been there. Maybe in its own way, it's better out in the open than playing a game behind the scenes and letting Israel stand so alone, when at the same time, Hezbollah, totally trained, armed, and backed by Iran, fires into Israel immense capabilities every single day. Do you see um, opportunity in this crisis, that the events of last weekend, what we're seeing and the way that Israel has played it out in the last few hours, that perhaps there can be some kind of shift? Because, of course, Israel did and does face isolation because of the operations it's conducted in Gaza and the current humanitarian crisis that we're seeing in Gaza, the death toll that we're seeing in, uh, in Gaza. There's been a huge amount of international pressure on uh, the government here to change tact. I am with you on that one. I do think that this is both an opportunity, but I'd like to take it out in two ways. One is Israel, the, our isolation and portion of that, I'm going to agree with you, is of our own making. Even within all of the horrible things that have happened in the last six months to Israel, and I say in that sense, we are part of that international community. And this is for me a turning point where the international community, hand in hand together as a coalition, are standing up to Iran. What I would like to add into that is that that isolation and that information warfare started on October 7th, not with a humanitarian disaster December or January or March, not just with the Iranian attack on April 14th, that if information warfare of isolating Israel, of delegitimizing us, of dehumanizing us has been part of the campaign, the actual campaign from October 7th. Okay, Miri Eisen, uh, we're really grateful for your time. Thank you so much for all of your uh, analysis there. Thank you. Now, before we leave you, let's just uh, take you to these pictures coming in from Paris. And as we've been uh, reporting uh, that a man, uh, a uh, man who is believed to have entered the Iranian consulate was, see, uh, was described as being uh, suspicious, said uh, that he was carrying explosives. You can see uh, the police there now. Uh, we understand that he has been arrested there in Paris. But uh, around 11 o'clock this morning, he was believed to have have entered uh, the Iranian consulate in Paris. A witness saw him. He said he was carrying explosives. The police were called and it did turn into a security perimeter. And now you can see those live images coming in from Paris of the police. And we understand that that man has now been arrested. We'll be following that story and all the other developments here on Sky News. But for now, goodbye.
This is Sky News Today. It is two o'clock. Here are the headlines. Israel's retaliation, an attack on Iran overnight with reports that their air defences were fired and explosions heard. So far, no casualties or damage reported in the apparent missile attack near the central city of Isfahan. The global response. G7 leaders are meeting in Italy with a call for all parties to prevent further escalation in the region. We're committed to Israel's security. We're also committed to de-escalating, uh, to trying uh, to bring uh, this tension to a, to a close. Arrested after threatening to blow himself up at the Iranian consulate in Paris. Also this afternoon, Nicola Sturgeon speaks out for the first time since her husband, Peter Murrell, was charged with embezzlement. It's incredibly difficult, but, you know, that's not the main issue here. So um, I can't say any more. I'm not going to say any more. Well, good afternoon. We're going to start this hour with some breaking news. The former SNP leader, Nicola Sturgeon, has given her first reaction after her husband was charged by the police with embezzlement of funds. Peter Murrell, the former chief executive of the Scottish National Party, was charged last night by Police Scotland, who are investigating the SNP finances. He was freed from police custody to return home, and a report is being sent to the Crown Office. Ms Sturgeon was speaking earlier. I don't think I'm revealing any secrets in saying that, but there is absolutely nothing I can say, uh, given the circumstances. So I'm now going to go out for a, a walk, if that's all right with you. Um, I know you've got jobs to do, but I'd also ask you maybe to give my neighbours some peace. There's nothing going to be happening here. Um, so that's How difficult is this for you personally? It's incredibly difficult, but you know that's not the main issue here. So um, I can't say any more. I'm not going to say any more, um, and if you don't mind, I'd also really appreciate it. I'm still quite a new driver, so please try not to distract me when I'm driving away. Thank you. Well, let's bring in our Scotland correspondent, Connor Gillies, now. Um, it's no surprise, is it, Connor, that it's a very difficult time for her. Also, difficult time for the SNP, as uh, this investigation, long-running investigation into their finances, uh, moves on. Yeah, a major moment in what has been an extraordinary 24 hours. Uh, a moment that the SNP are finding incredibly difficult. Uh, Nicola Sturgeon herself uh, leaving the home behind me that she shares with her husband, Peter Murrell, the long-time uh, chief executive of the SNP for two decades. Clearly, she was the party leader as well, known as Scotland's political power couple for a long period of time, and the pair of them have found, them center, found themselves at the centre of Operation Branch Form. That is the three-year-long police investigation here in Scotland examining the Scottish National Party, the biggest political party, the governing party, uh, their funding and their finances, specifically an allegation around £600,000 that was raised for the cause of a second Scottish independence referendum, and detectives have been forensic pouring over all of the evidence, painstaking work uh, involving very senior detectives within the force for a long, long time now. Uh, many people will remember this property here behind me became the focus of a search by officers one year ago. Uh, that led to the, the first-time arrest of Peter Murrell. Uh, then, a few weeks later, Nicola Sturgeon herself was arrested and released without charge pending further inquiries. Then came the arrest of the one-time treasurer of the SNP, Colin Beatty, who again was released without charge. But there is no doubt the most dramatic moment came yesterday when uh, Peter Murrow was brought back into custody as a suspect in this investigation, faced more than nine hours of further questions before police confirmed that he had been charged with in, uh, in connection with embezzlement of SNP funds. Uh, Nicola Sturgeon herself told me when I asked her how she was feeling, she said this was an incredibly difficult moment for her personally and clearly her family. Uh, and that is a sentiment shared by the current First Minister of Scotland, Hamza Youssef, who's also been speaking in the last few hours. Well, these are serious serious developments and as per the police statement we now know that an individual has been charged peter has been charged 
where uh, the allegation of embezzlement from party funds, and that's a really serious matter indeed, many people in the SNP right across Scottish politics will be shocked by the news. Now, this is an ongoing investigation. Police, the Crown, have a job to do, just as I have a job to do as First Minister. And that job, of course, is ensuring that I support business, that I help households throughout uh, the cost of living crisis, that I help to cut waiting times in the NHS, that I advance the cause of independence. So that's the job that you can imagine I'm focused on. Following that news last night, we now know that Peter Murrell is no longer a member of the SNP. What happens next as part of this investigation? Well, clearly that charge came from police. Uh, we are now waiting for prosecutors to receive that file from those detectives and they will then decide whether to prosecute or not. Uh, all eyes on what Scotland's prosecution service has to say in the coming hours and days.